Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, can we just please sit down? We are about to start. Oh, yes, uh, just a reminder, we do have um, interpretation, we have the scribes, and um, if you want to um, speak, just put your um, name plates like this, and then we will see if we, if I don't nod, or if Lynn doesn't nod at you, you can just wave it a bit, because sometimes it's behind um, somebody. And just also another reminder, uh, when you start speaking, please just say your name out slowly so that the scribes can capture it, and also the people online know who is speaking. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, with that, I'll give it over to Lynn to start the meeting. Thank you, Changatai. Um, before we get to the formal part of the meeting here, Thomas Schneider, the host country co-chair, was here, but he's had a phone call. He's had to step out and asked us to go ahead so as not to further delay the meeting, and he'll be in, he'll be in shortly. Um, so today is the first day of the MAG meeting. Yesterday was the open consultation where the MAG was to hear from the community on items of, of interest to them. Um, our first order of business today is to approve the agenda. So it was published some weeks ago on the website. I'm not sure if it's going to be projected on the screen or not. But briefly today, um, our first order of business will be to cover MAG member introductions. Um, we'll have some opening remarks from the IGF 2016 um, host country, Victor Lagunas, um, from the Office of the President of Mexico. Um, we'll have a presentation from Thomas, um, which will cover um, more of the preparations for IGF um, here in December. And then um, the bulk of the day is on uh, discussions on shaping the program, which will cover things such as main themes, intercessional activities, main sessions, um, some of the intercessional work. I think I just said that, actually. Um, and I propose, as I mentioned yesterday, to pull forward from tomorrow morning into today um, the a proposal from the working group, which is working on evaluation of the call for proposals and the evaluation process. We thought we might try and leave probably 45 minutes or so just before the lunch break. Um, Rasha, who is leading that group, will walk us through the proposal. It is in your inbox. It was sent last night. But will walk us through that proposal, some of the rationale behind it. We can um, take it away, think about it, um, come back. And as I said yesterday, we really, by the end of the day tomorrow, we need to have agreement on what that call process looks like and what the evaluation process looks like so that we have time to instantiate it online um, and um, have a timely, a timely release. Uh, that proposal, um, or maybe Rosh is going to send out separately, also has a draft timetable. Um, and uh, I think when we come to introduce that, we'll talk. There's a couple of changes to the timetable, too. We basically built in a couple of extra steps to allow more time for analysis by both the Secretariat and the MAG or the MAG Working Group, which should actually facilitate the work in the room um, of the MAG. And then um, in the afternoon, again, we'll continue with the, the broad shaping of the program. And there was also um, a really important item on the integration of NRIs and other relevant IG processes into IGF 2017. That may slide into tomorrow morning since we're pulling one agenda item forward from from tomorrow. But we'll we'll see how we how we go on. Um, so with that, I'd like to seek approval of the agenda or see if there are any additional requests for changes. Let's see, heads nodding yes. So we'll call the agenda approved. Thank you. Um, and, um, one other formal piece of business, I'd like to again thank United Nations Office of Geneva, UNOG, um, for hosting us here this week. And um, again, point out that it is, in fact, the home of the IGF Secretariat as well. So um, that's facilitating quite a number of, a number of things here. Um, the next order of business is to introduce the new um, and returning MAG members, obviously both those here in the room and um, uh, those participating online. Again, we'll run the same um, queue process as yesterday. Um, if you want to be recognized here in the room for the floor, then you should raise your card. 
Um, we have um, a couple of the IGF secretariat monitoring the um, online participants who will also flag them. And everybody is inserted into the queue, whether in the room or online, at the time they've asked for the floor. For the most part uh, on these subjects, there's actually quite a lengthy queue. So you might ask for the floor, but there might be, in fact, six or seven speakers ahead of you. But particularly if you're online, please rest assured that you're actually slotted into the queue at the time you were rec recognized. Um, so with that, um, why don't we go first to the new MAG members here in the room? And then, just so there's a heads up for those that are online, we'll go to the um, new MAG members that are participating online, and then we'll go to um, the returning. So I don't have any special order. Um, if you're a new MAG member here in the room, maybe if you put your card up, we'll just um, recognize you. <laughs> actually, Israel has actually put his up first, so we'll start a, a list. Um, if you could just sort of um, introduce yourself briefly, um, what you do during your um, day jobs. We obviously participate here in our individual capacity, supporting the agenda of the IF, IGF, um, as mandated by the Tunis agenda. But it's really good to know what people's backgrounds are. And maybe just a quick word or two in terms of what experiences you've had with um, IG or IG uh, initiatives um, prior to coming into the MAG. So the first one I saw was Israel. Do you want to start and oh, just go through? Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is Israel Rosas on behalf of the government of Mexico. I was uh, deeply involved in the IEF 2016 meeting. Um, inside the government, I'm an internet policy analyst. Um, and uh, we are focused on internet governance efforts uh, like our local initiative group on internet governance that is part of the NRI's network. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe we'll just go down the, the table there since I really didn't actually um, recognize any particular order with the cards coming up. So you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Elishevo, representing the government of Zambia. I'm a law enforcement officer working under Zambia police specialized in cyber security and cyber crime. I've been involved in the internet governance space since 2013, thanks to Marian Kate. I was a 2013 scholar at USCTI in cyber security and ICT policy, and it was through her session when I came to know about internet governance. And from that time, I've participated in almost four African internet governance forums, done presentations on cyber security, both, and I've been involved both on a sub-regional level and also on the international levels, I've participated in various cyber security and internet governance forums, such as LightScorn, such as the October 16th under the Council of Europe, and many others. Thank you. Thank you, Mar uh, thank you Michael. I was just going to say Maryland's network um, reaches far and wide. <laughs> Mamadou? Good morning, everybody. I'm Mamadou Lo from Dakar, Senegal. I'm from the private sector. I'm working right now in a bank, in Senegalese Agricultural Bank. I'm uh, involved in the communication, information distribution in the IG ecosystem related to usage in Africa. I used to be also uh, an ICANN fellow. An ICANN fellow, right now I'm uh, a coach in this, in this, in, in this team. Uh, what I'm doing, as I said earlier, I'm gathering information relating to internet governance to help people, all, above all French people, African French people, be involved, be aware of what's happening right now in our ecosystem. Well, that's why I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm very satisfied to be here to, 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 to share with my members and to help in, in, in communication. Uh, the, the IG ecosystem in, in, in all Africa and in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mamadou. Mamadou actually publishes weekly um, a compilation of interesting um, internet governance articles and links, which is very useful. So um, if you'd like to be on the list, I'm sure he would um, be very happy to welcome you. <laughs> Thank you, Mamadou. Uh, 
Hello, I'm uh, Igor Rezende from Brazil, from the Brazilian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, uh, I'm the deputy head of the Division for Information Society from Ambassador Benedito's team, who many of you probably remember. And I've been working with internet governance issues already for some time. I've been following the uh, uh, ITU track. Uh, I've been also working a lot on the G20 treatment of digital issues. And I was involved already in the organization of the IGF in Brazil in 2015. Took part in the last one in Mexico as well. So it's a pleasure to be here. I hope we can do a lot. Thank you. Brazil's been very active in many of the Internet governance activities. And um, later on, I actually wanted to thank Ambassador um, Benedito Fonseca as well for um, supporting me last year, in fact, in a, in a special role where he was helping with some of the government outreach. So I've always appreciated Brazil's support. Raquel, and then we'll actually go to the row and, and back there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I'm Raquel Gatto. Um, I work with Internet Society as a policy advisor. Prior to that, I used to work with the Brazilian Network Information Center, the NICBR. Um, as for my background, I'm a lawyer. I used to work with intellectual property rights and domain name. That's how I got hooked to the in IG environment. Um, I also uh, hold a PhD on law with emphasis on, on philosophy focused on the legitimacy of the Internet governance mechanisms. Um, I'm new to the MAG, but I'm not new to the IGF itself. My first one was in Brazil in 2007. Uh, by then, I got involved with several of the work the, the IGF has um, with regards to remote participation. So I joined the group who pushed for the first remote participation uh, efforts in Hyderabad IGF, thanks to Marcos, who embraced it by the time. Um, and then uh, also we founded the Youth Dynam Coalition. Um, by then, it was uh, the 20s something, don't do the age counting. <laughs> so. Uh, um, that's been uh, how I entered the IGF environment. Uh, right now, my current daily work has two big legs uh, on the IGF um, tracks. One of them is to support the national and regional IGFs, um, and we are probably having much of those updates uh, during um, the day and tomorrow, uh, and also to do the bridge between technical community and the policymakers. So making sure the awareness on the key topics are, are done. And I'm really glad to join you and, and being able to work with um, the MAG members and the community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raquel. S Samuel, you have the floor. <coughs> well, good morning, everybody. I am uh, Bamboo Samuel from the Ministry of External Relations in Cameroon. I work with the African desk. Actually, curiosity got me into uh, internet governance. At first, I started doing a little research last year in June on uh, e-governance, and uh, I stumbled onto the whole internet governance field that I really did not understand what it was talking all about. So I started doing another research on, on uh, internet governance, and that got me to AfriSeq 2016 in Durban, and that is where I met the larger family. And uh, thanks to Ariet and the AfriSeq family, I was able to understand more about uh, internet governance. And look where curiosity got me today. I'm at Mac and. I still think I'm dreaming, but I'm happy being here. I don't know much about internet governance, and I'm counting on learning a lot, and we have a long way to go, and when we get to the end, we'll be able to evaluate ourselves, and I'm hoping I'll come out on top. Thank you. Thank you, and fresh perspectives are warmly welcome and, frankly, often much needed. <laughs> so you're very, very welcome. Um, so I'll go to Miguel, who's over there, so I don't um, miss him, and then we'll come back to this side of the room. Miguel? Thank you very much, Chair, and good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Miguel Candia. I am from Paraguay. I, I am uh, with the permanent mission of Paraguay here in Geneva, 
and I'm in charge with uh, I'm in charge of the I, IG issues and uh, telecom issues as well. Um, Paraguay is a member of the ITU, which I have right beside me, <laughs> and um, uh, from and we are um, well. That's the 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 business part. I I am really happy to be here with you. I am some sort of a self-appointed official on on the IG issues. I brought that to the mission in in the interest of the ambassador in itself. So now I I managed to make it. Uh, an issue within the, the the mission of Paraguay there, so I'm happy about it, and I'm happy to be here, and I'm, um, I will try to be as useful as possible for the processes. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Carolyn. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, hi, good morning. My name is Carolyn Wynn, and I'm uh, with Microsoft. I. Um, part of a team of people at Microsoft that looks at issues that have to do, policy and regulatory issues that have to do with the digital economy, including privacy, online protection, um, accessibility, et cetera. And in the work that I do, it's very much around Internet governance, um, connectivity, the digital economy, as well as the new technologies that are the underpinning of the digital economy, including things like big data, data analytics, as well as artificial intelligence. Um, I've been involved in Internet governance for uh, about three years or so, um, driving some of the uh, our policy positions um, globally and really look forward to um, working with, with the MAG going forward. Thank you, Carolyn. And well, sorry, <laughs> it's sometimes hard to see the flags depending on where people are sitting in front. Eugene, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, um, uh, good morning to everybody. Um, as, um, to be honest, I'm not uh, really a, an expert on cyber affairs, but uh, as a diplomat, I have been uh, involved uh, on, in, in cyber affairs for, for many years, um, starting from the first UNGGE on information security. And as I work in the, uh, used to work in the uh, Department for Arms Control and Disarmament, um, uh, on you know on the st strategic security area, um, cyber affairs is a is a very much important part of that. Um, so um, I have been uh, on and, in an on and off manner. I have been working on this for many years, and uh, I also was on the team, uh, which has become the uh, the uh, cyber affairs office in the Foreign Ministry of China, and I also worked on. Uh, lethal autonomous weapon system as a, a leading Chinese expert during the discussion on the uh, framework of certain conventional weapons. And uh, now I'm with, uh, with the permanent mission of China in, in, uh, in Geneva. And uh, I, it's, uh, for me, it's really a great honor to be selected on the MAG 2017. And I would like to assure you that I would actively support your work and uh, fulfill my duties in a diligent manner and I'm also ready to work closely with dear colleagues in the days to come. Um, obviously, to be a MAG member is not an easy job. In this fast-changing, increasingly uncertain world, the importance of Internet governance can never be overestimated. As Internet has turned the world into a global village, we are shouldering the hefty burden of building a peaceful, secure, open, and orderly cyberspace. In this great cause, we have a lot to do and a long way to go. Um, uh, while I'm having the, the floor, um, I would like to take this chance to, to, ma uh, to uh, make a small advertisement, um, which I have did the la yesterday, that uh, China have uh, uh, each, uh, released its first international st strategy of cooperation on cyberspace. And uh, after you know, looking into it, the report, the, the, the document, I found that there was one particular paragraph regarding IGF. I, I would like to read it to you. Um, China will push for in institutional reform of the UN Internet Governance Forum to enable it to play a greater role in Internet governance, strengthen its decision-making capacity, secure steady funding, and introduce open and transparent procedures in its member election and report submission, etc. 
Um, um, yesterday, when I go back to the office, I have uh, sent the, uh, the link to the full text of the, the document to all MAG members, and I also have bring some hard copy to the conference room. Uh, interested uh, colleagues can uh, and get, get a hard copy from us. Thank you. Thank you, Haojun. <clears throat> and now we have Hisham from Egypt, who I believe is here in the role of a previous host country. Hisham, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Hisham uh, Abul Yazid. Uh, I do sympathize with the Skybers, of course, for the last name. Um, I'm, I'm here presenting the uh, government of, uh, of Egypt. Uh, Egypt have been uh, involved with the um, uh, IG discussions since uh, the early days. Um, uh, I, I work with the telecom regulator, NTRA, in, uh, in Egypt, and uh, a manager of the Information Society uh, unit within the regulator. Uh, for myself, I've, I've been involved with the IGF maybe for some time. Uh, this is not really my first MAG meeting uh, presenting Egypt, uh, but maybe for the last uh, two or three years uh, I've been away from the MAG, so uh, I thought it would be useful to make this introduction. Uh, I hope by, um, my, through my participation today and uh, tomorrow, I will be able to facilitate um, more engagement from uh, the Egyptian government for the benefit of the discussions. Thank you, Hisham. Um, I don't believe we have any new MAG members um, participating online at the moment. Um, Anya, maybe if they come on later on, you can let us know at an appropriate time. We'll, we'll ask them to go through the introductions. <clears throat> Could I ask um, the returning MAG members um, just to do the same thing, go through just, but just quite briefly, you know, we always, this is, this is a very important section. It's important that people understand why they're here and who they are and the names, and this is all about personal relationships. So. We need to give it the time it needs, but we should also be as efficient as we can um, with it as well. But if I could ask the returning um, MAG members to, um, to just basically do the same thing. And I guess I can start just because I'm looking over that way with Miguel, but then if people can put their flags up as well, because I said it's not always easy to see faces depending on who's in front. So Miguel. Okay, just for the record, uh, for people in San Francisco doing the transcripts, uh, that was me before, it was Miguel Escandia. Uh, my name is Miguel Ignacio Estrada. I'm from Argentina, I'm a consultant. This is my second term at the MAG. Um, well, nothing more, just that. <laughs> Miguel was previously with the, the government, um, so when we find really good MAG members um, who are making a significant contribution, and Miguel made a very big contribution last year, um, when they change stakeholder groups, and, and frankly the ones that usually change are from government, sort of for the obvious reason, um, then we'd still like to keep them on for the remainder of the expected MAG term. So Miguel is now a private sector um, member. The, I guess if I look, well, I've got Zina back there. Zina, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. My name is Zina Buharb. I'm from Lebanon, representing the Lebanese government. But uh, I'm uh, the head of international cooperation at Ogero Telecom, which is the main operator of the fixed telecommunication uh, in Lebanon. And this is my second term in the MAG. Thank you. Thank you, Zina. So I'm working my way across. Elizabeth, you have the floor. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Thomas Reno, and I'm with the International Chamber of Commerce. I have a dual role there. I manage the um, digital economy policy portfolio, which covers a number of uh, topic areas from data protection, cybersecurity, internet and telco um, issues and regulations, as well as I lead the project that, which is called ICC Business Action for, to support the Information Society. And this is an activity that was started just after the WISIS, where um, the private sector engaged uh, deeply in the WISIS process, wanted to continue working together um, across uh, sectors and, and continents to um, help ensure an engagement and, and solid uh, private sector support for 
uh, the ensuing activities of that. So I've been involved in internet governance off and on um, during my career for about the entire duration of the IGF uh, cycle. Uh, and it's great to be in my second year of the MAG. Welcome to all of the newcomers. Thank you, Elizabeth. Juan? My name is Juan Alfonso Fernandez Gonzalez. I am advisor at the Ministry of Communications of the Republic of Cuba, where I, my task there is regarding the development of all these technologies in, in Cuba. But internationally, I've been linked with the subject of ICT for development since the 2001. I was member of the United Nations ICT Task Force, then the Global Alliance for ICT and Development from 2005 to 2010. I worked and participated in the two summits and in the preparation of the summit. So I was member of the WIGIG, that was the working group of, in, of internet governance that was created between the two phases of the WISIS to precisely create the working definition of internet governance that is still the one we use. That is one of the documents. I don't want to be to advertise our own work, but I think it's a document that all the newcomers to MAC should check the, the working group of the WIGIG report that is from 2005. And now I'm also working in the working group for enhanced cooperation that is uh, is in working here in Geneva in the CSTD that, as you know, is to try to one of the mandates of the summit uh, regarding Internet governance that is still outstanding. We have to, to work on that. And also I am part of the Cuban team that is working in the GGE, the group of governmental experts, for in the con for uh, in the, what is the long name the content of in, of ICT in the context of international security that has this uh, third meeting last week here in Geneva the last meeting and fourth will be in New York in June that all those topics are related and well I'm here in the third term in MAG so this is it I will be out after this. <laughs> You are never out once you leave the mag. Yes. You, you, just, you just contribute with a slightly different title. And I, I want to echo Juan's point. I mean, the work, the WIGIG work is very central to the work we do here, just as is the Tunis agenda from the second phase of WISIS. The Tunis agenda, particularly, it's paragraph 72 to 78. So if you haven't looked at those recently, it's actually helpful, both that and, and WIGIG, to go back and refresh. That is sort of the, the platform from which so many of our discussions um, you know, come from. So I'll just continue this way and go with Rasha and then come back down through the, the back part of the room. Rasha, you have the floor. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Rasha Abdullah. I'm um, uh, from the uh, American University in Cairo, Egypt. I represent uh, civic society uh, in uh, Africa. Um, I've been researching the internet as a scholar for uh, over 15 years, I guess now. It's uh, longer than I would like to think. Uh, I've actually published three books on the internet in the Arab world, uh, numerous articles. I'm the author of the uh, Egypt uh, Mapping Digital Media Report. Uh, this is my second year on the MAG, so it's been quite a learning experience for me too. Uh, I learned a lot last year. Uh, I hope to be able to contribute as I go along the way. Uh, it's, a, it's a great experience. It's a fun group of people. Welcome to all the new members. Thank you, Rasha. I don't think she'd mind our sharing because she shared it with quite a large number of us the other night that she's actually the Arabic voice of Dory in Finding Dory and the Arabic voice of Daisy Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think it's always nice when you mm -hmm. find different ways to relate with individuals too. So I think that's, that's excellent. <laughs> Slaughter by you have the floor. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Slobodan Markovic, and uh, I uh, come from Serbia. F I work as an ICT policy advisor for a Serbian CCTLD registry, so I am a, a member of a technical community, but this is uh, 
<laughs> this is only the latest role. I previously worked uh, um, as a telecom and information society in general uh, um, advisor um, for Serbian government. And uh, this is my third term uh, uh, at the MAG. Uh, uh, and previously I've been involved uh, mainly in um, uh, discussions regarding improving uh, online participation, which I intend to continue. <laughs> I know that work was very helpful, too. Aida, you have the floor. This doesn't work. Does it work? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Aida Mahmutovic. I come from Bosnia and Herzegovina, representing civil society, uh, working on gender and ICT and privacy and data protection-related uh, things. Mostly, this is my uh, third term here, and I'll just be brief. <laughs> Thank you, Aida. Um, it's just for, these are for returning MAG members. So, Laura, you have the floor. Thank you. My name is Laura Watkins. I work for Nominet, who are best known as the Country Code Registry for .uk, um, as well as providing Wales and Cymru and a number of back-end registry services. Um, I lead on international policy, um, and we also provide a secretariat function for the UK IGF. Um, I've been involved in internet governance since 2007 uh, in Rio, and this is my second term on the MAG representing the technical community. Thank you, Laura. Raphael, you have the floor. Thank you, Ling. My name is Rafael Perez Galindo, and I am civil servant in the Ministry of uh, Digital Agenda of Spain. And since 2009, I, I represented Spain in different several fora relating to information society services, and I do policy and regulation. And I'm here in my second term in the MAG, and I usually do GAC in ICANN as well. Thank you. Thank you. Liesl? Good morning, everybody. Well, my name is Liesl Franz, and I am um, in the Office of the Coordinator for Cyber Issues at the U.S. Department of State. Um, I've been involved in Internet governance since uh, the IGF in Rio and been to all of them since. Um, not always as a government employee, though. I was previously with Tech America, which is an industry association um, that represented the high-tech industry in Washington for many years. Um, I'm on my second uh, MAG term and look forward to working with all of you and welcome to the new MAG members. Thank you, Liesl. Leah? Hello, morning, everyone. My name is Leah Kaspar. Um, I'm uh, one of the civil society representatives on the MAG, now in my third term. Um, originally, I'm from uh, Croatia, from Zagreb, but I'm currently the executive director of um, a UK-based organization, Global Partners Digital, that works to enable a digital environment underpinned by human rights and democratic values. Um, since about 2012, I've been managing projects at the intersection of human rights and digital communications, uh, where I've been concentrating upon facilitating multi-stakeholder dialogue and effective civil society engagement in international forums and processes. Um, some of those uh, include, involve uh, Net Mundial, uh, the um, ITU Plenipotentiary in 2014, the Global Conference on Cyberspace, and many others, um, and also the, the WISIS review, 10-year uh, review. I'm currently working on, uh, on our internal program for a cyber capacity building. And apart from um, my work on the, being a member of the MAG, I'm also the, uh, a member of the UK multi-stakeholder group on internet governance and a member of the steering committee of the UK IGF. Um, uh, as, like Juan and the uh, other members here, I think some, some others, I'm a member of the CSTD uh, Working Group on Enhanced Cooperation as well. Uh, and lastly, I, I also co-chaired the Global Forum on, um, the advisory board of Global Forum on Cyber Expertise. So welcome to all the new members. I look forward to working with you all in, the, in my last term. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Renata? I am uh, Renata Quino Ribeiro. I am from uh, Brazil, Fortaleza, and I am a civil society MAG member in my second term and uh, a researcher. Thank you. Shagun, we're asking um, returning MAG members to just make a short 
introduction. Okay, good morning. I'm Shagun Holubile. I'm from Nigeria. I'm actually representing the African ICT Alliance. I'm the CEO of Continental Project Associate and a cybersecurity policy advisor to Nigerian government. I'm a member of the National Cybercrime Advisory Council and a co-founder of Nigerian Internet Governance Forum. Uh, uh, this should be my third time on the MAG, and it's quite a privilege to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Shagun. Before we go to um, any online returning MAG members, um, just to give them a quick heads up, um, did I miss any returning MAG members here in the room? Oh, Arnold, sorry. Jim is just right in the... I don't know, you're fine, but I'm sorry. Arnold, you have the floor. Thank you, Lynn, and good morning, all. Uh, my name is Arnold van Rijn from the Ministry of Economic Affairs in the Netherlands. This is my second term uh, in the MEC, and I'm uh, grateful uh, for my reappointment. Uh, my portfolio is twofold. First, uh, I am coordinating the internet governance policy within the Dutch government. And secondly, I'm actively involved in helping to create the EU's digital single market. Since 2012, uh, I'm in charge of coordinating, co-organizing the uh, Netherlands Internet uh, Governance Forum. And currently, I'm also uh, uh, actively contributing to uh, helping uh, capacity building initiatives with, under the umbrella of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, which uh, is a result of the Cyberspace Conference in 2015 in The Hague. And last but not least, I'm helping to uh, prepare the International One Conference on Cybersecurity, which will be held to the 16th and 17th of May in The Hague. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold. I don't see anyone else that I missed here in the room. Do we have any returning MAG members online? I'm guessing Avri's there. Among seven. Yeah. Um, this, this Anya, is... could you just run the queue with them? And <clears throat> I'm not in the WebEx room. Yeah, this, so this yes, is Avri. Can Avri I be heard? Avri, after that, Alejandra, Julian, Vanavit, and Wisdom. And people should put their headphones on. It, um, I don't think we can hear them otherwise. This is Avri. Can I be heard by anyone? By everyone. Thank you, Avri. Okay. I know it's very, Great. very early there. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, but it's already an hour after getting up. Um, so I'm, I'm Avri Doria. I'm a third-year re returning MAG member. I've been involved with the IGF since it was a thought in the working group in Internet governance in various roles. Uh, I'm pretty much a portfolio worker. I come to the MAG through CS. I do independent research consulting and education and happy to be back for a third year and happy that it is my third and last year. Thanks. But you won't go far. I'm, I'm fairly sure of that. Alejandra, you have the floor. Hi, everybody. I'm Alejandra Ramuse from Uruguay. It's good to see you, all of you, again. Welcome to the new MAG members. And I, I, and I say hello to my current MAG, member, uh, other MAG members. Uh, I work for the Uruguayan government in the, e, in the agency of e-government and information society. And this is my second term, like a uh, MAG member. It's all. Thank you, Alejandra. And I know it's, again, early there as well, so, so thank you. And Julianne, Julian, same thing for you. You have the floor and it's early. Can you hear me? Hello. Uh, yes, we can hear you. Thank you very. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. This is uh, this is my second term in the uh, uh, in the MAC. I'm a, a director of uh, I'm representing civil society. I'm currently director of uh, Colnodo here in Colombia. And um, I'm currently also chair of the board of the Association for Progressive Communications, APC. I have been working and very involved with the Colombian IGF uh, initiative. 
and uh, also in the past in the organization of uh, regional Latin American IGF in 2012. I'm participating in most of uh, these uh, meetings. Um, I have been uh, participating in issues related to accessibility, sustainable development, access, and uh, now very much interested in uh, community uh, networks uh, for connecting next billion. So um, I'm glad to, to, to be here. And uh, I want to say also welcome to the new MAC members. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Wanawit, you have the floor. Wanawit, it's early there, it's actually late. <laughs> if you don't have audio yet, we'll come back in just a moment. Maybe we can move to wisdom. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. We can, yes. Okay, good morning from Ghana. Uh, my name is Wisdom. Uh, my second uh, term on the mark. Uh, I'm from Ghana. And uh, I apologize uh, for not uh, able to make it to the face-to-face -face meeting. I had one or two issues that uh, I need to resolve in the office. Um, uh, what I've been doing uh, since last year, uh, I've been working uh, at the front of uh, internet governance and open data. And then what we are looking at is uh, to use these two components to see how we can drive uh, change uh, within uh, our society. And also in hosting an Africa Open Data Conference this year, and then uh, we are looking at the possibility of uh, introducing internet governance uh, into the conference uh, so that the participants that will be coming from the various parts of Africa, especially within the government uh, sector, will see how we can use this forum uh, to actually uh, inform them what is going on globally in relation to open data and then uh, internet governance. Thank you. Thank you, Wisdom. Um, is Wanawit um, on audio yet, or Kenta? Or will we just come back at a later point? It's connected to audio, so maybe we can wait for later. Okay, thank, thank you, Anya. Um, just I'll do a quick introduction myself, and I know some of this seems repetitive of yesterday, and I'm going to introduce Thomas again in a moment, but this is the first day of the MAG. There are people that will turn in and follow the MAG that might not have actually followed yesterday's open consultations, and I think it's really important to have a kind of a complete standalone record here. Um, so I'm Lynn Sainamore. I was reappointed as the IGF MAG chair, having served uh, last year as the MAG chair and the year before that on the MAG. I have participated in every one of the IGFs. Um, I was with the uh, Internet Society as a president and CEO until the uh, very end of 2013. I was there for, it's actually there for about 16 years and the CEO for 14. And um, um, prior to that, participated in all the WISIS 1, WISIS 2 um, prep forums as well. So I've sort of been here for the full Internet governance journey as well. Um, you'll see my email address is actually Internet Matters. That was just a small part-time consulting company I'd set up after I left the Internet Society. It's in abeyance at the moment, but that is the, um, the working um, email address. Um, I think that covers all the sort of relevant points there. Um, I want to thank just a couple of um, all the, first of all, all the outgoing um, MAG members. Um, I think we had a tremendous year last year with a late and therefore compressed start. I think we actually made some good and important inroads in terms of um, improving the IGF along with um, a lot of requests and comments we'd had from the MAG community. There's, all, there's more to do. There's always more to do. Um, but I really want to thank everybody for their support and all the MAG members for working, again, so hard in a compressed timetable to try and really do, um, I think, quite a number of new things. Obviously, you need to thank the Mexican hosts for a fantastic 
fantastic IGF yesterday, as we heard heard um, so much. Um, again, they had some of the same challenges we did with respect to sort of time compression, and and I think as somebody said yesterday, every IGF is always the best. But I think that truly was was um, the best. Um, specifically, I'd like to thank um, Ambassador uh, Benedicto Fonseca, who had previously, as Brazil was the host country for IGF 2015, um, they actually maintain a special role in the second year as well. But um, Ambassador Fonseca actually agreed to help support me um, alongside um, the Mexican co-host as well with government outreach, as I didn't come from government, and this was the first MAG chair that, in fact, had not come from a government position. So I truly appreciated his support and all of his efforts and, and want to, to publicly thank him. There are many other people to thank. Um, one notable one, of course, is Marilyn um, Cade for all of her support for the NRIs. And I said yesterday we've made tremendous progress with the NRIs over the last few years, largely due to the NRIs themselves and their efforts, but clearly supported by Marilyn, by Anya and the Secretariat, and by the um, uh, coordinators as well. And I think that's going to prove just even more valuable um, to our work going forward. Um, need to thank all the BPF coordinators. Um, there's quite a few of them. That was a significant piece of work. I think last year was only our third year doing BPFs. Um, but, you know, we made tremendous progress in all of them. The work um, is, is much valued and very useful and, and you know, often complemented. So um, fantastic work there to all of them. Um, Avri. Um, and Marcus for their work with Dynamic Coalitions, or in Marcus's case, um, BPs as well. Again, the Dynamic Coalitions are really getting stronger and making really significant contributions, and Marcus reported on that um, somewhat yesterday as well. Um, Miguel did some fantastic work with new formats, um, which I think really brought some new life into the um, uh, IGF as well, so I really want to call, call that out. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody. Um, actually, I just remember it was connecting and enabling the next billion. Um, Constance um, and the Internet Society really helped move that forward over both of the last um, years, and I think that's become a very significant piece of work as well. And then, of course, Chengatai, who very timely <laughs> just came back in the room. Um, you know, without Chengatai's, you know, just, just sometimes almost superhuman, but steadfast support for everything we do and all the really great efforts of the Secretariat, too, who do a tremendous, tremendous amount of work with less than sort of five resources on average over the course of the, the year. It really is remarkable how, um, how well all this works. So just really want to recognize and thank you for all your support and contributions over the, over the last year. Um, and with that, the next um, item in the agenda is to go to the 2016 IGF host comments. And Israel, I don't know if you have any words of introduction, but otherwise I think we have a, a video. Israel, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, this is Israel Rosas. Um, I want to congratulate uh, you for being reappointed as a uh, the MAC chair. I think that we are very fortunate to having you as a, as a chair for this uh, year. I want to thank also the IEF Secretariat for the amazing effort, support, and commitment during the IEF uh, 2016 meeting and uh, during the preparatory process. I want also to thank the Swiss government for hosting the IEF uh, 2017 meeting. We wish you all the success. Uh, we are totally willing to share with you our learned lessons, and, uh, and we are sure that the, the meeting will be a, a total success. Now, we in Mexico have the commitment to be a liaison between the global AEF and our local community in order to foster the participation of the Mexican stakeholders in the global community. Now we have a video with uh, the remarks of Mr. Victor Lagunes, the former uh, host country uh, honorary co-chair. Thank you. Thank you, Israel. Today, I'm honored to have good morning, everyone. Today, I'm honored to address you with extreme satisfaction of having hosted the IGF 2016 meeting this past December in Jalisco, Mexico. 
It was a privilege, but also came with some challenges. However, we know that in the multi-stakeholder community, these challenges are faced together. For all this, I'd like to thank UNDESA, the IGF Secretariat, the internet community, and the MAC members for the valuable support provided to Mexico throughout last year as host country. During the IGF 2016 meeting, more than 2,000 delegates from all over the world shared opinions, debated, and proposed best practices, all related to a stronger internet governance framework in more than 200 sessions. The internet community was encouraged to participate remotely with more than 2,000 delegates attending through this digital channel. Mexico, in its role of host country, offered five workshops and a high-level meeting on day zero. In our country, we believe in the transformative power of the internet, which we promote in our national digital strategy, which focuses in government transformation, digital economy, open data, connectivity, interoperability, legal framework, among other fronts. The same spirit is shared at the regional level with the ELAC digital agenda shared by Mexico. The internet is already the most powerful tool we have to democratize access to information, protect human rights, and to create more equality within our societies. This in line with the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda and the WISIS mandate. Since its creation, this community has positioned the IGF as the main reference on internet governance. Now, after 11 successful meetings, we have built year by year a stronger IGF, which consolidates and boasts the efforts of all the supporting regional and national governance forums. I wish all the success to my colleagues from Switzerland, to the IGF Secretariat, and to the 2017 Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group. We'll be more than willing and privileged to be able to continue our support to you going forward. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Maybe we can all just acknowledge uh, Mexico's great efforts with a round of applause. Here. And Israel, if you'd please pass our sincere congratulations on to Yolanda, Victoria, Victor. Um, that'd be much appreciated. Thank you. Um, with that, we come to the 2017 host country um, presentation. Um, so again, let me just quickly introduce um, Thomas. Um, Thomas is the host country co-chair. Um, as I said yesterday, um, I've known Thomas for several years and worked with him in, in a number of different environments. We're lucky to have him, and we're very fortunate to be in Switzerland. Switzerland offers us, and Geneva in particular, a wealth of opportunities in terms of the international organizations that are here, obviously the United Nations Office of Geneva, access to, I think, about 170 or 180 missions in, in, um, in Geneva, not to mention, of course, um, all the other um, headquarters of private sector companies and other activities here. So I think we're very fortunate, um, and it's also very accessible. It's quite sort of densely packed, if you will, in terms of, of um, offices and, and um, people we can access and initiatives and programs, key programs, particularly with all the other UN um, organizations as well. Um, and I hope that we keep that in mind as we actually look to the program and some of these efforts. We've always had a very significant interest in further outreach um, and deeper outreach and more meaningful or more uh, outputs, which actually can be much more useful on the ground. So we have a lot of vehicles we can use to actually um, facilitate that here in Geneva. And I think this is just an excellent opportunity to take advantage of that. So a quick word on Thomas. Thomas earlier this year was appointed the Vice Director of the Swiss Federal Office of Communications, uh, OFCOM, this English ac acronym, where he'll head the International Relations Service effective the 1st of April um, this year. He was appointed to that position as well as the Vice Director of the Office by the Federal Department of the Environment, uh, Transport, Energy, and Communications. He joined Ofcom in 2003, where he coordinated Switzerland's activities and positions in relation to the World Summit and the Information Society and uh, numerous other internet governance issues. And um, as I said, of course, WISIS 1 and WISIS 2 are really the core underpinning of, of much of what we do, if not virtually everything we do here um, in the IGF. So it's, um, we're incredibly lucky to have Thomas with that level of experience um, and 
subject matter knowledge on Internet governance. So with that, I'll turn to Thomas to say some few words, and then I think we can move into a more substantive presentation on the FOIGF here in December. Yes, thank you, and hello to those who haven't been uh, here uh, before, and of course, congratulations to you. Um, <laughs> and and uh, I said a few things about, let's say, the political vision or, or the, the, uh, that we have as, as, as the host of this year. Um, I will not repeat everything that, that can, be, can be read in the transcript. I'll concentrate on some, some key issues. Um, the most important for us is that um, although we hadn't planned this for years to host the IGF, um, but that was rather a spontaneous uh, thing that came up uh, towards the end of last year, um, we quickly realized that this is actually an opportunity uh, a win-win situation, opportunity for us as, as a country, as a government, uh, as well as for the IGF itself, or as we hope and believe for, for the, the global uh, community, um, because, as I said yesterday, we have a, a new strategy. It's about the fourth or fifth one since the first strategy that was called the uh, Federal Strategy on the Information Society in the 90s. The new strategy that we have uh, since last year is called uh, Digital Switzerland. Um, and the, the funny thing is, uh, we'll get to that later, that when we talked about the Information Society or Internet Governance, nobody really knew what that was and what to do with this. Now that we're calling it Digital Switzerland, uh, parliamentarians, businesses, everybody is extremely interested and wants to be part of this and, and uh, in, in the implementation and so on and so forth. So, um, and we have a, a, a series of, of uh, multi-stakeholder dialogue events on national level in Switzerland. Uh, one of the key ones, uh, some of them are organized by us, so others are organized by other stakeholders, uh, civil society, businesses, um, um, academia, uh, technical community. Uh, one of the key ones will be our national IGF that will take place at the end of May in Bern. Another one will be a big uh, national dialogue day uh, in November. Um, and, and then there are a number of others. Uh, as I said, there's a uh, private sector organization called Digital Switzerland. Surprise, surprise about the name. Um, that is also uh, gathering more and more important uh, stakeholders and we are cooperating with them um, and uh, a number of other events. And it makes perfect sense uh, to, at the end of the year, uh, basically uh, have the whole, the experts of the whole world come to Geneva and where our Swiss stakeholders can learn from the experience from other countries and hopefully we can also contribute with our uh, discussions and experience uh, to um, better understanding for others of, of relevant issues. So this is the national side um, that where the timing is, is, is great in, in that sense and we're very happy to, to, to have this opportunity. Um, for the uh, IGF and for the uh, global community, um, in addition of our, our small country, uh, hoping to feed in some of the substance and experience into the process. Of course, Geneva is not just uh, in, uh, a Swiss city. We actually call it uh, La Genève Internationale, so it's considered in Switzerland as something special. Everybody knows uh, what, what this is, and uh, the reason is, is obvious. We are sitting here in the UN. Um, we have a number uh, of, of intergovernmental uh, institutions that deal with a number of uh, lots of things that have more and more uh, links to, to, to the internet, to the digital world, uh, to the virtual world. Uh, I will not name them all now. Um, and there are a number of, of private uh, think tanks. There are a number of private companies that have their offices or even headquarters here. There are a number of NGOs uh, that work in different fields that are related uh, to, to internet governance and to, to digital issues. Um, and we think it's actually a huge uh, opportunity to try and bring as many of these experts that are not Swiss people, but they come from all over the world. They just happen to, to be here um, to try and bring them into the IGF, uh, get them in contact with, with the um, traditional, let's say, IGF community and, and hope to, to, to contribute to something that is, makes the IGF uh, a relevant event, but also that should help 
to transport the discussions and, and, and insights and learnings from the IGF into all, all of these institutions um, so that they can take better informed decisions in, in their own uh, fora uh, later on. And of course, we hope that these connections that we hope to, to establish will stay also for the, for the following IGFs. So um, this is really something that we all see as a, as a huge opportunity. And uh, we, we can uh, come, to, come to this later when we, when we talk about uh, the theme and, and, and the, the overall, let's say, vision of, of this IGF. But for us, what is, what is key, and we had a discussion last night with the Director General of, uh, of UNOC here in Geneva, our ambassador to the Swiss mission, uh, Lynn and Jengetai and some other people. We really want to use the fact that we are here in Geneva to liaise with all these institutions. And what we've realized, and this is something that came up yesterday already, came up in the, in the retreat uh, last year, that uh, we have not been too good in communicating what internet governance is, what the IGF does, what the value added uh, of this dialogue forum is. <clears throat> and we have to improve this in order to make uh, uh, people understand what the value of a, uh, of a conference is that does not take decisions, but is actually uh, understanding issues, helping people to understand each other's roles and functions, and, and uh, setting uh, agendas, uh, giving space for emerging ideas, emerging issues, emerging opportunities. This is something that uh, also on national level, um, we realized we need to be better in explaining. We all here, we know the potential, we believe in it, but many others don't really understand because we have so far not really taken the effort that we could have or should have to really explain this and, and, and adapt this or translate this into the issues that they deal with, into their worlds, because the links are there. To us, they are obvious. To the others, they are not always obvious. So we are, are very committed together with, uh, uh, with uh, the chair of the MAC, with the IGF Secretariat, with UNOC, who will be the, let's say, physical host uh, of, the, of the IGF because it will be in these premises, uh, with UNDESA, with everybody who is, who is involved, uh, and, and of course us as, as the, the host country, to, to really make this link, to explain the value added of the IGF to those who we think would benefit from participation uh, themselves, but also would add to the, to the quality and relevance of the IGF uh, for others. Um, and to make these links and, and to, to make them understand why um, it is important and useful and a win-win for everybody that they uh, engage more with us with the, uh, let's say, traditional, uh, I won't say hardcore, but maybe core IGF uh, 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 people. And because this is the opportunity now in Geneva to, to boost uh, uh, the IGF into all spheres or as many spheres as possible where, where internet issues uh, are, are relevant. I'll stop here. I think the discussion will go on on this and I'll just give you a, a few uh, uh, informations about, about uh, logistics and, and so on. First of all, as I said yesterday, we will have a website uh, like the other host countries did. And uh, of course, uh, actually the Mexican website is uh, extremely good. It is simple, straightforward. Everything is there that needs to be there, so we uh, uh, took the liberty to let us inspire um, by, by the, the, the website of last year. Um, we have a, a, a URL registered. It's called uh, IGF2017.swiss. Um, this is a new GTLD for the ICANN people here. It's a community TLD that, that we as a government uh, uh, applied for uh, to put it at the disposal of the Swiss community. And since uh, all those, uh, the IGF will take place in, in, in Geneva, of course, we consider all the participants of the IGF uh, as part of the Swiss community. So that will be the, the, uh, <clears throat> the domain name, IGF2017.swiss. And uh, it will basically contain, as I said before, similar information to, to what previous uh, hosts have put on there, um, uh, in particular the, the last one. Uh, there are some, uh, the situation is in some, ex uh, some respects slightly different because um, we are not going to a, a venue somewhere uh, in, I don't know, Basel or, or St. Gallen, where I come from, but we, go, we are stay, will be staying in the Palais des Nations. So this, Many people know uh, 
how to get here, they know how this works. The issue of visa is also something that there is uh, maybe, or hopefully, less uh, questions than, than with, with other places because our foreign ministry and the UN, of course, they do this every day. And, and, uh, so, but there will be information on how to get a visa. There will be information uh, on, on how to get here to, to Geneva. Um, there will be information on how to get free transport tickets because we have a system that if you land at the airport, there's a machine before you leave the airport that gives you a free ticket downtown to your hotel, and in the hotel you get a free ticket for the public transport, and so on and so forth. So all this information will be there. Um, with regard to hotel, uh, we checked with, with the foreign ministry, those who, who uh, deal with, with the conference and, 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 and locally. <clears throat> there will not be a special... Uh, agreement with the, with the local hotel industry um, because um, with the dates of 18 to 21 December, um, the uh, hotel uh, booking uh, uh, are, will be fairly low compared to high seasons like March, April, or September, October, for instance. So there are enough uh, hotels available at, at good rates. And uh, um, so... so uh, this is an engineer is able to cope with, let's say, around 2,000 participants for the IGF. Uh, and there is nothing going on uh, in that week that would be like a competition uh, to, to, to hotel rooms. Um, this is the advantage of actually having one of the advantages of having it in that particular week um, of the 18th uh, December. Um, there, are, there are some possibilities that we're currently looking into together with the IGF Secretariat. There's the uh, uh, that was mentioned yesterday already. There's the Geneva International Welcome Center that has some, some uh, 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 facilities or some connections to, to subsidized uh, <clears throat> uh, hotel rooms. Um, and we'll look into the, that to what extent we, we may be able to use that. Uh, of course, also uh, knowing that Geneva is, is you have the city of Geneva and you have areas around that are connected by public transport uh, uh, quite, quite well. So uh, it, it's not only the city of Geneva, but it's also the areas around Geneva that have hotels, uh, uh, some of them at, at fairly cheaper rates. Um, so we consider the uh, hotel issue as, as a no problem in particular for that period, uh, that week in, in the year. Uh, but there will be information about, about this also on, on our website <clears throat> and then uh, let me quickly check what is on the Mexican website, what else. Uh, <laughs> registration will be done. <laughs> yeah, it's a, good, it's a very good one. Uh, registration will be done through the IGF uh, uh, website, of course. Um, we'll somehow then, we'll, we're currently trying to find out what the requirements are for, for streaming and remote participation and so on and so forth, and, and there will be some links or information to YouTube and whatever the exact modalities will be, we, we, we are still in, in, in discussion. Uh, there will be some information about the venue, but as I said, this is something that many people are quite familiar with and the information is already around. Um, and so that's uh, more or less going to be it uh, for, for the website, um, which we are uh, basically putting together now, and we, we, uh, the, the plan is to have this ready by the end of, of April, so, so uh, enough time ahead of, of the conference. Um, maybe one more thing that, that uh, uh, people are curious about, which is the so-called zero day. Um, just a few words. Um, for us, um, the priority of the IGF is clear that we want to invest all our resources that we have uh, into the IGF itself. We want to have a good IGF, a good bottom-up organized IGF uh, where everybody can make his or her voice heard. Um, we are uh, trying to also do something to discuss with the MAG to see how we can make the opening ceremony and the, the welcoming part of the IGF as open and in particular as interactive as possible. Um, uh, high level but interactive. Uh, this is the, uh, the goal. Uh, we'll see how much we, we, we get. Um, <clears throat> and we um, would only uh, foresee to organize a zero day if there was a clear value added. Um, yes? 
I'm, I'm very sorry for interrupting, but I, I just think I need to do a little bit of bridging here. Um, day zero in, in this room means more than just the high-level political I forum. I, I so if you can yeah, make yeah. it clear that yeah. right, right now your discussion is focused on the high-level high political level. forum. Okay. So it's yeah. been focused on the high-level political forum, not all the other activities that take place in day zero. Thank you for clarifying. Yes, for the time being, I'm talking about the high-level uh, uh, events that uh, have emerged in the, in the last year that were in the main responsibility of the host. Um, so unless we see a clear value added to doing something that is not a duplication uh, of the opening ceremony and, and other high-level parts of the IGF, um, we do not intend to, to, to organize something uh, in addition. That, and I'm coming to, to you, that does not mean that there will not be uh, meetings, side events and so on, prep meetings on a zero day or even on a minus one day. So we, uh, together with the Secretariat, we are looking into um, uh, making rooms available for those who wish to meet, um, like this has happened before, uh, in the Palais, or if it's not in the Palais, then there's other conference venues close by in walking distance, like the CICG, for instance, which some of you may know, uh, uh, in front of the ITU. And, and so there will be rooms available according to the needs um, for side events and, and prep meetings, but, but let's say the high-level zero day is not something that has a priority for us. We, we want to really focus on, on making the IGF itself uh, high-level and, and relevant. I stop here. Um, there may be uh, questions or comments that I'm, I'm happy to, to take. Thank you. Thank you. And let me just stress again on the terminology, I think, because I've had far too many requests with people believing that day zero is kind of canceled or something. So maybe if, if we want to talk about the high-level political, and we really just call it the high-level yeah, political we just, event. Uh, we usually just call it the HLM. The HLM. <laughs> which stands for what? High-level high level meeting? Meeting, yes. <laughs> or HLLM, so, high-level leaders meeting. Mm -hmm. Because day zero actually has some very substantive events, Best Bits and GigaNet and ISOC and ICANN, and they're, they're not just sort of smaller preparatory meetings or, or side events. They are, are significant um, other meetings. So I just want to make sure that that's really clear because I have had a number of number of questions on that. Elizabeth, is it to this point? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. I just wanted to ask a quick question about um, if the venue is the Palais here, uh, obviously that's terrific. The security doesn't have to scope out the venue and ask the questions, but how will we actually manage the capacity of all those people to come into the Palais at the same time, just thinking of the security lineup sometimes in front, as including this morning and yesterday. Thank you. We'll, uh, we'll open up the registration at 4 o'clock in the morning <laughs> of Monday <clears throat> so that everybody gets in by, by 9. <clears throat> no, of course, you're right. And we, we knew that. And um, <clears throat> we are sorting out the details, but the plan is to have if, if we don't use the Palais on, on the weekend before, i.e. on day zero, day minus one, the registration will be open on Sunday, probably as well on Saturday, because as you say, um, we can't get 2,000 people registered here in this, in this entry. So we, we are aware of the issue and we will somehow uh, uh, do our best that uh, people can register already on, on Sunday probably as well on, on, on Saturday, uh, depending on, on, on the concrete solutions that, that, that we find. I hope, uh, yeah, Cenge, they compliment yeah. me. You, you're, you live here, so you know things even better than yeah, I. Yeah, uh, we are st we're yeah. still working it out, but, you know, one of the solutions is, you know, reg registration is open on Saturday and Sunday. We have a, you know, we're also thinking of having a tent out there. And also, I mean, I don't want to say things that will, you know, um, uh, tell the DSS, you know, the security services what to do. But, you know, I mean, we have other entrances and we can make, you know, um, arrangements. Yes. Mm -hmm. Juan, you have the floor. Yes, my question is back to day zero. Um, and I think that yesterday you mentioned that day zero, the MAG will have some um, under the its purview. Uh, do the MAG, I'm asking that, uh, would the day zero events, will the MAG screen them or we will put the requirement or will be totally independent? I'm asking this because uh, the, the IGF 
has been done, the participation of, of, of non-governmental organizations has been under UN rules, and some organizations that doesn't fit the requirements of UN rules are tried in previous uh, IGF to organize events in day zero, events that has been very controversial, and I think that is not the spirit, not of the IGF, and even less the spirit of Geneva. So I think this is probably going to take tag teaming across the three of us up here. Um, Juan's point goes to the fact that day zero isn't actually formally under the UN summit. Um, so day zero has been a host country um, sort of set of activities, if you will. Last year, um, the MAG um, did ask to, because normally the MAG isn't involved in the host country responsibilities in day zero, I did ask to see um, those events. Um, and we were kindly accommodated by Mexico, and I would expect we would be as well as Switzerland. Um, I don't know if Chengatai wants to add anything specifically, but... No, I'm, we're still fine-tuning. Well, last year we were still fine-tuning the system. I mean, we're more and more aware of um, where the <laughs> sensitivities lie. So this year we, we, we're going to do the same, and I think uh, when we do, yeah. Last year, we went well. I think the Mexican organizers were understanding of, of the situation. I think it, it worked work, it work very well. Just, I'm just saying, I hope and I expect that this time it will well work again. Um, just, just a quick remark. Uh, um, as we are new to, to this, as, as, as the organizers, of course, uh, will basically rely on established functioning practices or help uh, clarifying them if, if, uh, if that's possible or necessary. Um, of course, Geneva is a city where anybody can organize an event in whatever venue um, if this is not formally linked, uh, let's say, to the IGF. So there may be events if somebody uh, wants to organize an event on Friday or Saturday or Sunday or whatever, or, or during these days, um, this is not up. Uh, this is not up to, to, to us as, as IGF uh, to, to, to control, I would say. But, but um, whatever is linked to the IGF, uh, we will rely on, on, on the practices that, that, that have been established over the past years. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just ask Changatai if there's anything he wants to add to sort of the Overall, I know we normally get into the detail quite quickly. I don't know if there's anything you want to add with respect to any of the premises or overall framework or anything that will help the discussions before we start moving into the program shaping. Um, not really. I think um, Thomas covered most of it. Um, you, you know, you know, this is the palais. This is the place where the event is going to take place. Um, as you can see with the furniture, we don't have that much um, room to make changes to the room. So, you know, what you see is what you get here. We can't really change anything much. Um, but, you know, there's a whole host of rooms and um, the U-shaped or hollow-shaped table was one of the most popular formats. We've got plenty of rooms that fit um, that. So um, we, we can play around with what's here and, you know, people know. And we have basically the same level of capacity in terms of not that we necessarily want to continue with the same number. I'm not assuming that since we always have a lot of comments on reducing um, competing events, but there are no kind of capacity restrictions overall. Or I'm just trying to, to um, anticipate the questions we traditionally get and see if we can answer them up front here. Uh, capacity restrictions... Not really. I, I'm just looking at the team over here, if they have any um, comments as such. But, um, no, I mean, none that I can think of at the moment. Um, just, I mean, you're all aware of what goes on here, and you're all aware of what more, more or less we're capa capable of. I mean, if there's anything that comes that's extraordinary, we can discuss it. But, yeah. I have Shagun in the queue, and then Hojun. Oh, thank you, Chair. I just want to have this question on behalf of my uh, African colleagues. I have this impression that um, in December it will be extremely very cold. I want to know if you have a provision for African delegates, maybe to make things easy for us. 
Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I, actually, I've been to Nairobi uh, uh, last month, and it was uh, significantly warmer than here, so I, I, I think I know what, what you mean. Um, well, yeah, and the, the, the weather conditions may not be as nice as they have been last year in, in, in Mexico, um, you, but you never know what you get with, with the, the new climate that we have. You may get 15 degrees or 20 degrees in December or minus 10. So that's not necessarily uh, in our full control. Um, um, but, um, yeah, so I don't know what, what, what the concrete support that you would ask for. Um, we'll make sure that, that there's heating, I think, yes. uh, <laughs> uh, in, in the rooms and, and also in, in, in the, the hotels. And the buses are normally also somehow heated. But maybe you can compliment me. We can discuss it. I mean, if you've got any particular ideas, you can, you, we can, you, you, you can come to me or to any of us, and then we can discuss it and see what we can do. Yeah. Thank you, Shigun. Okay, I have the following um, uh, MAG members in the queue. I have Hujun, and then we'll go to Zina. And with Exception Canada, we'll take you in the queue after. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, um, the upcoming IGF meeting will be held in, in this place, in this compound, right? Um, I think this is a good idea because we here we have, uh, you know, sophisticated um, uh, equipment, uh, so many meeting rooms. Uh, it's great. But uh, in the meantime, we have to be aware that Paladin, uh, uh, this place is very politically sensitive. And uh, the access control of to of the participants, because we are going to have lots of uh, participants from the civil society, private companies, and the civic groups. Many of those groups uh, uh, would, uh, you know, um, member states of the United Nations would have difficulty for some particular organization, a particular people, to come to this place. And, uh, you know, uh, now the, 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 the whole situation the whole international situation is very complicated, and uh, there are lots of anti-globalization people, anti-Trump people, and also anti-Chinese people, of course. And uh, there are some uh, um, organizations which have extreme tendencies, which was tag, you know, labeled by some countries as terrorist groups, and they would like to take advantage of such a good opportunity to use this conference as a great platform for their cause. And we have to be very much aware of the political sensitivity involved. And we hope the UN and the Switzerland can work together to put in place a strict screening process that makes sure that uh, um, con controversial people and organization are not allowed into this compound. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you for, for the question. Um, uh, the IGF 2017 is going to be a UN meeting. These are UN grounds. We follow UN rules. And um, we do also have our IGF code of conduct that, that that's there. Um, we're here to, to discuss issues concerning internet governance. We're not here to, you know, uh, we call it name or shaming or um, ad hominem attacks, etc. We're here to discuss the issues, not you know who did what or whatever. It's the issues that we're here for. Mm. Um, thank you. So we have um, quite a large um, queue for the moment. Um, we have Zena, um, Canada, and then we have um, five online participants. I'd like to draw the line under that set of speakers for the moment. I'm assuming that if you're in the queue, it's on the subjects that have been raised um, to date. Um, and then after we're done with those, um, I have a, a couple of opening remarks, and then I think we should go to the um, working group on the workshop evaluation. I know that may feel like a, an early tactical move, but it's a really critical piece of work, and it's critical to us getting the program started. And I want to make sure that the MAG has enough time to actually assess the proposed changes so that we can finalize on that before the end of the day tomorrow. Um, and before that, I'm going to give the floor back to Florida for a moment, and then we'll go. Uh, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm going to give the floor back to Thomas for a moment and then go to Zina. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to also react to, to, to what a, a Chinese colleague say, uh, said. Of course, uh, we do understand that, the, that this is a, a critical and sensitive issues, uh, uh, issue, and, and we take this very seriously, as, as, as always. Um, what, what I think is not special is that every IGF is in the end, the venue is UN territory. You have UN security people, uh, no matter where, uh, on what, in what city. So it's it's UN ground. The UN rules <clears throat> follow. We had the IGF 2011, I think, in Nairobi, that was held in a UN uh, regional office. So formally, uh, I don't see any difference uh, with, with this one. Of course, this place may have a more uh, symbolic uh, uh, importance. Um, but as I said, we'll, we'll, uh, we're happy to, 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 to look into this also together with, with and, and look at concerns. Um, but formally, uh, the, the rules are basically the same for every IGF. Thank you very much. Thank you. Zina, you have the floor. Yes, it's, uh, just a quick, a quick uh, question. Uh, first, uh, uh, is there any expectation of the number of people that might be participating in the coming IGF, mainly from Switzerland? And uh, is the, the biggest toll, the largest toll at the UN, how many people can it accommodate if we cannot move the furniture and uh, we got what we see? Sorry. We'll never know exactly how many people are going to come until the day. Uh, we usually have, what, 2,300 people coming in. Um, and so we may have more. We may have a little less. We're not too sure. Um, as for the rooms, the biggest room uh, which we need for the opening, which is uh, we have the main assembly hall. I don't know if you've seen it. That's a little bit over 2,000 people. So if that's not big enough... We can also have a, um, another room, which is an overflow room, and we've made those arrangements in other IGFs. So if that room is full, people can go to an overflow room and watch the proceedings on a, on a screen. I mean, that's the only thing we can do. Um, but for the uh, workshops, et cetera, I mean, we've got quite large rooms, you know, 400 capacity, 700 capacity. So... That, uh, I don't think we'll have the problem of having a small room that we can, and there's over 25 rooms. We're not going to use all of them. Uh, hopefully, we're going to stick to the 11 rooms, um, but that's... Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chengatai. Canada? Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. My name is Christiane Roy. I'm here with the Canadian Permanent Mission. I'm sorry, I was not, I'm not entirely familiar with MAG procedures, if we non-MAG members can take the floor or not, so I'm sorry if I'm out of line. But uh, I just wanted to uh, react to, to some of the comments and, um, and offer some reassurance uh, to some of the MAG members who may not have the chance to come to the Pele regularly. I mean, obviously, this infrastructure here is in place for a long time. It regularly hosts huge meetings. I mean, the Human Rights Council is going on right now. Now. There's lots of civil society organizations that show up for that. You have review conference for disarmament uh, treaties and, and whatnot that happen regularly. So there is a good capacity here, I think, to absorb the volume and be able to process it and, and provide adequate vetting as we have for all of these other things. And the other thing that I would like to point out is perhaps a call to the Secretariat. Uh, I know that I do this for when I have Canadian delegations coming into town is on the Thursday or the Friday the badges are already available. So I can go and collect them prior to the event starting on the Monday. So perhaps in your organization, you, you can work with the missions to say, hey, by the way, you know, um, you have a delegation of five coming in. Perhaps your mission driver can come and pick up the badges on Thursday, and you will already be decreasing the volume of people at the door for the Monday morning uh, session. So I would wholeheartedly uh, encourage you to, to reach out to mission and use us to facilitate uh, uh, and 
victory uh, on the on the morning of. And finally, one last thing: in Canada, we have a saying that there is no bad weather; there is only bad clothing. All right, and I fully appreciate the concerns of our African colleagues here. And perhaps one of the things you'll want to add to your website is resources where people can buy perhaps secondhand winter boots or secondhand jackets to keep them warm for a couple of days and be able to return them to that store afterwards for for resale. But I think that that certainly is a resource that you know Canada often welcomes immigrants from Syria, and usually we meet them at the airport with a winter jacket and a pair of boots. We may not be able to do this for all IGF participants in December, but certainly provide them with resources where they can equip themselves. That I think would be very considerate for our people coming from southern warmer climates. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Maybe we can make a deal if, if people from Africa bring in this, the African sun in their hearts to Geneva, we give them some, some warm clothing. That would be excellent. Thank you. That's, that's lovely, actually. Um, no, and maybe this is a good point. I mean, you're right. I didn't actually um, restate again that um, today um, is sort of a reverse of yesterday. As the priority MAG members are given the floor, there is an expectation that, um, for the most part, it is only MAG members that speak. This is where we actually do our programmatic work. Um, other speakers are recognized um, um, by exception of the chair, which does happen with some um, you know, regularity. And I think your intervention was very helpful and, and certainly right to the point. So, so thank you. Um, Haujun, you have the floor again, and then, yes, we'll put Indonesia in the back. Uh, bad weather or good clothes. Um, I'm sure that, you know, on, in, in Geneva there are lots of uh, skiing equipment shops, and if you need such clothing, you can rent temporary. But uh, I assure you, to rent is much more expensive than to buy. And to buy from China is the best way. <laughs> and, and about, uh, I would like to go back to the access control. Uh, I'm happy that uh, UN rules and the procedures will be applied. But um, um, our experience is that in this place, in uh, Palais de Nation, in the past, over the past few years, um, certain elements of terrorist group, um, criminal refugees from China, um, are, you know, allowed into this compound under certain pretext, and uh, we wish to make sure that such things never happen again. Thank you. Thank you. Mojino, Indonesia. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question. Have you decided the, the date of the IGF, next IGF uh, on December, but the, there is no date? And the second thing is uh, the place. Uh, Geneva is very crowded. How about if you uh, decide another place for in, in uh, uh, Swiss, yes, uh, maybe in Bern or in uh, Zurich or something like that. So uh, not too crowded like uh, right now. Thank you. Um, the dates are actually the 18th to the 21st of December. And a little unusually, that means Monday through Thursday, where typically we've run Tuesday to Friday. But those dates are confirmed, and Geneva is definitely confirmed. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I live in Zurich, so, I live in Zurich, so I would be happy to have you all uh, next door. Um, the thing is that we have announced the dates in, in Mexico in, in, uh, at, the, at the closing, so it's 18 to 21. Uh, we decided to choose Monday to Thursday instead of the usual traditional Tuesday to Friday for the main reason that we want everybody to be able to those at least that are Christians, um, um, to be able to be home for, for the Christmas holidays, uh, no matter how far away you are from, from Switzerland. So this is, and, and uh, it may happen, it normally doesn't, but it may happen that uh, it is too cold and then some airplanes or some airports are not equipped to de-ice planes. Uh, in, in Switzerland, we're used to that, but uh, sometimes our neighbors and, 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 and other European countries that have hubs, um, not looking at, at Mark from London at all, uh, they sometimes have problems with, with de-icing uh, uh, airplanes. So, so just to, to be sure that everybody is home, um, 
this is why we, we uh, decided to, to put it on, on Monday to, to Thursday. And, and about uh, Geneva, as we've heard, uh, the Palais des Nations has held bigger meetings. Uh, when we organized the, the WISIS, uh, the summit in 2003, that was as well December, that was in the, um, um, what's it called, where the, where the Salon de, um, uh, in the Palais Expo, uh, out uh, close to the airport, and we had 12,000 participants for the, for the summit, and we had 38,000 participants or visitors of the exhibition, the ICT for the exhibition, so um, we, are fair, we have no doubt that Geneva uh, will, will be able to cope with this. And as, as you see, that the distances are fairly short, so while, while you have to wait for shuttles or public transport uh, for long uh, 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 distances, uh, it's actually, uh, almost everything is in 10, 15 minutes or even less uh, walking distance uh, from, from, from here, from the train station, the airport is fairly close. So um, we are convinced that there won't be any, let's say, logistical problems uh, of that sort. Thank you very much. So let me just, this has been a nice gentle start to the morning, but we need to get down to work fairly soon here. Um, I closed the queue a little while ago. Michael and Mamadou are in the queue, and then I'd like to make just a few um, remarks and then move to Russia um, to take us to the workshop evaluation proposal and then move to, to um, lunch. If we can work towards that agenda, I think that would be be helpful. If there are more specific questions, questions on transportation or clothing, we can do that offline or on the mailing list perhaps. This is really valuable face-to-face -face time um, right here. I think we need to really use it to move our work forward. So Michael, you have the floor. Hello. My issue concerns the visa application processes. What procedure have you put in place to ensure that delegates are able to get their visas without difficulties, and also issues to do with visas for us African MAG members. It is quite tiresome to go to, to an embassy every now and then to go and get a visa. Like if I'm to attend the December IGF as a MAG member, I will still need to go and apply for a new visa. Having 20, 30 visas in your passport in a period of two years actually decreases the lifespan of one's passport. I travel a lot, so basically a passport for me is valid for two years, which is supposed to be valid for 10 years. So basically if for MAC members, whose chances of them returning for a second or a third term, is it possible that you can come up with a way where you have a document that states that one can be given a long-term visa to attend, say, just for Geneva alone, where meetings are held? Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so we do work with the uh, Swiss mission here for visas. I mean, for your case, you were not uh, yet confirmed as a MAG member. Uh, that's why you probably only got one, and that's what, what the letter stated. But there are several people in this room who are you know, MAG members, and we requested that they have uh, mul multiple entry visas over a longer period of time, and they got it. I mean, this Swiss mission is very good, um, especially since, uh, and, you know, I mean, this is Geneva. A lot of meetings happen here, so they are well versed in how to cater for um, participants coming in. So the next time you apply for a visa, I'm sure it's going to, um, I mean, I can't promise you, but I'm sure it's, go it's, it's, it's going to cover the next MAG meeting and the... Um, uh, the a annual meeting that's going to be here in December. So you are applying for help. Yeah, <laughs> basically, yeah. <laughs> you, said you could, you could um, speak to Changatai offline mm -hmm. for, for help on that. Mamadou, you have the floor. In Senegal, it was quite easy to get visa. Yeah, it's quite easy to get visa just for the meeting, and next I will be apply for the two meetings next. Thank you very much. Again, if there's a specific circumstance, you can take it um, with Changatai um, mm -hmm. offline. Patrick, did you have? You hear me? Uh, good morning, everybody. Patrick. Uh Pardo from the Swiss Mission. Just a very short comment uh, concerning visas. Um, of course, as Chengatai said, uh, the Swiss Mission is also uh, uh, totally implied in, in the organization of the visas. But what members must know is that the most important thing to start with is uh, to get the official invitation 
to this uh, uh, meeting. And then after that, um, you go through the usual visa procedures according to the Swiss embassies or Schengen embassies abroad. But what you don't have to forget is that Switzerland, of course, is part of Schengen system. So uh, there are uh, visa uh, policy um, principles that have to be uh, respected by Switzerland as all other uh, Schengen countries. But um, just make sure that you get your invitation and then contact as uh, well in advance uh, the, uh, the concerned embassy to get the visa. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Okay, so now it's time, I think, to get to the sort of shaping of um, our work for the IGF here. Um, again, I just have a, a couple of introductory remarks. Um, the good news is we're in, uh, we have nine years ahead of us. Um, bad news is we've used up one plus. <laughs> Um, and there was an awful lot of um, enthusiasm for the um, IGF being much more ambitious um, in its um, work in terms of um, helping to ensure impact and getting it out to the local levels. There was a request for a multi-year strategic work program. There was a request for um, significant increase in outreach activities, um, specifically to developing countries and to engage new participants and new partners. And some of this, in fact, was actually called for specifically in the WISLAS Plus 10 um, when the IGF mandate was extended. We have um, a couple, I think really only a couple, of open items um, open from the CSTD Working Group on IGF Improvements. And Peter Major is here. And we had started some preliminary discussions with respect to um, how we kind of continue to move those forward. And, and I think some we have legitimate closure on and that they're done. Some are open and probably are a matter of continual evolution and you could imagine them being open for, um, for some time. That plus um, some of the other um, desires that came out of the retreat. Some of those were operational improvements. Some of them were um, more with respect to um, kind of terms and reference activities. And we want to move all those forward this year. As I said, last year we were compressed in a timetable, and I think we made a lot of progress in some of the operational improvements, but not some of the more strategic. I know the MAG wants to get to those more strategic issues. To do so, we're going to need to move forward a little more efficiently, I think, in some of our uh, more operational and programmatic work. That may mean relying on working groups more. Um, a key piece of that, as I said earlier, I think is the um, working group work on the workshop proposal and evaluation process. Um, I think we can streamline that, save some time, and um, get some additional cycles, if you will, out of the mag to actually move that work forward. That's why I'm so keen on trying to, um, to progress it here. Um, we also um, have heard many times over the last year that we need to ensure that the outputs from our work actually gets to the places where it can have an impact where it's needed most. And I think historically um, in the IGF, whether you were organizing a panel or a workshop or a best practice forum or a dynamic coalition, I actually think our mindset often set to, we need to get through the event, produce a paper, and then we can start thinking about what we're going to do next year. And you know, as I said yesterday, I, I don't think that's nearly enough. Um, I think we need to challenge ourselves to both figure out how we get the work and all the excellent, excellent, excellent work we're doing to the places where it can really be helpful. And I think that um, will require us rethinking some of our own processes internally. It may require um, thinking about how we scope um, some of the proposals we're looking for. You know, one could well imagine um, in some of our activities where we ask people to specifically say, what are the communities, what are the stakeholders, what are the entities, what are the groups that would find this work useful and have a plan for how we actually get it to them. So I'm, I really want to stress that I know the MAG feels as strongly as I do about the need to really get that work where it will, will help. And a lot of the comments we hear about it perhaps not being um, well enough recognized or people think we're only a talk shop is because we're not actually, I think, taking that work, that final step, and then we're not actually um, showing it well enough. So I put that out there so we can come back to that over the, the um, uh, course of the days. I'll also say at the same time, clearly, that we are 
running under the Tunis agenda, <laughs> which gives us our mandate, which also has um, some fairly clear direction with respect to, for the most part, I think, um, expectations on the work and also outlines some things that we won't do. Um, this is not a, 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 a process is going to um, get a signed treaty or a signed document or a regulation or any of those sorts of things. It's about outputs and getting the outputs to the right places where they can actually have have an impact. Um, I think the um, the final comment, maybe maybe there's two. Um, as I said, mentioned, we, we have just the richness of Geneva here in terms of the um, international organizations and the missions, um, the United Nations, um, all the affiliated activities and initiatives are here well. And we need to challenge ourselves a little bit um, with respect to how we actually work with them to help, I think, broaden and, and enrich the IGF program and also, again, really support um, sort of impact on a ground level. Clearly, a lot of our intercessional activities will be um, really helpful in that. Clearly, the national and regional IGF initiatives will be central all the time, of course, respecting their um, autonomy um, and, and independence um, from us. But I think we need to open up more um, kind of channels, bandwidth between our work and those activities as well. And then maybe my final thought before we go into um, the next work is when I look at um, the themes, because that will be one of the first pieces of work we pick up over the last year. And, and actually, if you go to the IGF um, 2017 website, there's a section called Reference Documents, and third or fourth document down, Eleonora um, posted um, the themes in one PowerPoint. I don't know if we can get it up there quickly or not. And then um, the themes and sub-themes for all of the IGFs in another. And actually, when you, when you look at them, going to some of the comments about people either don't understand Internet governance, those that are aware of it think it's not relevant to them. Um, our titles are all pretty descriptive, Internet Governance for Development, Internet Governance for Sustainable Human, and it doesn't say why Internet Governance matters. Um, we, we might want to turn this around um, a little bit, and Thomas shared a good story, which I'll ask him to share again in a moment, about um, a theme that they actually put in place for Eurodig. But I think what I'd like to, um, to say is if we could find a way to, to somehow say why Internet governance matters, why it's important, so that we get them curious about it and not just sort of describing what we're here to do, because the titles are, are fairly specific, which has some benefit, I suppose. But I think it says to an awful lot of people, I don't know why I'd go to that, that conference. I'm not particularly interested in, you know, whatever, access or development. or, And we know that when we talk about... Um, Internet and the impact of the inter Internet governance that it's very, very broad. So maybe, Thomas, I can just ask you to comment on your story. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you. Um, as, as I told uh, uh, you yesterday, I I'm, I'm happen to be also one of those who initiated the, the European uh, IGF that we call European Dialogue on Internet Governance uh, that started in 2008 at the uh, venues of the Council of Europe and has moved uh, through uh, many places uh, in Europe since then. And uh, at some point, in the beginning, we didn't have a, a theme or something. And, and uh, it was actually for Stockholm in 2012 where we had the same feelings that it's difficult to communicate what the purpose of the IGF or of the regional IGF is given the number of other conferences and, and we felt that we need to communicate more directly to the people so that they understand that a dialogue on internet governance matters to them and, and the, the most compelling title and there was an intense debate because it was slightly unusual was um, or, or subtitle or theme or whatever you call it uh, that we had in Stockholm uh, we agreed to, to uh, put who sets the rules on the internet with a question mark as the theme. And we realized that actually people, when, you, when they read that this is about who sets the rule on the internet, which is a, a, a very simple translation of, of uh, uh, actually the working definition of internet governance, if, if you want, uh, that boosted the interest and the understanding uh, of, of Eurodic uh, significantly because everybody has, has some 
experience and some expectations about the rules on the internet or the parts of the internet or the services that they use. And, and we then since then continued with uh, titles that are less descriptive but actually more trying to target people. And, and the latest one, uh, we just had the prep meeting for the Eurodig in Tallinn. That's going to be uh, in Tallinn in Estonia in June 2017. And there was a prep meeting in, in January in Tallinn. And, and uh, if I remember it out of my head, the new theme will be uh, digital transformation promises and pitfalls, um, which is also, a, a, we had a discussion about how far can we go with, with a, a little bit, let's say, journalistic uh, type of, of titles, but we are convinced that we need to uh, yeah, lower the threshold to attract people, to make people understand what this is about. So the, the closer you get to, to the issues or the things that are relevant for the daily lives, the more interest you will get in, in an IGF. Thank you. Again, that was just to sort of, I think, foster a little bit of discussion over the, um, over the lunch break. Um, that's the slide I was talking about just a moment ago, the PowerPoint slide, which is so you can see the, um, I mean, I think they're just, they're short and they're descriptive, which I said has its own benefit, but I, but I don't think they're telling people why they should care about an Internet Governance Forum and why they should come. Um, so we could think about that a little bit as we strike the theme. That would be, that would be excellent. Um, I'll, I'll recognize you in, in one moment, but then I just want um, Rasha to get prepared and to do whatever we need to do um, AV-wise here. This may seem a little bit out of order in terms of going to a fairly kind of tactical discussion on the workshop proposal and evaluation, but as I said several times already, it's essential um, that we get this out by the end of the day tomorrow in terms of making that time frame. Um, we need MAG support and approval for this. When you do that, you need to be thinking about the community as well as um, the MAG itself, and um, that would allow us to go forward and have some subsequent discussions over lunch this evening and possibly tomorrow morning and get some assessment from Luis and the IT folks on, on various implementation aspects. So with your forbearance, we'll go to that in, uh, in a moment. But first, Javan, you have the floor. Thank you very much for giving me the floor and hello to everyone. My name is Jivan. I am an outgoing MAG member um, and uh, currently a diplomat posted here. And um, thank you again for, for, for giving me the floor. I have to come back to the, to the Human Rights Council, and I, but I wanted to kind of uh, just flow into this conversation because I think that uh, it is relevant. And that is, you mentioned that, you know, we are in Geneva where there are a lot of resources and a lot of uh, different ideas that can be perhaps um, uh, explored that haven't been able to explore uh, until now. Um, and one of them is the fact that I think that one stakeholder group that we've kind of um, in, to in the whole internet governance community and the conversations that go around it that has been not um, out, outreach to enough is parliamentarians. And if we're talking about you know, policy options discussions, these policy options, we, we, we see courts taking in a lot of countries uh, a, a role, and that is, I think, because there's an, a vacuum in many countries in the national policies of dealing with new issues that are actually internet governance issues, content issues that are related to internet governance issues. So parliamentarians in many countries don't understand this, and they need to be at least to some degree immersed in these conversations. We have, uh, we're organizing in Macedonia on the 24th and 25th CDIG, the Southeast European Dialogue on Internet Governance, uh, speaking again of national and regional initiatives. And we're thinking of, uh, we're considering of having our parliamentarians invite some of the parliamentarians in Southeastern Europe just to get them immersed, just to, for them to hear what the, the issues are. And given that it is Geneva and the Interparliamentarian Union is in Geneva, uh, there might be possibilities, again, of thinking uh, along these lines, of, of, of having parliamentarians hear, listen, perhaps organizing thematic uh, conversations on this. So just an idea to throw out and uh, back to human rights. I am and uh, good luck and Godspeed. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, in these days, um, the same to you. <laughs> Thank you. So Rasha is going to introduce some work. Last year, um, and, and actually, frankly, most of the years, we've looked for improvements in um, both how we send out the call for proposals, um, which, of course, is very targeted towards the community, and then how we evaluate them on the, um, on the back end. 
Um, so working group has been meeting to suggest um, some changes to that process. Um, it is on the MAG list, which in fact is an open list as well. But all MAG members should have that and there should be a draft calendar attached to that as well. Talking slowly here to stall a little bit of time for AV. Now, apart from what we'll go through in just a, a moment here, of course, is the, the specific changes to the, to the process. Um, maybe one of the things I can point out, um, when you look at the timetables, we added a couple of extra steps. Um, last year, again, because it was so compressed and we wanted to get a responses back to the community quite early and not go through the long summer period in the Northern Hemisphere, we were on a very compressed timetable. And in fact, I think the um, Secretariat had three days to do the analysis and the MAG actually got the analysis of the top ranked workshops the morning the MAG meeting started, which doesn't allow an awful lot of time for a kind of thoughtful um, review or, or any sort of supportive preparation work. So we've put in some additional timetable um, before the workshops are actually sent to um, the MAG for review. That will help talk a little bit about the diversity and the structure. One of the major um, differences is we're proposing that we review the workshops by format so that we're looking at all the sessions that said they were a debate and we're comparing against a debate format because there are different criteria. Um, so we will have criteria that says this is how you actually assess a debate format. This is a criteria for how you assess a, you know, a, a panel format. Um, whereas I think this past year they were pretty much sort of generic um, criteria. Also tried to consolidate them a little bit. But that will actually allow some additional front end processing. And then on the, on the back end, after um, the MAG has actually submitted their reviews, the Secretariat is going to do a, a series of um, analysis to actually identify kind of um, the appropriate sort of um, the, ba the balances or the imbalances. So we'll know what is the, the across a whole bunch of diversity characteristics. What is agenda? What are the proposers first time? What are the regions? What are the stakeholders? Um, all those things, um, the, the uh, Secretary has said they will do that analysis and provide to us. Again, it was done last year, but it was done a little bit on the fly in the background by some staff, some MAG members, and it was, um, you know, not the, uh, the smoothest process. So we're looking to front end that with some additional work in the Secretariat. And then the, the timetable also allows for the MAG to actually have the results of that analysis for a week before the MAG meeting. So we can look at that and then ourselves judge whether or not there are some other workshops we should pull forward um, to help address and, and any imbalances or to get a more appropriate balance. So I'm hoping that we're ready to go here. We're ready to go, Rasha? Rasha's been leading the working group, so thank you. We'll take this up to the top of the hour. All right. Thank you, Lynn, and uh, good morning, everybody, again. Um, we tried to accomplish several things uh, when doing that, keeping in mind the main um, values that the process should have. And the most important thing that we had in mind was that we be able to dedicate more attention to each individual proposal and at the same time try to uh, create a sense of, of fairness and more objectivity uh, in the overall evaluation process so that no matter who the individual is that is uh, evaluating a workshop, there is some consistency across, uh, across the, the scores or the numbers that that a workshop ends up with and um, the thing is that at the end of the day when we're when we're making the cut we have to it's a it's a very small difference so you have to decide whether you're going to stop at like 3.74 or 3.75 and so really every single score uh, matters and 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 that that was basically the main concern that we had in mind we want to try to make the process as fair as possible and as consistent as possible and we want to try every uh, we want to try to give every um, individual workshop uh, the attention that it, that it fully deserves. Uh, the system that was that, that's currently in place until the last IGF, um, we, we don't think managed to do that with uh, in the best way possible. Um, and basically, the reason is every single MAG member uh, ends up reviewing every single uh, session proposal, which is which is a lot. And so, 
if you're, you know, if you're on to session 100 and something, you, you've kind of forgotten what you did with the first one. And it's, it's difficult to maintain consistency across a very large number of, of uh, workshops. It's just not, not humanly possible. <laughs> uh, and so that's, that was basically our, our main concern. Uh, we didn't change the core of the values on which we rate the proposals. But basically what we did was we, we consolidated the criteria, as you're going to say. So previously we had 10 criteria that were li listed as 10 loosely um, uh, phrased questions. Some of them sort of reiterated the same values. And what you were asked to do as a MAG member was to give one final score based on your assessment of the 10 questions. And again, that's that's kind of very difficult because, you know, you, you need to be able to average out, like, where are the areas that are sort of mean the same thing? And, you know, did I give a five on that or a six on that or a, or a four on that or whatever? And, and then try to come up with an average score, which is, again, um, even mathematically in your mind is, is a difficult process uh, to do. Uh, and, and therefore, the scores were... were more subjective than they should be. We do, we do realize that, I mean, we're all human and, and there is an element of subjectivity anyway, but we, we want to try to minimize that as, as much as possible. Um, the other problem that we identified was that some speakers seem to appear on too many sessions. Uh, some uh, some of, of the feedback uh, that was received basically said that if, if you're, particularly if you're interested in a, in a, in a certain area and you're, you're trying to target the, the workshops that speak to that area, and you go from workshop to workshop, and you basically hear the same speakers. And so there isn't much diversity in the voices that are uh, presented, uh, particularly if you're following a, a certain uh, particular topic. Uh, and at, at the same time, some uh, session proposers list, like, uh, important names or big names on, on a workshop, and then these names end up not showing up. Um, and, and that ultimately influences the score that that particular session was given, and we're not really sure whether that speaker had confirmed at a certain point and then didn't show up, or whether they were not confirmed to begin with, and the speaker was hoping that they would agree uh, to, to speak on, on the panel. It, it's not very clear. And so we tried to address these, these issues. Uh, I'll just um, move to the modifications that we're, that we're suggesting to every stage. We looked at the three stages of the review. So basically, for, for the benefit of the new members, the, the proposals go through three stages. In stage number one, the secretariat basically screen out the proposals that do not seem to uh, fulfill the basic criteria of, uh, of the IGF. And then the second, uh, pr the second stage is, is the most uh, uh, cumbersome, I guess, stage, where every MAG member uh, currently reviews every single proposal. And then there's a third stage that happens at a face-to-face -face meeting where we basically go through the results of that uh, scoring and we, we try to determine where the cut is and then we try to see if there are other workshops that didn't make it that we need to push through for some element of diversity or, or some other uh, important element. <clears throat> So basically, we're proposing modifications to every stage of, of the three, um, and I'm going to go through them uh, stage by stage. So for the first stage, we're, we're proposing um, basically two, two changes. The first one is we're, we're going to introduce some kind of an online space, and we're calling that a speaker session collaboration space. And basically what that is is it's kind of a panel-seeking speakers, speaker-seeking panel kind of thing, so that um, if, if somebody had a, a proposal in mind and wanted to uh, advance that workshop but, but doesn't know speakers from different areas around the world or, or needs more diversity in gender or in, in uh, stakeholder uh, diversity or whatever, they can basically identify these people through this blog-type uh, space and so they would basically post their idea and say, you know, is there a government person that can speak on on this topic? Uh, and speakers who are interested in that uh, area would would be uh, invited to contact the proposer. The, the reason why we're introducing this, or why we want to introduce this, is 
basically to try to reduce the merger, which sometimes happens at the end when we see proposals that are basically talking about the same thing that maybe that would benefit from uh, more interaction or that would benefit from more diversity if they're put together. And so we have to do that ourselves. We have to tell them, you know, you guys and you guys will now be together. So we figured if we allowed that space at, at the beginning of the process uh, up front, then these people can basically talk to each other um, you know, uh, outside of, of the MAG, and, and maybe that merger can happen more naturally uh, and at an earlier stage so that the proposals would be uh, better suited. So that's uh, one uh, modification that we're, that we're uh, proposing. Um, and the other modification is that every session should have at least three confirmed speakers. And we are, of course, aware that uh, speakers can sometimes not make it because of visa reasons or because of funding reasons or whatever. Uh, and so we have defined a confirmed speaker as a speaker who has been contacted and expressed interest and intent to participate. So all we're asking is that the session proposers actually contact the speakers before listing them on the program, and that speaker would say, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, I can make it. If they have that initial agreement, then, you know, then they can be listed on, on the program. Um, and, and from then on, uh, we can see what happens. And, and the rule is that basically no speaker can be listed on more than three sessions. Um, or can, can be or can speak in three appearances. I mean, some of them might be um, rejected, I guess. And so, as a guidance to proposers, we're proposing this text uh, to basically go on the guidelines page that we're going to to update. And the text would read something like: There will be an assessment of how many sessions a speaker is listed on, in order to encourage the inclusion of a greater number of speakers at IGF. Any given speaker will only be featured in a maximum of three sessions. If a speaker appears on more than three accepted sessions, they will be asked to choose three and relinquish their speaking roles on any others. It is therefore recommended the session proposers ask their speakers if they are speaking on other sessions and if so, how many at the time they invite the speakers and seek uh, confirmations. So that basically takes care of uh, the first stage. <clears throat> and I will now move on to the second stage. We're proposing quite a number of, um, of modifications to the second stage. The first modification is that every session format would now be um, uh, evaluated separately. And so, and you'll notice that we actually stayed away from the word workshop all through the, the uh, document that you have. Uh, we're trying to, they're all sessions, and so we're, try to, we're trying to differentiate them as a panel session or a, you know, birds of a feather session or a debate session or whatever it is. Uh, and so we've listed the website where the types of formats are available. And basically, we're going to uh, propose guidelines for each of the formats uh, listed. And the guidelines are not going to be very diff different, but, you know, I mean, for, for a debate, obviously, we need to say something like, you know, there are at least two, there are two sides, and so people have to be on uh, opposing sides of the, of the argument, Hi, things, are, things of the sort. I mean, we, we basically list what the format is about. Uh, and we, um, we, we tell people what we expect um, that, that would accommodate that, uh, that format. And then basically the other major change that we did was that we focused the 10 questions that were um, kind of loosely phrased before, we focused them into four main criteria. So we have a criteria on relevance, <clears throat> which basically includes is the proposal relevant to internet governance and to the IGF main theme for that year. In other words, basically, why is, why is this session important? What is the importance of, of the session that you're proposing? Uh, and that should be made clear in the proposal um, that people submit. The second category has to do with content. So is the proposal well thought out and does it cover enough aspects of the issue or issues of interest? Is the main internet governance issue clearly spelled out? Um, and we um, decided that the background papers, although illuminating, are basically, I mean, people don't really spend much time on writing them, and sometimes for a good reason. Sometimes they're expert speakers, but they don't really have time to sit down and write a paper. And so we've decided to move to, to make that a recommendation, like it's, it's great if you have a working paper, but it's not a requirement uh, for your, your workshop to make it through. And again, the main reason is because some of the particularly more 
um, expert speakers might not have the time to actually sit down and write a paper, but they would still add a lot to the discussion if they were there to talk about it. The third category has to do with speaker diversity, and that basically includes all aspects of diversity. So is the list of speakers diverse enough in terms of gender, geography, stakeholder group, policy perspective? Does it have a person with a disability? Are the speakers qualified to tackle uh, the topic? Are there speakers from developing countries? Are there speakers or uh, session proposers that are first timers to the IGF, which is obviously something that we uh, welcome and encourage? And uh, the fourth category is the format of the session. So basically, is the session description consistent with the format listed? So for example, if the format is debate, then does the proposal describe how the debate will be set up? Does it uh, pr describe who will be on which side of the issue? Does it describe how the timing of uh, or the timetable will go on, on that debate? Uh, things of the sort. So basically, as you can see, we've, we've sort of consolidated the categories so that the questions are not um, redundant. The question that you have in mind when, when you're evaluating the workshop, it, it sort of helps you uh, go through the evaluation process more, more consistently. That's, that's the aim of that uh, change. Uh, with that, we are basically proposing that each reviewer <clears throat> will give a score from one to five, five being the best possible on each criteria. So you no longer will give one score to the whole proposal based on the 10 questions that you have in mind. Um, and sometimes maybe in the process you can forget one or, or not exactly count how many were, were good or how many were bad. Uh, in this case, you will just go through each criteria. There are four criteria, and you will put a number next to each criteria. And the system will automatically calculate an average for you off of the four answers that you have, uh, that you have listed. And it's important to point out that this is really this, I mean, this is more or less the same thing that you were doing before because you had to sort of consider these issues and you had to judge them separately and then come up with one number. But hopefully we've now made it easier because you will not have to keep that number in mind while going on to the moving category. You will just put that number down on, on the Excel sheet. So at the end of the day, the number is right there in front of you. And obviously you can change it if you want to go back and, and change something in your evaluation. Um, before, before you submit your final recommendation for that session. But it's, uh, it's, a, more, um, it's a more consistent way because, because you will be sort of, uh, you, will, you will be guided as a reminder of what the, the main questions are on every session with, with the categories right in front of you. <clears throat> Uh, and then again, of course, in order to provide feedback to the proposers uh, in case their proposals have been declined, because we want to encourage them to um, apply again the following year and make that a better proposal. So you will be asked to give uh, brief feedback to the proposers if uh, your overall score is below three. So for example, if, if the format was really bad, you need to tell them what was missing or what was lacking so that they can make it better uh, the next time around. <clears throat> now, each proposal will be randomly routed to 12 MAG members, three members of each stakeholder group. So instead of each proposal being basically judged by or evaluated by um, uh, all 55 MAG members or so, we will now route each proposal to uh, 12 MAG members. If an evaluator cannot do the evaluation for any reason, such as maybe a possible conflict of interest or uh, lack of experience in that topic or something of the sort, you can indicate that on the system. You will be given uh, a different uh, workshop, and that workshop, will, uh, and that workshop will be routed to another uh, member of the MAG. Uh, given that the MAG gets around 250 proposals and that each proposal will need, about, will need 12 evaluations, so that's basically a total of about 3,000 uh, evaluations uh, divided by the number of MAG members, which is 55. That basically uh, means that you will get about 55 proposals. However, given that members of the different stakeholder groups are not equal within the MAG, so you might end up with slightly more or slightly less than that, um, but hopefully no more than 60 proposals uh, per MAG member. 
Uh, if you are worried about viewing the complete list of proposals, because uh, the point was correctly made that uh, that basically gives you a, a, a better overview if you, can, if you can see like what the whole spectrum of topics that were proposed to the MAG uh, is before you can uh, evaluate a certain proposal, uh, you will still have access to the full workshop list. So that's, that's not a concern. You can still have access to the full workshop list. You can still go through all the proposals if you wanted to, but you will only be asked to evaluate uh, the ones that are routed to you. So basically, the other workshops, you can, you can see them in a view-only format kind of thing, but, um, but you cannot evaluate them. Um, we, we are obviously trying this for the first time here, so uh, we will, I mean, this is an ongoing uh, enhancement process, so we will uh, revisit that process again the following year. We will get feedback uh, from the MAG members and obviously from the community, uh, and we'll, we'll see where further improvements can be made uh, to the system, we'll try to refine that for uh, the 2008 um, uh, IGF. Uh, and then uh, after that, you sort of have um, a, a basic definition of what the scores mean from one to five. So basically we're expecting that a five means an excellent proposal, four is a good proposal overall, although it could be enhanced, three is an average proposal, two is a weak proposal, and one it simply just does not meet criteria. The third stage of the process should now be made um, simpler uh, because we've hopefully taken care of the bulk of the evaluation decisions in stages one and two. Uh, so basically, in an effort to minimize redundancy in the program and to minimize the, the measures that the, the MAG sort of um, uh, did at the end, uh, we are now going with that speaker session collaboration uh, space. And the aim of this new space, as I said, is to provide the proposers with the opportunity to find speakers to collaborate on similar topics uh, with the aim of basically reducing the occurrence of mergers that used to take place during uh, stage three. Uh, and that's pretty much based on the community feedback. Uh, so the mergers at that stage should take place by exception only if there's something that, we, that sort of jumps at, at you know, uh, MAG members um, that really needs to, 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 to merge, if there are two sessions that really need to merge. Um, there will be an assessment F, uh, at, at stage three by the MAG for the overall balance of the program. So we do um, uh, recognize that some adjustments may still need to occur, but we're hoping that these will be minimal at this point. Uh, just to serve uh, basically diversity again. If there is a topic that, that was not featured, that if there's like only one proposal about a certain topic that is important, but that lacked proper formatting or something, then we can maybe push that up uh, if, we, if we deem uh, necessary. So basically we're, um, we're arguing that the proposed system has uh, several advantages. Uh, basically, again, the criteria are not different from what we used to do anyway, but they're just clustered and grouped differently. Uh, and that basically gives you more focus when you're doing the evaluation. So that means that session proposals uh, will not be affected because we're not introducing anything new, really. We're just, we're just um, focusing the process by which we're making the evaluations. Um, you are currently assigned, you know, over 250 proposals. And as I said, you know, some kind of an evaluator fatigue is bound to happen at least during the second half of, of these decisions. And so basically we're trying to avoid that. We're trying to make things more consistent and we're trying to make the time that you are able to dedicate to every individual proposal, uh, maybe more, more focus, more attention and, and more uh, dedication given to each individual uh, focus. And so now you're required to give um, four, four scores, basically, that will determine an average for that particular proposal, rather than sort of keeping a score in your mind and trying to add up what that uh, comes up to. Uh, under the proposed system, uh, the average score obviously could, could also be a fraction, so you don't have to, uh, to, to come up with a three or four, it could be a 3.5. Uh, I suppose that um, that's a better thing because, I mean, you, you won't have to arrive at that uh, decision, again, based on the overall picture, but, but the system will automatically calculate it for you based on what you give each of the four criteria. Uh, feedback will be given to session proposers, uh, including their scores, and so they will be able to know 
the particular strengths and weaknesses of the panel. So even if the proposal has actually made it, uh, they can they can still know like which criteria was or which criterion uh, was was not as good as the others, and so they can maybe work on that for the following year. So it's it's better. Um, it, it gives them a better um, idea of what was good or what was lacking about that particular proposal. Uh, you are, each proposal will still be judged by a sufficient number of representatives from all stakeholder groups, so you don't need to worry about a particular stakeholder group taking over a particular proposal because we're ensuring diversity in uh, the evaluators of, that, of every single proposal, basically. Uh, and at the same time now, hopefully no single entity or no single individual can be featured on too many sessions because of the uh, speakers basically um, maximized at, at three sessions uh, per speaker. So that will hopefully open up some space for new voices to come into uh, the IGF community, uh, which is something we're always trying to, to um, encourage, uh, of course. Uh, and then again, and no proposal can list speakers without some kind of a basic confirmation that that speaker is actually uh, coming or at least intends to come. Uh, and so um, hopefully that will also minimize the number of speakers that actually appear on the program and then you walk into the workshop and that speaker is not there. Uh, and finally, the last uh, bit of the session which I emailed this morning includes a, a timetable for the process. So um, it is now... Uh, proposed that the open call would go out on March 15th and would uh, stay open for seven weeks until the 3rd of May. And then that will uh, give the Secretariat uh, five days to organize and send the proposals to the MAC for evaluation together with some statistics on the distribution of uh, how the proposals are going. And then the uh, evaluation process will take place May 9th to the 29th, so that give, uh, gives basically MAG members uh, three weeks to do their evaluation. The Secretariat will then analyze uh, the workshop evaluation results or the session evaluation results uh, in another week, and that takes us to uh, uh, about June 5th. Uh, and then the MAG members will review uh, with particular attention to regional and stakeholder balance. That also takes one week before an actual face-to-face -face meeting where stage three of the evaluation can take place, uh, and that is proposed to take place on June 14th to the 16th. I will stop here, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. I see Slotovan and then Liesl, and then Raquel. We'll start a list. So, Slobodan, you have the phone. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like first to congratulate Russia for taking the lead on this important issue and uh, to congratulate all members of the <coughs> working group that helped draft this proposal. Overall, I, I supported the proposed changes, um, and I think it's be the, the best points include the, 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 the guidelines and the grading criteria will be developed uh, for each format uh, independently, uh, which will lead to bigger focus on individual proposals, and that we will grade each proposal by uh, per criteria, not the overall proposal, and that uh, each proposal will be randomly routed to 12 MAG members, three from each stakeholder group. So I think that these changes are really good. Um, the only concrete improvement uh, I would add is in the grading criteria, uh, probably in po point five on session format, to include a reference to ensure meaningful online and in situ participation, uh, by which I specifically mean in evaluating a plan for uh, online participation and in situ interaction, meaning you know not just uh, ensuring online participation by posting tweets or um, uh, moving questions to the end of the session and that kind of things. Um, I also have three concerns, uh, meaning three questions, uh, or maybe two questions and, 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 one, uh, and uh, one concern. Um, the concern is that, uh, um, uh, that uh, we would not be able to, 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 to get uh, uh, a reliable feedback on uh, uh, speakers, session speakers, and their confirmation 
so early in the process. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible, just that you know, so early in the process we won't be able to, to get uh, reliable feedback. Um, the second thing is that uh, uh, I, I didn't see anything about the possibility for, for proposing mergers in the evaluation phase. So uh, this, this, I, I didn't see this in the proposal. In, in which phase? In the evaluation phase. Which, fa which part of the evaluation phase? The, the last part? Well, you know, it, um, well, I don't know. I, I, I don't have the document in front of me, but this is uh, uh, you know, at this point when we are grading the proposals, we have the space for entering the proposed mergers in the you know s software interface. So, so would it be would it, would this uh, feature uh, uh, stay, or or we should move uh, uh, mergers into some other phase? And. Uh, and, and, and b maybe the biggest uh, concern that I have is related to this uh, proposed speaker session collaboration space and other software functionality that uh, follows from the proposed process changes. Um, this probably requires some modifications that need to be provided by the Secretariat. And basically they need to be provided uh, uh, by May. So, so the question is whether that is feasible to have the software that basically follows uh, from this, uh, from the, the proposed changes. Thank you. Um, if it's a short and direct answer to take the kind of question off the table, then you can. Um, otherwise, um, yes, we'll keep going through the queue. So, as okay. you like that. Um, Yes, the online participation is a good point. We will take that into consideration. Um, the reliable feedback on speaker confirmation, um, I mean, all, all we're asking is that people don't list speaker names without even contacting them. So, I mean, we need some kind of an, of an intention on part of that person that, yes, this sounds interesting, I plan to come. We do understand that, you know, there are visa issues, there are funding issues. Uh, you know, we're obviously not going to kill somebody if they don't show up. Uh, uh, but, but we need some kind of a, of, a, of a, I mean, sometimes you have also proposals that have no speaker names, you know, and, and I, you really don't know what to, how to grade that proposal because you don't know who's going to be speaking. I mean, you have no idea if the speakers are well informed about the issues or not. So it's kind of difficult to make that, uh, to make that uh, evaluation. Uh, so all we're asking is just some kind of a preliminary indication that these speakers have been contacted and they have agreed or showed intention to come. Uh, the merger uh, in the software interface, we're still dealing with the software interface, but I'm sure there is a way for us to, to do that. And um, I believe as far as uh, the tech uh, is concerned, the Secretariat has very kindly said that, they, that the changes needed can be modified uh, within the time uh, that we're asking for. Liesl, you have the floor. Thank you, and thanks, Rasha, for going through that so um, thoroughly. I think that there may be um, more questions, I'm sure, and I think some of um, the things that we went through on um, late night Tuesday evening um, may or may not have been sort of communicated in, in either the proposal or the chat this morning, so uh, feel free to ask questions or make points. Um, one thing I wanted to note um, that we didn't address yet is that one of the things that was most frustrating to me in evaluating the workshops last year wasn't, I mean, wasn't that there were 250, although the, there was a certain amount of fatigue that, in, that was involved in that, um, but more that the, that the frustration I had with making a ranking was that it was difficult to do based on the form that the proposers had in order to make their proposal. And so what we were, what we were um, assessing on wasn't reflect, you know, wasn't requested in the, the proposal form. And so it was hard to make a, uh, um, a score based on that. So one of the things that um, I've mentioned before and, 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 and followed on in the conversation 
and the working group is that we have to make sure that the proposal form uh, matches the criteria that upon which we'll be <laughs> um, assessing on the back end. Um, so things like, just as a silly example, but we were supposed to base, you know, provide a score based on gender diversity, yet in the proposal form there was no indication of what the gender of the um, uh, the gender of the speaker was, or even the geography. In some cases, seasoned proposers knew that they had to put that in, but for new proposers, that wasn't clear. So, and it wasn't clear in the and uh, that they had to do that, and it wasn't clear, and, and it made it very difficult to, to judge. So, part of the immediate process once we. Um, agree to this or some amended version of it um, is to make sure the proposal form looks <laughs> um, is the right one. Um, just the last point is that I think that um, the uh, one experience we had was you know in the room. Um, deliberations on many proposals and many parts of the process that what this proposal attempts to do is put some more front end rigor and back end balancing into the process that we really didn't have so much time to do last year. So if that wasn't clear, I think that um, that, that is something that we are, I think Rasha um, touched on some things that try to get to that. Um, so hopefully that helps as well. Yes, duly noted. Thank you for the clarifications. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Raquel, you have the floor. Thank you. First, thank you, Rasha, for the work. Uh, I really read your proposal, and uh, it seems solid. It seems thoughtful, and it's uh, one of the things of being the new MAG members. And uh, I've been hearing is the evaluation process is very high, uh, have loaded. So it's good to see there is a process to to make it easier or at least more smooth. Um, so. Reading it this morning, I had three points. Listening to you, I had three more. I would try to be quick on them. And I'm sorry, it seems there is the working group. You probably uh, might have discussed some of those, but anyway, I will jump in. Uh, the first one that I, I, I had um, in mind is on the second phase, the, um, the owners of the process is are the individual MAG members, right? Uh, but it, you might need to have a role of someone having this big picture. And I don't want to assume there is, um, it's either the secretary or the chair or someone appointed by the MAG, but this role of, you know, the whipper uh, seems to be important, who has the big picture and, and will be chairing the, 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 the work. Um, the second one refers also to the second stage um, where you are actually rerouting and, 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 and giving the work to the MAG members. Um, if there is any plan B, I mean, things happen, uh, either personal, professional, health issues, whatever, and the reviewer cannot perform um, what it was supposed to be. And so you have two implications on that. First, the time, um, perhaps create an alert like a week before the deadline. Um, if you are not able to do it, then we need to reroute these 55, 60 papers or proposals uh, to, to be done. Um, and, and yes, and then the operational thing, which is rerouting them to, to the MAG members. Um, and so, uh, and the third one actually is low and started. It's about remote participation. The fact that this is not a criteria anymore doesn't mean, at least for me, uh, in my opinion, it's not, it doesn't mean it doesn't have the equal importance on the, the commitments for the workshop organizers. It could be either a flag um, in the first screening or, you know, uh, at the second stage, I didn't go further on that, but, um, uh, or in the reporting or some uh, space to, to create this, uh, to highlight and emphasize this. The fourth one is uh, regarding uh, the, the workshop, and then this is also perhaps a flag on the pre-screening uh, or the screening phase. Um, not only you have workshop proposals that have the same topic, 
but um, I seen the same topic over and over the IGFs. And so, um, and it's natural sometimes. There are, there are things you are not solving through one year to the other. So you have recurrent topics that are, are going to happen. Um, this would not be a cutting criteria in my mind, but uh, could be a flag so we could look uh, better on the evaluation. Um, you know, is this bringing a new perspective or not? Is the same thing or not? Anyway, uh, the fifth one uh, regards um, the discrepancies on, on the, the ratings. So the average solves pretty objectively the, the, the evaluation process. Uh, this is about the second phase, by the way. Uh, but then you mentioned the, the, the ones who are rated high or low for the same proposal, right? This would be an outlier and perhaps might need some discussion or perhaps have a, a phase there where you say, does this worth a discussion or not? Um, something to, to think about. And the sixth and last, this will be the last, it's also about the second phase where you, you speak, uh, where you, you mentioned the speaker's diversity to also include the youth. I know you, you, you talked about the first um, timers, but I think uh, even the youth who are attending for the second time uh, might deserve uh, a rating diversity there. That's it, thank you. Uh, thank you for these points. Yeah, just to clarify, we will uh, include the online participation uh, as a, uh, I mean, somewhere in the in the criteria. We will we will include the mention of that. Um, as for someone chairing the work, I mean, we have the MAC chair, obviously, but I guess the spirit within the IGF is is for more uh, equality among members. So so, uh, but but during phase three, that kind of irons itself out. So. Um, Hopefully that will work out uh, fine. Uh, if the reviewer cannot perform, they're basically asked to uh, indicate on the system that they cannot perform. But we're, I mean, we're hoping that now since the process is more focused, that every single MAG member will be able to perform at least on some workshops. I mean, we're, we're hoping that no MAG member will say, I'm not evaluating any workshops. But maybe if a particular workshop you feel awkward evaluating because you, know, you worked with that person before or you don't know much about this topic or something of the sort, you can, you can indicate that. Uh, and it might actually be a good idea to, uh, to include in, in, the, um, in the system uh, a spot for why the, why the MAG member is rerouting that? That might be a good. Uh, that might be a good uh, idea uh, that we talk about. That we talk about. Um, in terms of topic repetition, yes, we can add uh, to the phrasing something on bringing a new perspective. I suppose that would be under relevance, under the importance of the topic. Uh, that's another good point. Uh, as far as the outliers, we actually also, I mean, we calculate the average and the standard deviations. So, so we do take care of that. If something, if something stands out, we'll, uh, th that will be taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel and, and um, Rasha. Uh, we have five minutes, and we need to end this session promptly at the top of the hour because there is a, the room is actually going to be used for another um, meeting um, with European NRIs, so we will both need to finish and vacate the room unless you want to be a part of that discussion. I actually have quite a long queue. When um, we first put the queue up, there were, uh, I don't know, four or five people here in the room that put their flags up immediately. Um, that would be Renata and Juan, who were still in the queue, and then it was followed quickly afterwards by um, Ginger, Avery, Shita in the, um, in the, in the um, online, and then we had um, Laura and Miguel and UK and Miguel, and now we have Zena and Arnold, um, which we need to put Zena and Arnold on the list. Um, you know, some of these I think could possibly be taken to the MAG mailing list um, and maybe resolved there quite quickly. Another thing we could do is to see whether or not people wanted to come back into this room or meet somewhere informally over lunch and see if we can kill some of the, the questions. Um, we need to find a way, I think, to address some of this um, offline but with full visibility of the mag. And I'm not quite sure how to do that because I don't want to spend the afternoon on the proposal. Um, is there any support? And I, and I recognize for those that are online that should we choose to meet in the hallway here, that doesn't enable you to participate. 
I don't know how long the room was booked. Was it just from one to two? Sandra? Um, I didn't book the room at all. It's just an informal gathering. So I assume if you need more time and people just stay in the room and come as they, as they are after the session. So full flexibility from our side. Yeah, no, and I don't, want, I don't want to take away from the, you had asked for this time slot, it was advertised, people are counting on it, and our eyes are, are coming in online as well, so I think you should take it. It was just, if you were planning to use the full two hours, it's yours. If you were only planning to use an hour and go for lunch, we could swap out and do the reverse. Um, we are planning for an hour, go to lunch at 2 o'clock, and one uh, remark, it's not for NRIs, it's for all European stakeholders, so uh -huh. for the European community. Thank you. No, th thank you for correcting me. Um, well, let's do that then. Um, some of you who want to be in both those sessions, I mean, we'll bring you back a sandwich if you'd like. Um, but if we can plan on 2 o'clock to be um, back in this room, that allows us to have access to the online participants, and we'll just pick up the queue as well. Hmm? And we, won't, we understand we won't have um, interpretation in French at that um, at that point, but I, I do think this is sort of like a, a large working group set of work and we can perhaps proceed without it. Juan? Two to three, and I would like to make my point. I don't know if make it now or wait or after three because I... I had Renata in the queue and then you, and maybe Renata would be n nice enough to let you go first and reverse it. We'll get you in for lunch and we'll close on that. I give you two minutes. Yes, it's very short what I want to say. First, to uh, congratulate Russia for formalizing the whole process. But I want to stress one thing that I said last year and I think the year before as well. Any numerical uh, quantitative method, it's only an aid for, for the MAG to, to put in, in, in some order the, the proposals, Be, but because the final decision has to t take into consideration other topics like the balance of, of, the, of the themes in regard with the uh, adopted theme of the year of the IGF, also the balance from the stakeholders that uh, carry out the the sessions, not to speak of, of workshop, as, as he said. And, and that is a thing that has to be done in the face-to-face -face discussion of the MAG in the June meeting. So I think that the June meeting has to be prepared very thoroughly, even beforehand, maybe with some virtual meetings before, in order to make that meeting more... Um, uh, really it, to do its task. Uh, I think that we should not be constrained that the numbers, the rankings, are not a straight jacket. I think that the MAG should have... The, this is a political decision, you know. That's why the MAG has been selected by the Secretary General with diversity of countries and stakeholders and that. So I think that in this discussion we should be able to maybe some excellent uh, um, that has excellent, but maybe it doesn't fit for whatever other reason, or we have to move somebody all up, maybe to propose some mergers. What, what I say is that the final decision should be the meeting, face-to-face -face meeting of, of, of June, and we should not be under the straight jacket of the, of the ranking that, that comes from the second. That's only an aid, it's a tool. La, la, like, like graded in, 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 in exams, you, you have many, many things, but, but you have then a political thing. Wholeheartedly and emphatically agree. And in, in fact, um, that is what the timetable actually assumes. Yes. It also actually allowed um, almost twice as much time for the secretary to do their analysis um, and prepare information to aid the MAG in the review. And then really exceptionally, it gives the MAG a week to look at the imbalances, to look at the standard deviations, to look at whatever we want to look at. And I would actually like um, in that um, for the MAG working group, it may be a different working group than the one that worked on the proposal, to actually drive that week's worth of analysis so that we come in with a soft proposal to the MAG meeting. 
and that would actually allow us to use some of our MAG meeting time to do some of the more strategic work that we're also um, desperate to, um, to get to. So I, I, th I think we actually accommodated in about three different ways. It's a very, very important point. Thank you. So we'll break now. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, before, before we break, I just, I just want to reiterate that this was not really an individual effort, and I really, again, want to thank every single member of the working group for the input that they uh, have provided. It's been uh, a great job, I think, and I particularly want to thank the brave souls who stayed past midnight on Tuesday night, uh, some having flown in from uh, different parts of the world. Um, so uh, I'm very grateful for, for the help that, uh, that was uh, provided and for the effort that was put onto this. Thank you to all. And, and thank you for your leadership, too. Um, so again, from 2 to 3, this room is actually um, um, going to be used for another meeting. So if you're not part of that meeting, um, you probably want to leave so as not to interfere. We'll come back. If we could come back pretty promptly right at 2. Um, and we'll just pick up where we left here um, with the queue. If you can't be back here at 2 and you're in the queue, we will get to you um, afterwards or maybe just shortly before 3 if you're rejoining us. Failing that, please send your comment or question to the MAG list, and we'll make sure that it's actually um, read and addressed there. Thank you. Good lunch. See you back at 3.
So for those of you that were interested in continuing with the workshop discussion, um, we'll continue now. I know it's not a full fledged forum, but I think anything that we do have we'll, will get reflected back. Arnold, I don't want you to miss getting a sandwich or something. We can be very conscientious to make sure we update you on anything that was discussed when, when, uh, when you step out. Um, let me just... Renata was the next in the queue because you kindly ceded to Juan. You have to use your mic, though. Um, so do you, did you still want the floor? Um, I had conceded. I had sent in uh, the point via chat. But just for the sake of record, I, um, I think it's important that we're moving forward on, um, on a new evaluation so, model. Sorry to interrupt you, but I don't think we have a record right now, right? Is that correct? No. That's right. Oh, good. Yeah. I mean, if there's something you want to put it's, on the record, maybe you should wait till 3 p.m. This is not being transcribed at the moment. Yeah. No, no, it's all right. I already put it in the chat then. Uh, so I'll just comment that uh, I, I support this moving forward. And uh, what I think would be really um, uh, interesting for folks to see is um, probably go through the document uh, step by step again. On, on the on the on kind of like a quick review the next time we have uh, another discussion because I don't think some people have really got all the points of the document yet so just that quick comment no I think that's very true um, what we're actually planning to do is to continue as much of this discussion as we can on before three um, the document will be updated sometime before the end of the night tonight. I'm, I'm not sure if we'll need to come back in an open forum for this session. We need to get through it enough so that we can get a rev of the document back out to take a look at it tomorrow to, um, to move forward. So that's the only piece I'm un, uncertain about. But let's keep going on and trying to um, just understand some of the other questions people had to see if we can um, address them. And a lot of the ones that were in a chat room were more about I think just understanding more what it was proposing as opposed to um, significant uh, disagreements. I don't know, do we have anybody online? I was coming next to Ginger Avery Sheeta, but I'm not sure they're still online. I'm here. Sorry. So. <laughs> Ginger said a written comment, Rasha has it. Uh, I have a note from Shita that I will pass to Rasha now, maybe she can, or I can read it, whatever. And Avri said that she will not be available. No, I'm online time. now. I oh, am sorry, online. sorry, Avri, I don't see you in my Webex. Then Avri is online, so. Then Avri, could we take your um, comment or question now, and then Anya, either Anya or Rasha, if you could um, both read out um, Ginger's and Shita's, we should have should um, have them kind of publicly taken into account here. Avri, you have the floor? Sure, thanks. This is Avri speaking. Okay, I had a couple points on this, and, and I some sort of not completely comfortable with what you've all done, but of course I'll live with it uh, if that's what we're doing. I think, first of all, the whole thing on panelists and requiring panelists in our judgment of of workshops or whatever we want to call them is is problematic in that people don't know at at this point whether they're going to be there and, and such and and they, and they don't know and i'm actually wondering while the makeup of of panelists or whatever is important and they have certain rules to meet does not necessarily say anything about the quality of the workshop. And sometimes I think we, we cover up a weaker workshop by saying, and we've got some really great people coming. So, you know, trust us. So I, I think there's a little bit of, of a problem in, in that. Um, uh, one of the things that we had used, I think it was two years ago, I don't know that we did it last year, 
was the whole notion of uh, the, um, the, the deviance, the deviation in ratings as an important indicator of something that needed a more careful look. That if we had, and this was in the third stage, if we had a, a things that seemed to have a bunch of people that thought it was a four and five and a bunch of people that thought it was a one and two, well, then there's something interesting there that, that needs to be analyzed and that that whole notion of uh, how do we adjudicate that. Now, the deviation will probably be less now because a smaller subset of people will have uh, graded things, and and I think that that will also be possibly a problem because what will happen is people's notions. There is no absolute notion of satisfactory or good or or not meeting criteria. That's always going to be subjective, and so the subjectivity will be applied to a smaller subset, which means that people will naturally curve to the subset they've got. So if you've got a bunch of all supremely good, but when you're trying to draw out a one to five gradation, you will tend to say, well, I can't give them all fives, so I better back some down. And, and people by and large create a natural curving when they're doing it, even though we're not doing a curving, as it were. So, so that's one. I have a problem with the, you have to write an explanation if you give lower than a three, because that means that there's a real strong incentive to not give lower than a three. If I've got to write something bad about somebody's workshop, something critical, and I'm sort of on the edge, well, you know, the, the, there's, there's a tendency to sort of want to avoid doing the negative work and and also there, there's an issue of well if you think something's a five that seems to be something that really merits a write-up because you're saying this is superb and and why do you think it's superb so i think that's an issue i think there's an issue in the complexity of the process we've got to remember that in doing this we have to then explain to the the wider community what we did was good, and that depends on explaining it based on our method. So the complexity there is something we'll have to take into account in terms of, you know, our explanations, because it will be harder for people to understand why mine got in, but that one didn't, and vice versa. And then finally, one issue that I've got that's sort of a more general issue is we're kind of still working in the mode of what we're here to do is as a program committee for the program at the end of the year, and we're front loading that process really without consideration of how it fits into all the other work that we've now, I think, been empowered to do with the intercessional, with the BPFs, with the DCs, and the ongoing work nature of this. And so I'm just wondering about the balance that we're giving these workshops, which are kind of, in, in, in some sense, the other thing we do at the forum uh, and, and, and such. So I'm a little concerned that we're immediately on our first morning falling into a a pattern of doing the same thing that we've done in the past, even though we're doing it slightly differently. Thanks. Thank you, Aubrey. I'm just going to respond quickly to your last point, and then I'll, I'll, um, Rasha can respond to the earlier ones. Um, I actually agree with you, um, and I think we're trying to carve out time, um, you know, throughout the MAG processes for some of this more strategic work. Um, the only reason we had to front end this process right now with this particular process is that we do need to get um, a call for proposals out soon. Um, if we were to wait and do that significantly later, we start to hit a really heavy period, and that means we actually have the, the kind of submissions either sitting fallow for a few months before we can actually manage to get through the reviews and get the face-to-face, -face. and then that means we're squeezing the 
um, session proposers towards the end of the year. So it's not meant to um, shortchange any of those other processes and certainly not the intersessional work either. And I'm actually hoping we get to that uh, discussion really quite, quite soon. Um, but what I'd like to do is to get through kind of this review of this proposal, get another draft out tonight, and see if we can close on it tomorrow. Um, you know, we will close tomorrow on whatever we feel comfortable closing on. Um, I think there's, you know, lots of pieces of goodness in here, and if there's some things that people really feel is just too fast or uncomfortable with, then we can revisit that. But, I mean, I'm not sure that's the sense I'm getting from the room um, yet, but that will be a call we make tomorrow. I think right now we just need to continue reviewing it, make sure everybody understands it, and dealing with any kind of questions or comments they have. Um, I hope that's enough of a quick answer for the second part of the discussion. And Rasha, do you want to comment on any of um, Avi's earlier points? Sure. Thank you, Avi, for your comments. Um, I'll just go uh, briefly over a few things. I think one of the things that we tried to do with this proposal was to, um, <clears throat> as I said, focus the criteria that we're, that we're evaluating on. And one of the very important criteria, of course, is content, but then we think the speakers are equally important because, yes, you could list a lot of, of uh, high-profile speakers and then the content of the session would be uh, not very good, but then the opposite is also true because you can list a, a, a workshop with a great title and a great description, and if you get, later get speakers that know nothing about the topic, then you've basically lost the session. So I think both are equally important. I don't think you can just... Um, propose a workshop without giving us any idea of who's going to speak on the topic. And again, I mean, all we're asking is that people just get an initial indication from the speaker that they intend to be there. Uh, we do understand that people, you know, might not get funding or whatever, but, you know, um, I mean, we understand that things will happen, but, but does the speaker intend to be at IGF if, if everything falls into space? Uh, that's, that's, uh, <clears throat> falls into place. That's what we... Uh, are basically after. Um, the feedback on, on uh, whatever is lower than three, yes, you're, you're right. People might be uh, inclined to not give a score of three or lower if they are uh, required to give feedback on that. Um, but then that's really part of our duty as, as MAG members. I mean, we're supposed to try to help the community come up with better proposals. And in order to do that, we need to kind of let them know what, uh, what was wrong with the proposal. I would, I would actually encourage uh, that if people also give fives, that they, that they sort of mention what was the great thing about this proposal. I mean, that's, that's also an educational uh, aspect. So if people wanted to do that, by all means, please do. Um, although I, I would... Um, I would think it's important that if the score is low, that we, that we tell people. I think it's more important to tell them why the workshop was, was weak than it is to tell them why it was strong. Because if, the, if it's strong, then, you know, they're doing something right and great, keep on doing it. If, if they're doing something wrong, we need to identify what they're doing wrong and tell them about it so that the next year around they, they might be able to do uh, a better job, uh, which I guess we all want uh, to see. The standard deviations will still be there, and I'm, I'm not sure um, that, that the standard deviation by definition would be lower if it's a, if it's a smaller group. Actually, uh, the opposite might be true. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't necessarily have, have to work out that way. <clears throat> so, um, and, and as I said, I mean, at the end of the day, after all the submissions are in, or, and even throughout the process, you will, you will have a chance to, to take a look at the overall picture. You will, at the end of the process, have a chance to look at all the scores. And if there's something that has a high enough uh, standard deviation, we certainly can take a look at it uh, during, the, during stage three and, and uh, get back to it if, if uh, we decide that that's needed. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rasha. Um, next, we have Ginger. Is there somebody who can read out her comment? So I will read a, a note from Ginger that was posted also on the MAG mailing list. I echo the appreci appreciation for the working group and Rasha's work and proposal. The points on remote participation from Slobodan, Raquel, and Rasha are much appreciated and very important. 
We need to work on the incorporation of remote participation processes in the sessions and meetings, especially on non-tech strategies. We should clearly address this in instructions to session organizers and proposers. I would be happy to be involved in writing this paragraph of instructions. Could Rasha or Lynn please specify a timeline for discussion and approval of the proposal so we can address indispensably points of strategy here and now and leave details for the MAG list in particular? Will we have a comment period for MAG members on the session selection proposal? Will we have a comment period for non-MAG members on the session selection proposal, especially feedback from previous session proposers, so we can make sure to address their concerns as well as our own as MAG members and evaluators? Or has it already thoroughly been done? Will there be a time period or mechanism for input by session organizers on their workshops to be included in the MAG meeting discussion of proposals? After a preliminary scoring, perhaps this numeric feedback and comments could be sent to organizers for their comments and input about concerns noted by the evaluators. I think this would help address Juan's concern and help those organizers who don't have a vocal MAG member supporting their workshop in the discussion to defend their proposals. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very important set of questions and very thoughtful, so we should actually um, respond um, on the list um, at some point, given we're doing this in a working group format with limited uh, MAG participation. Um, specifically to the, the timetable, one of the things we need to do is, um, when the Secretary is here, talk about when our next MAG meeting is, because that timetable is built off of an assumption that it will be sort of mid-June. Um, I actually don't think it's going to be significantly later than that, so I think the timetable is not going to change by, you know, maybe sort of a matter of weeks or something. Um, and I really don't think we have any other option other than to have the MAG meeting in the middle of June. If not, we're in September, and that's far too late. So there are some sort of forcing factors here just for where we are in the, in the year. Um, my perspective on whether or not this goes out for, for um, community um, consent, I have to say first that that would have been my preference um, if we'd actually had a MAG appointed earlier and had been further ahead in this process. Um, I think the improvements we're talking about here are so significant that we cannot um, just put them off for another year. I think the, the role is here, the MAG is here and is multi-stakeholder because it's supposed to be bringing the community view into um, these processes. Um, what I would ask, I think, is all MAG members to actually um, think about this from the perspective of their stakeholders and the things that are important to them and try and raise any sort of um, comments or questions they have, you know, very, very quickly. I would like, and I think we probably need to have this approved by the time we go away tomorrow. Um, if we do not have that, we will not actually have it instantiated in time enough to actually meet the call for proposal timetable. Um, but I think this is something we need to come back to the fuller meeting um, for. But I put that out so that any MAG members that are here that actually have sort of see a significant problem with that or have a significant point of disagreement, we can talk about it a little bit more in kind of a working group fashion before having the um, full discussion at the MAG. And then I'll read Ginger's um, note more carefully as well. I hadn't read it before. So maybe with that we'll go to Sheeta's comment as well. She was next in queue. Yes, so I will read the comment for Sheeta. I would like to clarify on the conditions of three confirmed speakers. If the proposal is a lightning talks, which is only two speakers maximum, would the conditions can be adjusted? A suggestion I would like to make is to have an additional process, could be done by the Secretariat, Learning from previous IGF, though the changes in the format is very much valuable by others, we heard yesterday during stock taking, but we saw that people get mixed up with the new session format most probably because, uh, most probably because of the type of the room. For example, a round table session looked like a panel session because the room format is not compatible with the session's need. I'm suggesting that when we have the approved sessions, we can check the rooms provided by host country and review whether the type of approved sessions and the format of the room is compatible. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a very uh, valid point, of course. I just wanted to clarify the conditions per format uh, thing. Um, we, we have now 
if we do agree to this, we will do the evaluations per format type. And therefore, if there's a format that requires only two speakers, then obviously we cannot penalize people for not having three speakers. So we will adjust the criteria slightly to reflect uh, any changes required by the change of format, and we will have all that listed on, uh, on the website. Thank you. Laura, you are next in the queue. Thank you, Chair. Just give me two seconds. I've just come back in. Apologies for missing the start. Um, so I, I had a clarifying question. I just wanted to pick up on a couple of what other people had said um, before we break. Um, firstly, to thank Russia and the rest of the group for working on the proposal. I also wanted to... Um, support some comments that Liesl made earlier. I think it's very important that we have information and guidance available for proposers so that they're aware what they need to do. Um, I think also the guidance needs to cover remote participation so that it's not enough to just provide, you know, sort of access through Twitter or, you know, that remote participants need to be integrated properly into a process. And I think we need to make that really clear up front. Um, I just had a clarifying question. Sorry if this has already been covered while I've not been here. Um, I know that you said that the MAG members would be allotted a certain number of proposals that they have to review. Um, did I hear you correctly that I can review more than that if I want to, or can I only do my ones I've been allocated? And what sort of safeguards are there in the process? Um, how many people review each process? I just think that this number needs to be high enough to kind of balance out any sort of skew in the voting and also have um, a sort of overlap so that the same, I don't know, say 20 people review the same 20 proposals. I think there needs to be more of a sort of overlap between those so you've got sort of fresh pair of eyes looking at each one. So just in case there's any sort of bias in how they've been allocated. Thank you. Okay, so as the proposal stands right now, every... Um, session proposal will be reviewed by 12 MAG members, three from each working group. All MAG members can view all proposals, but you cannot actually post um, numerical scores for more than the 12 that are allocated to you. You are very welcome, and actually we would encourage it if you would sort of have a side file, and, and if, I mean, if you want to go ahead and even score all the sessions, uh, for the discussion on during the third uh, stage of, uh, of uh, evaluation, but, but the, the numbers that will be entered on the system will only be for the 12 uh, allocated to you. Uh, and the reason why we're doing that is, again, because we don't want to skew certain uh, workshops that may be um, more interesting to some particular MAG, MAG members than other workshops, and so we don't want, uh, like, one... Mag, like one workshop to be reviewed by all 55 members while another workshop to be reviewed only by 12 because that then might um, affect the results. And so we, again, the aim was to try to give some equity across, uh, across the board, but we do encourage everybody, of course, to go through the workshops uh, and even if they want to, sc to score them, to, to please go ahead. Um, but they will not be entered onto, onto the system. Uh, the, the point about the skew of voting, again, uh, it, is, it, it would be taken care of through the score of the standard deviation. So if it, it, it would be indicated if, for example, there are, uh, you know, 10 uh, reviewers who, who gave it a 5 and then one reviewer who gave it a 1. So that, that again, would be um, noticeable for MAG members to, to talk about during the third um, stage of, of uh, review. Uh, thank you. Miguel, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a couple of points to start out. Um, on, on speakers or uh, panelists, uh, I have a concern in how are we going to limit up to three panels for, for each speaker if we didn't already select the, one, the, the workshops. So maybe I'm limited just to three, and none of the three got, uh, got selected, so I'm not going to be able to speak in any, any other uh, panel. So I think the limit should be higher, at least. And, and another point, uh, if we're going to kind of validate uh, if a speaker accepted or not, we could 
I don't know if we have the time, but we could use a tool for both, for choosing presenters or choosing panelists, uh, like kind of a result, uh, resource list that we have last year. And uh, when I'm, I'm about to present uh, a workshop, I could propose uh, a presenter to, to join the, the workshop and the, the presenter could accept or not that. So that's, that's a way the Secretariat uh, can, have a, can check if the, the proposal is in or, or, or is, is out. Um, well, actually, I, I wanted to say also that uh, we could give the MAG members the freedom to evaluate more workshops, but I think you already addressed that. And I also want to stress what uh, Raquel already said. Uh, we should have a, a clear procedure in case one of the group members uh, didn't vote, and we should do it with time because uh, I, don't know, I don't know if it's just a week uh, we need. If we have like 50 proposals per group, we should give them more than a week. Um, and also I want to speak about formats. I don't know if that's the time. I'll ask a, a simple question. Um, the flash or lightning sessions we held were held uh, near the dining, the dining space during Mexico. Are we gonna include them in, a, in the first open call? or are we gonna keep the criteria we used last year to give them to non-selected uh, workshops? And the last one, <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to propose a new format, but I, I know if that's, if now's the time. It's, it's not a format, it's a, a way to include more, uh, more rel I'm talking about relevant uh, topics, not a new format itself. Um, I'll jump in first and then again, Rasha, again, working backwards. I think your last um, um, comment is a discussion for the full MAG. This is sort of an extended working group meeting, if you will. And I think there's a, a, a broader discussion on formats, which type of formats work well, what sort of improvements we might expect to see in them, our new needed and that sort of thing. Um, I think um, one of the things I think this process is, is forcing is the MAG to take a much more thoughtful view of the proposals um, with um, better analysis up front and at the back end um, against um, hopefully you know a vision that talks to the sorts of things that are um, appropriate and of interest or emerging and with appropriate um, diversities and those sorts of things taking into account uh, you know, I, I find it kind of funny that there's such great reliance on this process that was basically a numerical rating with a cutoff depending on the space in the room for 55 people looked at a proposal and somehow we think that gave us better quality than this process. So um, that's kind of my dynamic I'm um, um, working through a little bit. But those questions are, have still are, are for the full mag. Um, I do think if there are some workshops that or sessions that weren't accepted, we actually should try and see if there's um, a different way to fit them in, in the program. If that even brings me to a bigger program um, comment, which again, we'll save for the full mag. But I think this kind of shaping of the overall program, again, is a, is a bigger discussion. There were a couple of related kind of comments to it earlier this morning as well. So you can bring those comments up again later if they're not addressed. And Rasha, do you have comments to the first part? Um, yeah, I just want to comment on the um, limit of three, three sessions per speaker thing. There is no, I guess there's no limit to how many sessions you can put your name on, but there is a limit to three accepted sessions at the end of the day. And so as an ethical, I guess, uh, obligation for the speaker, they would need to tell the session proposers if they've already put their name on three, because if all four get accepted, they're gonna be asked to relinquish, to relinquish one. And so the proposer has the right to know that. And so among the guidance that we're going to write to the proposers, we're going to list this very clearly and ask them to, when they contact the speaker uh, for, for their intent to participate, uh, to ask them if they have been committed to other workshops, and if so, how many? Because then, I mean, the speaker and the and the and the proposers would then uh, agree amongst each other whether or not they want that speaker listed if they've already been listed on other three. 
Because, I mean, ch chances are if you're listed on three workshops and, and all three get turned down, I mean, that, then there's something really wrong with the, with the way the proposers that you're choosing to work with do their work. I mean, it, it's very unlikely that if you're listed on three, all three are going to be turned down. Uh, it's, it's actually the, the more the other side of the coin is probably what's going to happen most is if you're a high-profile speaker and then you get listed on 10 sessions, you know, with, with all due respect, but we don't want you on 10 sessions because we want to allow more space for more voices. We want more inclusivity and we want, we want other members of the community to have a chance to, to voice their opinions. Uh, and so we're hoping that if you're, if you're a high-profile speaker, then, you know, three positions are are good enough and, and you know, you allow um, an opportunity for somebody else to, to make an intervention. But it, it's highly unlikely that you're going to be listed on three and all three would be, would be turned down, I think. So it, it's not like a system uh, barrier. Uh, it's something we're going to discuss. It's, it's not a system barrier at the, at the beginning of the process, at the proposal stage. It will be a system barrier at the end if you are selected on more than three. If, if more than three sessions for you as a speaker all get accepted, then we're going to ask you to choose three and relinquish uh, one. Well, no, I, I agree with the final part. I, I now I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. Um, next we had, we'll have to go to just keeping the list for those that haven't come back here, but moving down. Zina, you have the floor. Yes, please. Uh, first question is for uh, Russia. Can you please clarify a little bit about the uh, grading for the format? Because I, don't, I want to know if it's respecting the, the, uh, the composition or the, the aspect of the session, or it's this uh, panel is, uh, will take, uh, for example, the grade three, well, uh, the debate will take four. I want to just to be clarified about this. And actually, I have a concern uh, uh, regarding putting all the four criteria on the same level. Well, because the content is more, uh, much more important than the, the format of the session. Why we, can't we put like a weight uh, for every uh, criteria in order to be fair? Uh, yeah. There are things that are much more important than others. And my last uh, comment is uh, regarding the speaker collaboration space that you mentioned. Is it only for people that they co uh, confirm their participation or uh, they, will, they might also still need uh, like financing or uh, to be able to join the meeting? Thank you. Actually, the, the reason why we, we're proposing the grading by format is to avoid what you, what you just mentioned, to avoid, for example, having, you know, birds of a feather be automatically graded at three, whereas a panel session being graded as five, or, or to avoid thinking that a particular format is more important than uh, the other formats. So that's why if, for example, we get, you know, 20 proposals for birds of a feather, they, they would be and if we only have capacity for 10, for example, so we would select the 10 from amongst those 20 rather than comparing them to the 250 sessions that we, that we have. Uh, so that basically ensures, I guess, some kind of a quota, um, uh, if you will, for, for each session type, because we do want to encourage all session types to be, to be encouraged. Uh, so, so hopefully that would take care of, uh, of that problem. The criteria weighting thing, is of course an important point to consider. Um, I don't think we have time to consider it for this round because it will take a lot of, uh, I guess, a round of trial and error at least and a bit of, of, um, of testing of, of what exactly is the proper weight to afford to each format. Uh, you're right that maybe, maybe session format is less important than, than content and then uh, speaker diversity and so on. But if we go that route, it's, I mean, I don't think this is something we can settle in the, in the very little time that we have uh, basically between today and tomorrow. Um, and, and honestly, I mean, I, I, off the top of my mind, I'm not sure what would be a proper scientific um, or a, a, a less subjective way of, of affording weights. Uh, and so I think it's easier to just 
to just for now, to, to um, for this year at least, to, to have equal weighting for for um, for all four criteria. Uh, the the thing that makes the format, I think, also important is that you're basically forcing the proposers to, to, to put more thought into their proposal. And by definition, that will feed into the content because, for example, if you're, if you're proposing a debate, you need to tell us exactly how that debate will go. So you need to tell us something about you know, what the skeleton of the discussion will be like, what the main points are, maybe how much time you're allocating to each. And that actually helps you plan the content of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the session better. Uh, so we're hoping that this, that this proposal kind of forces the proposers to put more thought into the process and kind of forces the MAC members to put more, um, more effort and more focus and more analysis into each particular uh, proposal. The speaker collaboration thing would be open at, uh, because it's at the, at the very beginning of, uh, of uh, the process. So the, the point is if you, if you wanted to... Um, if you wanted a speaker on, you know, uh, mass surveillance in the MENA region, you would, you would list that as a possible topic, and then people who are interested would contact you. Uh, at that stage, they probably have not uh, figured out the funding uh, uh, yet, and we're not requiring them to do that. We're just, we're just asking for some kind of uh, a confirmation of intent that you would like to be at this event uh, if, if things work, worked out. So uh, to answer your question, no, the, that space would be open to anybody um, pre-confirmation, pre prior to the confirmation stage. We have two more um, speakers in the queue that are actually here with us. Um, we have Arnold and then we have Julianne um, online. So we'll take those two and then um, I think wrap this up and get ready for the open MAG meeting. Again, those of you that are just coming in, this is sort of an extended working group meeting um, from the working group on the workshop evaluation. So Arnold, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Lynn, and thank you, uh, Russia, for uh, your uh, uh, important work to uh, improve the um, evaluation and selection process uh, within the NLIGF uh, community. There was a, uh, was a, um, a uh, stream where people said, well, we would like to see an improved uh, selection process. Where how can we uh, see uh, which proposals were uh, accepted or declined for what reasons? Now, uh, I think the, your proposed system really is a, a huge contribution to improving this uh, selection process. I have one question, and that relates to the second stage which you mentioned. Um, it says uh, that every proposal will be judged by 12 MAC members. My question is, who is going to decide which member, MAC members will decide or will judge which proposal? Is it first come, first serve? Thank you. Yeah, that's an important uh, issue. Uh, what we ultimately have in mind is for the system to randomly route the proposals to, to three uh, members of each stakeholder group and maybe I mean, ultimately, what we, I, I don't know if we'll be able to accomplish all this for this year or not, but ultimately, we'd also be, uh, we, we'd also want to ensure maybe some gender representation on the, on the evaluator uh, side, some uh, maybe a geographical diversity. I mean, we'd want to get every di diversity aspect involved. I'm not sure if we can do all this by this year or not, but ultimately, hopefully, within uh, by, by the, the following cycle, we'd, we'd have all that in place. Uh, so, so this is what we're aiming for. Uh, I'm, to be honest, at this point, I'm not sure if we'll be able to do that for this year. Uh, but we'll, I mean, we'll, we'll try everything possible to make sure that uh, the, whatever routing mechanism we have, that it's, that it's done uh, in, a, in a fair manner. Did that answer your question, Arnold, or did, do you, you look like you have a follow-up? Well... Uh, let's keep our fingers crossed. I mean, uh, it's still not, still not clear to me um, how we're going to decide if we uh, have these 250 proposals in front of us, and then the moment is there. Who is going to decide or is going to judge which proposals? Uh, as I said, is it first come, first serve? I mean, uh, 
Pardon now, me? what we know for what we know for sure is that the the, a, the members are not going to choose which proposals they want to evaluate. So that's for sure. Uh -huh. What we're hoping to accomplish is for the system to do that through some kind of a random algorithm. But we'll have to wait to, to hear from the tech people whether or not they'll be able to accomplish that for this cycle. Yeah. If not, then we'll try to figure out a fair and representative way of routing proposals to members. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so we have Julian online, and I forgot Liesl was in the, the queue as well. I was off the end of the, the back end of the page here. So Julian, you have the floor, and then we'll go to Liesl and close. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to recall from of, uh, uh, comments uh, I made uh, uh, in the previous uh, MAC meeting where uh, we were discussing the evaluation process and is related to the platform. And uh, I hope that um, uh, we uh, will be able to include um, in the platform uh, filters that will allow to uh, filter the proposal, the proposal cells by sub-teams. So in this way, we'll be easier to evaluate similar proposals that are candidate to merge. And um, when uh, we think about this technical uh, implementation will be great uh, for all the proposals, not only the ones you are evaluating, so you can uh, um, uh, recommend uh, if uh, there is a possibility of uh, merging. Um, also, it's uh, encouraged to include the gender um, in the names of the uh, uh, per persons that will participate in the in the, um, in the workshops because uh, sometimes it's difficult to evaluate the, the gender balance because you don't know what the uh, the gender of the participants uh, in the forms. Uh, also, we had the problem with geographical uh, application. I mean, uh, to to understand from which regions the participants were coming from, because uh, we had uh, most of the participants from Afghanistan being the, uh, Afghanistan being the, the, the first country in the list. So it will be good to, uh, to, 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 um, to encourage to, to put the proper uh, origin of the participants in the, in the platform. And um, uh, also, uh, it seems that, uh, as uh, Ginger mentioned previously, the proposers are not aware of the facilities available for remote participation. So, in general, remote participation uh, proposals last year looks lacks of a good strategy for uh, remote uh, participation. And uh, other comments uh, related to uh, uh, encourage proposers to include multi-stakeholders from different sectors and regions, not only uh, proposals from um, uh, speakers from from the same from the same country. Um, and I have a question. Uh, it's not clear for me uh, if uh, the score when evaluating more than one proposal will be taken into account at all in the system. And um, I agree also to that non-selected workshops are to be included in the flash sessions uh, like last year. But it uh, will be nice to hear from uh, the presenters of the flash sessions about their experiences on that. That's that for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you for these comments. Uh, yes, we will try to arrive at some um, guidelines for the remote participation thing to, to provide better guidance for the proposers. Um, as for the Afghanistan being listed as the country of origin, yes, I did note that uh, as well. And that's actually easily solved. I mean, we, we just we have a list of countries on, on the form, and we just need to provide a blank, like the, the default needs to be a blank rather than a particular country. Uh, and that, I suppose that's very easily taken care of technically, but, uh, but we will, yes, I did note that, and we will take care of it um, in, in the modifications that we're going to, to introduce to the system. Uh, and we will ask the proposers to list uh, the speaker's uh, gender, geography, 
uh, as well as stakeholder groups so that we can better judge uh, the diversity of the um, presenters. Thank you, Rasha. Liesl, and then Mark, I'll put you in the, the queue as well because you were in earlier but not in the room. And then I think we'll close and figure out how to close and move on. So for those of you, again, that just walked into the room, this is the extended working group meeting. We'll restart the MAG meeting shortly and should make sure we get all the appropriate audiovisual and transcription support ready as well. So Liesl, you have the floor. Great, thanks. Um, and I think this has been a really good conversation to flesh out uh, sort of some of the um, tweaks that either have to be, make, be made or reflect things that might be able to stay somewhat the same even in a new system. Um, I'd just like to touch on four things that I've, I've heard and, and I think we've, in the working group, we've either addressed in some way and just want to share it for the um, addressed or talked about in some way and just want to share it for the broader group. Um, first, there's sort of a question of how many to review. Um, and, I, you know, I personally care about how many MAG members' eyes are on each proposal. Um, so, and my own view is the more is better. If we're not comfortable, you know, if we're trying to solve the problem in one way, for whatever reason, not everyone having to review 250 or more eventually down the road, um, then I still sort of skew at least in this initial phase for um, more is better. And I think um, Laura raised this in her question about, you know, can you review more or not? I think we should keep consistent the number of reviewers that are scoring any, any number of proposals. I would argue that perhaps more is better. You know, I think in our current formulation, each um, MAG member would review 40. I think that's right. Each MAG member would 55 review- 55 to 60. Uh, say that again? 55 to 60. Oh, okay. So I think even, you know, I'd be happy if it was more than that. And I think other people have addressed, you know, sort of the number of reviewers to give that diversity of view. Um, but I do think it's important because I don't know how it would skew the results for us to be scoring approximately the same number. You know, if I recuse from two out of my, say, at 60, if I recuse from two out of my 60, it probably won't skew the results that much. But if I review 120 as opposed to 60, that might skew results. And if, if, if everyone does that, then I think it, it adds more randomness into the mathematics than I'm able to put my head around at the moment. So I think we should, whatever number we end up on, we should have it at least relatively consistent with perhaps the one or two anomaly that you would have if you were to recuse yourself from, from judging one. Um, somebody mentioned, I think it was Juan, um, um, or maybe somebody else, of having an overall picture of the, of the full scope of the... Um, of the proposals, and I really like, I also really like this idea. It helped me as a reviewer um, last year to have a sense of what the color of the of the input was. And so if people are willing to volunteer to be a, a full reviewer, I would welcome that kind of qualitative synopsis or synthesis at the beginning of the process as well as the as well in addition to the Secretariat's initial screening and perhaps some quantitative analysis that they can give us on the front end. So I don't know, if people are willing to do that, I'd love that. Um, regarding new and exciting topics, this was once. Um, um, one thing I raised on the working group list was the notion of a wild card uh, um, part of the process, which would in essence be something that we as review, you know, we as a group would say, okay, there's 100 slots, say, give or take, we know that it varies slightly here and there, some are going to be flash sessions, some are going to be 90 minutes, you know, whatever it is, but just for the sake of argument, let's say there's 100, um, and we save 5 or 10 for the really, really back-end um, assessment of what needs to be um, in this program to give it balance. If on the front end of the reviewing process we could flag, say I picked one, I, uh, there was a um, workshop proposal that sounded like a really cool topic or had really new people or whatever, but it was really unfortunately a poor proposal based on our format, so I would rank it a one. But if I could flag it at the beginning of the process with an asterisk or something, and, or a W for wildcard, <laughs> um, then perhaps that would give, and, and everybody did that, we could see how many might wildcard the same ones, and perhaps that would make the, the universe of things we could add at the back end as new and exciting ideas that just happen to be a poor proposal, perhaps we could infuse that into the system at the end. 
Um, and just lastly, um, on format, one thing we um, discussed is that each format currently has a slight description in the um, in the proposal form, but perhaps we could make that a little bit more robust to do so the people are aware of what the criteria, the format entails for its um, session type, and also what the criteria are, so that they know if they're being if they're putting forward a flash session, they're not going to you know, be judged on the same diversity criteria as it might be for um, a roundtable or a panel. I think we can make that clear up front in the proposal itself, not just in background material, but we can make it clear in the proposal itself. Thanks. Thank you, Liesl. Um, I just want to make um, just a couple of comments. I think that we, we need to spring up a couple of sort of um, small working groups here, um, maybe for a half hour or something right after the end of the day today, before the reception by the Swiss government. Um, and I, I've trying to, been trying to twist a few arms here, and I, I, I think one of them is going to be around the, the kind of format and the guidelines and your point earlier about making sure that the templates actually match up with the... And I, I think you um, and Susan, Eleanor, and Rasha have actually said you would be willing to meet for a few minutes and just make sure we're all talking to the same framework and the same thing. I don't think there's a lot of work to be done there on the basis of all the materials we have. But if we could do that um, in a tonight, that would help us get a revised proposal out. Um, so some of those comments that Lisa make, I think we can take offline and deal with that way. Was there anything else you wanted to comment on, Rasha, from, from Liesl's sort of summary? Um. <clears throat> no, I'm just thinking about the, the wild card idea to be marked on the system, and I'm, my initial thought is maybe that's not a very good idea because, I mean, we're 55 members, and if each of us is reviewing 55 to 60 sessions, you're kind of bound to, to mark one or two as wild cards just in case. And so by a quick look at the system, that would make that we'll have about 120 wild cards to look at, uh, which might make the process... Well, I mean, taking into consideration that will be, there will be some replication, so you'll end up with like 90. That's still, I mean, way too much. So I'm thinking, which we do anyway, that people just keep a note to themselves of, you know, session number whatever deserves a second look, and then we can, we can take a look at all these during the third stage, uh, because then you eventually will sort of go through your own list and, and uh, eliminate the, thing, the, the ones that may not... Well, maybe we can think about that a little bit more because I, I actually like the idea as well. And, you know, if it turns out that there's a hundred of them that have one wild card vote, then I, you know, to my mind, I don't think that's enough to rule in um, reviewing. If, you know, some of them get, you know, 10, 20, well, then I think it, it does. So I, I think we'll know quite quickly, probably very visually, whether or not there's anything there. So maybe it's something to still, still keep in. Mark, you are actually going to have the penultimate word on this extended working group. Again, we're still in the extended working group session. We'll start the full MAG meeting in just a moment. We're still missing one or two key folks here. <laughs> Mark, you have the floor. Great, yes. Thank you, Len. Mark, our UK government uh, observer at today's meeting. Um, first of all, it's great work by Russia and all the members of the working group. Uh, you've clearly taken account of the feedback and ideas that have been generated uh, uh, since, since Guadalajara for uh, enhancing and strengthening the, uh, the IGF. Um, I just have two quick points. First point, just to pick up on one aspect of the four main criteria you described, which was speaker diversity, and you mentioned uh, diversity of policy perspective. That was a very important point for us in our feedback. We felt that some sessions you had speakers who were basically all aligned from the, with the same view on things, and that, that could actually be very misleading for an audience. Uh, they would have a takeaway, well, that's, that's the consensus, you know, that's... But actually, what you should always endeavor to do is to attract proposals that have a variety of policy positions, views or opinions on, on solutions. And so the uh, request for proposals should try and, um, you know, make that clear. You know, how are you going to ensure that... Uh, uh, there is a, um, a diversity of policy perspective. And, and on the scoring, um, okay, you know, sometimes it's not always possible to achieve you know, full geographical diversity. Um, 
even uh, gender balance might be a challenge at times. Um, but when it comes to um, you know, lack of policy diversity, uh, uh, you know, we would consider that was as a serious failure in the proposal, whereas the others, well, maybe they could be worked on and achieved, you know, in terms of greater geographical diversity and so on. So, I, you know, some of these elements that we think are more important than others, so I just wanted to point that out. My second point was about format, and one, one issue we raised in our uh, feedback was that uh, sessions that really worked well involved some kind of breakout activity to focus on a particular issue and try and get the, the richness of the expertise and diversity of views and stakeholder constituency working together to let's work out some options for dealing with that problem and then it goes back to the, uh, the uh, workshop uh, organizer and then you know it's some kind of um, not a negotiated approach. The UK government's line has always been that the IGF is not a negotiating forum for decisions, but it is a forum for using expertise to come up with, you know, fresh ideas, options. You know, maybe this is going to work. Could be developed further at, at a, uh, maybe in some other forum, uh, which does take decisions. The the IGF is the first place for trying to work out the path to a decision. Perhaps that's the way to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, we're going to close this um, extended working group meeting here in, in just a moment. Um, actually, we can just close it because the things that I want to say should probably be, and with respect to timetable and proposal and where we're going with this next step, should probably be done you know, formally in the MAG meeting. Um, so why don't I just thank everybody who cut their lunch hour um, short to come here. I, mean, I think it was a very useful, useful session, and I'll talk about what we're going to do with what we've just heard in, in a moment. So I'm not quite sure what else needs to be done to formally open the afternoon session of the MAG meeting for interpretation and um, transcription. Do you want to hit the gobble? Yeah, it does. <laughs> it's the chair's um, right. Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, before we kick off um, a fresh topic, on this afternoon session, so but I want to be really clear on that. I would really like to close the workshop evaluation working group session just now. I think we've had a really um, rich discussion. Um, I think Rasha has agreed to, um, with the working group members, to, to take that away and um, turn a new draft around before the end of the day, night, sometime um, tonight for review. The, uh, a few people have, um, there was an excellent question by Ginger on the list, which I'm not going to read out. We did that a few moments ago. It's um, quite long. It does speak to kind of approval and community. So I would like MAG members to look at that and then respond. I think there have also been a few other comments posted to the MAG list in this topic as well. So to the extent you can respond to that, that obviously informs the, um, the working group. What we're trying to do here, I mean, there's been a lot of dissatisfaction with this process over the years. Um, people, you know, for, took comfort in 50, 55 people reviewing all the proposals, but the rest of the process, I think, fell far short of what it should be. And we looked at rankings. It was numerical. There was a cutoff. We had some discussions on standard deviations, and people kind of threw in their favorite proposals, and we debated them in, in frankly, in a fairly inelegant <laughs> manner. Um, I actually don't think that's kind of the, the goodness we need to strive to for this process. I also hear the MAG in the community several times saying we need to take a much more strategic look at what we're doing and a multi-year look. I think that means the MAG needs to be much more thoughtful on all the work we do, uh, not just the program of the annual event itself, but all the intercessional work, um, and probably carve out some piece of the program that actually allows us to bring in newer or later or emerging <laughs> topics. Um, and we can, we can work on this proposal a little bit more over the, the coming weeks. It doesn't have to happen now. Because, I, I, look, we're in March, 1st of March. The end of December is this meeting. For us to think that we can put a call of proposals in the next four or five weeks really sort of have understood that we have the most relevant timely agenda we could possibly have for meeting in December in this space is, is just hard to believe. Um, so I, I'd like to put... Um, Again, this is not a formal proposal. It's really to get people sort of thinking about it. We can do the, the more formal proposal um, 
on the list, get people thinking about um, how the MAG would actually approach their responsibilities in a world where we were actually going to take a much more thoughtful view of where the Internet governance could actually be helpful and play a role. Um, and that would um, require, I think, the MAG being much more proactive in terms of identifying some topics and speakers and owning some, <coughs> some sessions. Um, I think we should also find a way for the NRIs to come in um, probably um, differently than last year. I know they had a couple of um, suggestions in their stock taking, which um, I hope we get to hear from later. Or Anya could even just sort of quickly brief them if you want. But I, but I think we need to take responsibility for a really strategic process of establishing the agenda and the work of the MAG, and that it needs to cover more than just the program. Um, with that in mind, um, what I would like to do is I think we have to turn to the theme, I think, the main theme. Um, usually what we do at this point in time is sort of ask if there are suggestions or comments or trends or something else. Oh, did I not finish the um, timetable for? No, I'm just going to ask for, I mean, are we done with the... I, I think so, yes. Well, yes, and actually, sorry. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Um, so there's going to be another small working group that's actually going to go away and look at some of the formats and proposals. Um, uh, Liesl, Susan, Eleanor, and Rasha have agreed. And um, we should be prepared to move this forward discussion in tomorrow's, uh, move this discussion forward in tomorrow's MAG meeting. Um, again, the assumption here is around the timetable, which we'll come to a little bit later with respect to um, call for proposals, that evaluation process, and the next MAG meeting schedule. But I would really like people to pay um, a fair amount of attention to this between today and tomorrow. Um, okay, breath. <laughs> New topic. Um, usually we start by asking if there are um, suggestions on themes, and obviously the host country also has a, a significant um, role to play here. You could start by kicking this um, discussion off if there's something that, that really is of interest to Switzerland. You could listen and come in later. It really is as you, as you choose. And then we will open the queue to um, uh, in the room and online participants. What would you like, Thomas? Thank you, uh, Lynn. <clears throat> and uh, I've already said a few, a few uh, words or shared uh, some of our thoughts on, on, on the the title or the main theme and, and whatever it's going to be we are convinced that if you want to reach out and attract the interest of a wider circle uh, of people um, which I think we all agree then we should avoid titles that uh, of, of the kind that we had in, in the past that, that don't make it very easy to see the link between a person, an individual person, or an individual institution, and the IGF. So anything, and I, I mentioned the who sets the rules on the internet, or, or uh, example, or, or something that that uh, <clears throat> is a little bit more like a journalistic title that is supposed to attract attention for people. Why does this matter to you? As to that we target people and institutions directly. That that is, let's say the key element, whatever it's going to be for us. And, and uh, I don't think that, for instance, if you would focus on, on uh, critical Internet resources like we have done for some time, that that is the biggest issue uh, for the time being, um, but that we should yeah, go on a broader, whether we use the word digitization or digital transformation or not, but something that, that is in our, visible in our everyday life and that people can hook Onto, if we go into into a substantive phrasing, but something like why why uh, why does this matter to you? Why how you can influence it, but also how it influences your life? Uh, that is something that we would very much uh, wish wish to see. I'll stop here for the time being. Thank you. Have Juan in the queue and how Jun. I've asked um, Luis is actually going to post under the. Um, uh, IGF 2017 reference documents. There's one PowerPoint slide which shows what the main themes have been over the last 10 years. Um, I'm not I'm kind of torn about putting that up because I personally think that's... <laughs> I'd like to go a different way from that, but at least I think you can see the kind of repetitiveness of it and the... Uh, upon you have the floor. 
Uh, I would like, you know, to make a proposal. Of course, I, I put myself in the hand of Thomas. He's the host, and he should have the last word on this. But taking into account that this IGF is going to be held in Geneva, Geneva is the place where conflicts are resolved, are discussed. Geneva, it's a hub for international relations and taking into account uh, the list of the themes of the past 10 years, I don't see it in the screen right now. This is a theme that is very important and has not been there. So I will suggest Thomas to include in the main theme the concept of peace in whatever form he prefers to put it, either internet governance, for peace or whatever. But I think that the concept of peace is, is something that is not being mentioned there, and nowadays it's of paramount importance. Why peace and why don't to not mention cybercrime? Because I want to put it in a positive way. The ultimate goal should be that internet should be a peaceful and a safe place. Maybe, maybe in the subtitle we can mention that so put it in a positive way. And that is my suggestion to you, Thomas, taking into account what I, at least last part, a, a great part of, of the people uh, thinks about Geneva, the, the neutral place for uh, negotiating ends of conflicts and things like that. So I think that the word peace should be in the main theme of this year. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. I'm actually asking um, Changatai to come in on a comment you made at the beginning that said it's the host country's responsibility to, um, to set the theme. Yes, it's, um, we do, we, the theme is set in cooperation with the host country, the MAG, and the host country, so it's not just the host country. Yeah. Uh, how's you and you have the floor? Madam Chair, first of all, I would like to uh, echo or second what has been said by our Cuban colleague. Um, the uh, Geneva is uh, the, the international hub for international peace and development, and also peace and development is also the, uh, the mandate of the UN. I think it's also the mandate of IG, IGF. Um, although uh, sustainable development, has, you know, we uh, the our mandate is given under the, the framework of ECOSOC. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, its emphasis is on, on, on development, but uh, we all know that uh, peace and development is very much interrelated and they cannot be, we cannot separate them uh, uh, from each other. Without peace, there's no development to talk about. And uh, when we have development, we can have much more guarantee for peace. So. Uh, whatever topic or theme or sub-themes our host country choose, it should be centered on um, peace and development. Or we can say a, peace, a, a cyberspace for peace and a prosperity. That's my premature uh, idea about that. And uh, in, in this regard, I think uh, counterterrorism uh, is also very important. Uh, as cyber terrorism is on the, uh, very much on the rise, and lots of hate speech are spreading on the line, which uh, would give rise to more terrorism. And uh, terrorist organizations are also using cyberspace as their tool for recruiting and financing, etc. And uh, as as we are witnessing the spreading of terrorist threat on on the global scale, uh, count to cyber terrorism should be high on our agenda. The second thing is, uh, is related to peace is uh, non-intervention in, in internal affairs, which is the key principle of the UN Charter. And uh, in, in the past two years, we were seeing that uh, cyberspace or hacking or internet has been increasingly being used by some countries to intervene 
in the domestic politics of other countries, even the most powerful country in the world has been victimized, has been victim of such hacking or manu cyber manipulation. And uh, the third is, or last but not uh, least, is um, how do we prevent a potential or possible cyber war? As some countries are preparing themselves uh, for cyber war, they have inventory of cyber weapons, and uh, they are looking for uh, legitimate, uh, look, uh, trying to legitimize the use of cyber weapons. And the international society have, be, have to be very aware, you know, be, 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 be cautious about that. And also, in, relate, in relation to peace and the security, there are a lot of <coughs> other things I don't want to elaborate here. The second thing is regarding the, this, uh, on the, uh, the, the first part of my, of my invention is on peace, and the second part is mainly on, on development or prosperity. Um, in this regard, we have to keep up w uh, with the change of times, change of the situation, and the fast development and the progress of technology. Um, as we see that uh, uh, cyberspace or, or um, the, the internet technology was uh, uh, creating lots of new jobs. For example, the, the, the Alibaba created by Jack Ma um, creates tens of thousands of new jobs, but in, and many people are opening up shops on the website, and uh, many young people in China are becoming, you know, couriers, del delivering the packages from different city to city, and, you know, oh, very busy, but they earn a little bit of money. And in the meantime, lots of mortar and brick shops are closing down, and uh, you know, traditional industries have been deeply impacted. Uh, so, change of technology. You know, we are, while we're making progress, uh, we are also seeing lots of uh, negative externality of technologies, real impact on people's lives. How do we handle that? We, while we are enjoying the benefits of those technologies, we have to see the downside of these technologies and the international society have to think about how to handle that. It relates to employment, education, employment training, social security, etc. We have to got different international organizations like uh, International Labor Organization here, based here in Geneva, involved in such discussions. And, uh, also, I think we need to get the next generation, the young, pe young people involved. We, when we talk about protection of kids, protection of kids, we are not only talking about the porn, pornography, drugs, sub-crimes, etc. We, we, we have also be aware of the sub-addiction. Lots of young kids, including my son, is very much addicted to, 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 to the smartphone spend a lot of time, forget about his homework, um, et cetera. And uh, I found that uh, their school is uh, doing a lot of things. Uh, Ecolint was uh, having put in place a very good problem, um, teaching kids how to use internet uh, in a responsible way. They have uh, you know, very well designed programs and I think we can take advantage of these good experiences and the practices and uh, Thomas know that uh, Akrint is, uh, is the, one of the best school here, and I think you can get them involved in the preparation also. Um, lastly, I want to uh, say a few words about uh, evaluation of you know, the proposals for, for, for workshops. Actually, um, I'm yeah. sorry, Lee, could you take that last comment to the mailing list? Oh, okay. you know, we were um, okay, pretty okay, clear okay. that Thank I think you. we really Thank want you. to move on to the, to the theme. Um, okay. But would very much like your comments and also like your um, thoughts on uh, the rest of the discussion that's happening on the mag list as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're sort of a hybrid um, process and organization here. And as such, um, Chengatai actually reminded that, in fact, the negotiation on theme actually occurs since we're a UN process convened in a multi-stakeholder model um, with some protocols that run contrary to a lot of government and UN forms. We really are in kind of a hybrid space here. So 
in fact, the theme is, um, you know, sort of the responsibility of the MAG, obviously with support of the host country, and um, there's also a UN connection and, and consideration at the same time. To that same point, I'd actually like us to really stick to the theme here and really focus on kind of more of a brainstorming um, session and throwing out some, some suggestions and maybe a short response as to why you think that suggestion is important, but not a series of, of statements right out. I really want to get some kind of brainstorming and really generate a little bit of kind of excitement and enthusiasm in the room here for that topic. So if I could just ask people to recognize that we're in this kind of hybrid um, forum and, and work somewhere between, the, between them, that would be helpful. With that, I have um, Brazil. I'll have to check and see who else was in. Uh, sorry. Uh, Mexico was first, Israel, then Brazil. Thank you. Israel Rosas for the record. Taking into account the diversity of topics and issues related to Internet governance and the broad impact of the Internet in our lives, I would dare to suggest shaping the Internet of tomorrow through multi-stakeholder collaboration. This is why the, the transcription really becomes helpful <laughs> as well in terms of their ability to type is faster than ours. So Brazil, you have the floor and then. Thank you. Uh, I think it, it's, it's important, I think, that the, the main team uh, be sufficient, sufficiently clear, but also sufficiently generic, not to inhibit important manifestations. Huh? So uh, I, I personally like the idea of shaping the future of the Internet. I, I think it could possibly emphasize aspects such as the, the impact of Internet uh, over economy and society, which is something that has a, a dramatic appeal to actors that are not traditionally already involved uh, in the IGF process. Uh, and the, the discussions about security, I think they, they can also be interpreted under a positive light, maybe if you see them as part of a, a process regarding trust. Because trust uh, has the advantage of involving aspects that have to do with security, but also with human rights and with commercial aspects. And it's a general concept that embraces everything and offers a, a positive light of it, which I think is also important for the main team. Thank you. Uh, next is Carolyn. Thank you very much, Chair. It's just a couple of ideas. I don't have the uh, nice um, title that was laid out before, but a couple of things uh, to, to consider. One is the, the discussion um, that we've been having yesterday with respect to integrating the IGF into um, other conversations such as other organizations. Uh, WTO has already been brought up. Some of the, um, the the health issues as well as the finance. So integration is, is sort of a theme that um, I'd want to put forward for consideration. Um, I really like the term shaping as well. Um, but I think one of the things that we need to get across is really the impact and relevance of the Internet because this seems to be the only forum where Internet governance is taken up, you know, sort of explicitly um, as opposed to sitting in many of the other conversations that are on digital transformation. A lot of times the Internet is just overlooked. So I think that we need to bring it out in terms of Internet. Um, and then second, and then lastly, uh, Chair, to your point um, with respect to the fact that we have eight and a half years to fulfill um, both the process improvement as well as the gaps that were identified within the WSIS review. So something about, you know, sort of setting this out, um, a, a plan in terms of for the, the multi-year as well. So a couple of thoughts there for your consideration. Thank you, Carolyn. Oh, I'm sorry. Can, one last thing. Um, one of the things um, that Thomas mentioned this morning, which is the way that you framed the Eurodic theme as a, as a question, um, I thought that was a really, really nice move as well. So wanted to endorse that. Thank you. Next, I have Raquel and then Miguel and Michael. I'll just keep giving you a little bit of heads up notice here. Raquel. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I have two uh, two thoughts to, to share. The first one is on the trend uh, Thomas was mentioning to have a more um, approachable uh, team. Uh, what we used in the open consultations during the Marco Civil in Brazil is uh, one of the journalist teams, what is the internet you want? And this is really catchy 
people get involved. But my, my erratic thought for the, 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 the main team to put in the equation, as Caroline was saying, I don't have the, the fancy title, uh, is the word on uh, and the focus on people. So the internet, uh, beyond the uh, devices beyond the infrastructure, you have people at the end. It's for and off um, and, and, and uh, people. So um, that's just to wave in. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel. Just to be clear, we have, if your flag's up, you're in the queue. I just wanted to give a little bit of advance notice to the folks that are the second and the third. And so right now we have Miguel. Um, uh I was thinking about some something like uh, like Igor said is uh, using the word trust. Uh, I think it's really important for the future internet. And combining with uh, what Israel said, something like shaping a trustable internet. Uh, shapings the, the shaping word uh, speaks about future, and speak uh, speaks also about what we do at the IGF meetings uh, uh, matters really matters. We are going there to shape the uh, the future. And shape a trustable internet speaks about confidence, security. It include, uh, involves uh, cybersecurity and, 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 and a belief that the internet can help development also. So we're putting trust into the internet. We're shaping a trustable internet, something like that. I think it could work. Thank you, Miguel. <clears throat> Next we have Michael, and then we have Lee of the Council of Europe, and then Shigun. I may not know how themes, how we get to themes, because basically I still believe that uh, current trends determines the themes we take. We are, in, we, are in, we are in an era where fake news has taken a center stage. Just as the previous speaker said on trust, I think the theme must also be centered on content, where people should be, where, I would say, it, where a theme should be centered on fake news, where people should be aware about whatever they see online is not all that accurate. In this case, I would encourage a theme that will reflect fake news and trust. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lee, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, building on what Thomas said earlier about perhaps sometimes the confusion with the word internet governance, I would, I would say that it's probably not a good idea to put those words back into the, the overarching theme uh, as we have seen in previous IGFs. I mean, it can be there at the top as a top title, but as a main uh, title, if you want something more dynamic, I mean, just look around us, all the discussions I come across are at artificial intelligence, machine learning, algorithmic decision-making, automation, and ultimately about the Internet of Things, the, well, the eventuality that everything will be connected to everything, you know, devices connected to people, etc. So I think the, the issue of connecting, connect, connecting everything together is very compelling. I don't have the exact words, but, I mean, that's where we're going. And it's, it's breaking, it's happening already, of course, you know that. But it's still, I think it's still an open discussion which can be shaped. So it's, uh, it's, it's enough in time to be discussed and have a meaningful outcome to shape it. So I think the issue of connecting um, these uh, ourselves, hyper-connected societies, is a key compelling uh, uh, words for, 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 the, for the overarching theme. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. We have Shagun, Renata, and then Hisham. Mamadou. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, considering the uh, contribution from the last speaker, sorry, the speaker from Cuba and uh, Thomas, I, I want to lend my support to the issue of peace and uh, development, especially the statement from the China uh, colleagues. Uh, I believe there's a strong intersection between peace and development. And uh, for some of us that are from the developing countries, these are the issues that we are still contending up to today. And it will continue to be part of the issues that the UN will continue to look for solutions to address. Then um, if you look at the Geneva, uh, it's well known f f uh, for uh, it, it, it's a center that is well known 
to uh, you know in areas of um, addressing or advancing discussion on peace matter then um, i also agree or uh, let me say I, i'm some also supporting the fact that we should look at something that has to do with the uh, transforming uh, therefore i have a proposal here um, which i would like to share with us and this is transforming global peace for sustainable development transforming global peace for sustainable for sustainable development thank you thank you shagoon uh, renata you have the floor thank you chair uh, renata i would just uh like to remind everyone of a strong theme which is transversal to digf and has been the focus of much of the work which is human rights I think we have been uh, eyeing this theme on the backdrop of the history of IGF and much of what has been discussed here so far, uh, the future is youth, so that would be uh, enabling uh, youth to use rights. Um, then you would also have peace, uh, uh, stable uh, and, uh, and uh, secure internet. Um, so human rights should be on the core concept of our theme um, for the next IGF, as it has been uh, previously a focus of the work. Thanks. Thank you, Renata. Tisham? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I think the, uh, the discussion and the ideas uh, on the theme that uh, have been uh, submitted on the table, I think most of them are very relevant to, uh, to this year of, of the IGF. Um, I, I just think we, we should also, uh, while trying to make the uh, IGF this year more relevant to the community of Geneva and uh, what Geneva connotates uh, in our minds, uh, concepts of peace, trust, uh, development, uh, we, we still need to keep the, uh, the catchy part of, of the title. We, we want to make this relevant to the individual. This is an information society that is centered on people. So uh, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a golden opportunity to, to make the theme uh, more generic while still uh, making it relevant to the individual. Uh, a few years ago, I think the, the UNESCO, I, I don't remember the exact year, but it was uh, the UNESCO who issued a report uh, with the title uh, From Digital Divide to Digital Opportunity. Uh, the word or the term uh, digital opportunity actually is uh, generic uh, in the theme uh, for, for an IGF, and I, I wish this year we can capture that. Uh, so if, if we uh, can consider also uh, a theme around uh, fostering the digital opportunity for everyone, uh, in a way that makes it uh, relevant to the SDGs as well, especially that uh, we know from Merlin uh, yesterday that uh, some of the SDGs, especially w with the uh, alleviation of poverty, for example, is on top of the agenda now. So uh, I think a theme of that type would make it more relevant to the individuals, as well as the governmental perspective that uh, most of the permanent missions, for example, in Geneva and the uh, IGOs, uh, on the city would also relate to. Thank you. I want to just recognize and thank everybody for really going along with the brainstorming idea where we're just sort of throwing out suggestions and letting them all kind of percolate a little bit. So I really appreciate that. Um, next we have Mamadou, then we have Wisdom who's online, Alejandra and Hujin. Oh, sorry, I couldn't see you and Kenya too. Uh, thank you, Chair. Mamadou Lowe from Senegal. I will be brief. Uh, as several MAG members and participants raised yesterday the issue, I would like to suggest a team relating to information and communication internet governance <coughs> ecosystem. That means how to spread internet governance information throughout the community and how to link IGF to global community and vice versa. Thank you, Chair. Th thank you, Mamadou. Wisdom. I still love when wisdom takes the floor. Wisdom. We have wisdom. 
Yes, I'm yes, here. Sir. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm calling from Ghana, and I have a few interventions uh, to, um, in relation to uh, Africa, and then uh, uh, maybe I will propose a team to see if maybe it could be uh, discussed and then adopted. Uh, I'm looking at uh, the situation in the developing world. Currently, there are about 800 people uh, in the world uh, going hungry. Uh, more than 90 million of them uh, being children uh, under five years old. And at the same time, uh, there is the evidence to suggest that uh, there is enough food uh, to feed everyone uh, on earth. So uh, looking at this, I'm trying to see how we can use uh, uh, internet governance to actually empower citizens uh, in the developing world. Uh, often this, we are saying um, uh, uh, what is going on is like we are not achieving anything. And then some of us are saying we're looking at the, the next generation who will come and solve today's problem. Now, it looks like there is enough projects going on in Africa, in the developing world. Uh, some of the projects, we are not seeing the impact. Some of the projects, uh, we don't know where the, the money and everything is going and all that. So I'm thinking that uh, IGF, within the 10 years mandate, we have to begin to, uh, to kind of uh, show impact. Uh, already we are showing impact but we should look more into Africa and try to show impact uh, of what is actually going on. Um, so, and then uh, also uh, try to look out for some of the root cause of what is uh, targeting the development of the Africa region in relation to uh, internet. Uh, internet. Uh, we all agree that everybody uses internet. If it comes to the developing world, the big men, the directors, and all that, they have internet in their homes, uh, in their offices, and in, even in their cars and all that. So I'm not seeing the reason why you see Africa or developing world should still be marking time. And then all the time, we'll come back and, and say, uh, we need capacity building, we need to, we need money for projects and all that. Meanwhile, there is enough money coming in for projects and all that, and then we are not seeing the impact. So if uh, this year's IGF can get towards uh, showing impact so that we can begin to show some of these things for uh, government throughout Africa uh, to see that uh, the next thing that is coming on is the internet. The internet is what is uh, uh, bringing all the businesses that we're talking about and all that. So, I'm thinking of uh, a team uh, mobilizing and impacting uh, community, enabling creativity through sustainable internet innovation to empower uh, citizens. So that is uh, what I have, and then uh, maybe we can deliberate on this further. Thank you. Thank you, Wisdom. It was very interesting. I like the idea, too, of trying to show some rationale for why the Internet governance is important, why it matters, what we're doing, whether that's through impact or, or something else. Um, we have Alejandra, I think is online as well. Hello. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, it's very short. Uh, I'm thinking about the uh, relate words like shaping the internet governance away for peace or enabling the peace shaping the internet i don't i i like the the words uh, some colleagues uh, were talking about uh, sustainable development enabling the peace shaping internet governance peace and sustainable development i think we can um, play with these words uh, to to shape our this uh, ICF uh, 2017 ICF. It's all. Thank you, Alejandra. Hujin, you have the floor.
Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for taking floor again. Yeah, I think, um, you know, um, as I said earlier, uh, our theme or our purpose of uh, uh, internet governance is for peace and development, and, you know, we can say it's pe for peace and the prosperity, or have, we can have another P, which is posterity, for the better future of our posterity. And uh, I agree with our colleague from Egypt that uh, um, the theme or our purpose should be centered on people, for the better welfare of all people around the world, um, a better internet or cyberspace for, for, the, for the welfare of the majority of the, the, the human, humanity. Yes, you, right, that we have to make the internet a good place. We can make it, uh, you know, connect to all people around the world, but what's the purpose? The purpose is still for the welfare of people. We can have a very good internet connected to everybody, but a wonderful or perfect internet, uh, if not well managed, can be, can be used by billionaires to enslave the majority of people of the world. Or the majority of the people of the world can be enslaved by robots. We are facing such a scenario if AI technology is getting out of control. So we have to be aware of that, those you know, latest developments. Bear in mind that we work for the welfare of people. Thank you. Thank you, Hushin. Uh, Kenya and then Arnold. Kenya, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Madam Chair. My name is Frederick I'm from the Kenya Mission. Uh, based here in Geneva, and I just want to also appreciate the contributions that all members are putting up uh, towards the theme. Uh, actually, as I was listening and thinking about uh, IGF, I was wondering what is, what is the main focus of Internet governance, because this forum is not just about Internet, I believe. It's about governance. Why should we govern? internet or why should we be so much focused about governing uh, the internet I think we are doing this so that we want to solve certain problems or certain challenges which really affect the real people or which really affect situations in which we are um, involved here or there and I was just trying to also look at what some some members have said if we are looking for a theme, I think it will be very unfair to narrow down to a very small area. If we narrow down to a very small area, what will be the sub-theme? Because the IGF itself, from my understanding, it is a very broad um, uh, forum where we discuss a wide, ranging, a wide range of issues. So the theme itself should be so broad to capture what we are really struggling with in under governance and to also touch the lives or the very people that we are concerned with. And in this case, I was just trying to imagine about, suppose we say internet governance a tool for solving present and future problems or challenges. And most of the things members have mentioned here there are either challenges of now or the challenges which are coming up. Talk of security, talk of human rights, talk of poverty, talk of underdevelopment. Then under the sub-themes, we could pick which ones do we want. And as uh, we see, this is a, for a multi-stakeholder forum. We know within the UN system, there is a focus on implementation of the SDGs. The SDGs in themselves, they narrow down the very common problems facing humanity into 17 goals and a multitude of targets. If we think of SDGs as presenting the challenges or the problems that the world is looking forward to address, I think we can choose some of those SDGs and take them as some of the sub-themes or specific topics we can look at during the IGF 2017. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Frederick. 
Um, I have two more people in the queue, I think. I think some people just haven't put their um, flags down. And then um, let me come back and see if we stay with this a little bit longer or let it percolate and move on to one or two items. Right now I have Arnold and then um, Christina. Thank you, Lynn. Arnold van Rijn, uh, Dutch government. <clears throat> don't have a catchy title yet, but I have some uh, ingredients uh, which probably uh, could be used uh, in a theme, I mean, the uh, overarching theme. Um, I think it's n not wise to use explicitly the words Internet governance, since uh, most people doesn't know what exactly this means. Um, the same, well, it's not true for the Sustainable Development Goals. It has been used many times in many conferences, and we should aim to reach, uh, to reach these, uh, these uh, global goals. But we can cover that under an overarching theme um, with uh, ingredients like digitalization. Uh, this is the, the future informa information society which we are part of, and it has been and it's still been on the table as a hot topic in fora like the G20, uh, the World Economic Forum, other multi-stakeholder uh, processes. So digitalization should be, in my view, part of that overarching theme, followed by um, ingredients like uh, peace and prosperity. It has been mentioned uh, before. Peace because uh, this is the city where the next IGF will be held. Uh, prosperity is everything to do with um, closing the uh, digital gap. Um, it is, it is uh, uh, apart from that, uh, worthwhile to, uh, to think about uh, other issues um, where it, it in, in total covers uh, what we would like to see. But um, digitalization, peace and prosperity I have thought of another about something else, but I forgot it right away. Um, but that should be in, in the in the main uh, main title. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arnold. Um, I have European Commission, um, Christina. Then I have Nigel and well, uh, Kevin. Thank you, Chair. Christina Monti, European Commission. I would also like to chime in into this brainstorming exercise for the theme. Um, I think that many elements are, are common in, in many uh, interventions. Uh, I agree also with the fact that we shouldn't repeat Internet governance uh, because the event is in any case convened by the Internet Governance Forum, so we already have these elements uh, there. So it's going to be IGF 2018, so it's about the Internet Governance Forum. Um, and uh, if we wish to have a, a very broad team that captures uh, many, uh, many different angles, I would like to propose the following wording. Uh, shaping the hyper-connected society. Uh, we would have the word shaping, which is about uh, you know, something uh, which is in evolution, which is dynamic, which is about the future, and where uh, you can have an impact. Uh, Hyper-connected, uh, it's about uh, connecting object, objects and people, and it's about uh, uh, the Internet, because uh, that's the underlying technology. And it has the word society. Um, so it's about building uh, the kind of society uh, we wish uh, for, for ourselves. Um, so, yes, these are my two cents. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Nigel? Yes, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity for an observer. I find this brainstorming in in incredibly useful, and I think you know, the two themes that come out of this is, is, the, is the peace and the development, but also the, uh, uh, the need to, uh, to, to look at where the Internet's going and what better fora than the, the uh, Internet Governance Forum. I agree with what Christina's just said about the use of the word Internet Governance. I mean, it, it, it has to be there, but it's, in the, it's, it's in, the, in the chapeau, if you like. So we, we had thought of something like Internet at, at, at the crossroads or, or something along those lines, challenges and opportunities. I, I mean, the wording is... is uh, is, you know, comes down to the wording, if you like. But I think the challenges and opportunities is useful in that, in the, in the, you know, there are challenges and, and people have, 
uh, raise some of the challenges, not least because of artificial artificial intelligence and other uh, issues and how that af affects socio-economic uh, 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 issues, but also the opportunities, as, the, uh, as, as, as many people are also uh, mentioning, so uh, linked to the sustainable development and that. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Um, we have Canada. I'm not sure if it's Christiane or Christine. Christiane? And then Nigel will come back. Uh, uh, Arnold will come back to you. I think you must have remembered your last word. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. My name is Christiane Roy. I'm with the Canadian Mission again, and thank you for giving me the floor, though I'm an observer. Um, I, I'm listening attentively to all the themes that are proposed here, and I'm, I'm a little bit struck that yesterday we had a discussion where we had put such emphasis on the fact that we, we were going to be faced with a great opportunity by having the IGF in Geneva, where so many international organizations were seated, where people in all of these organizations were having discussions that, without knowing it, actually impacted Internet governance. So certainly in, in our discussions that we've had informally, um, you know, we thought, well, what a great opportunity. We'll be able to bring to these people internet governance and internet governance discussions. Um, and, 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 and I think that there's an education to be done there. So, so not, I'm not just not talking about UN organizations, but we, member states, in UN organizations, you know, there are, there are, we're contributing trade negotiators at the WTO. They're talking about data, but there's no connection with internet governance in our discussions here. Here. So if I could in any way, shape or form uh, influence or encourage the MAG members is to have a theme that perhaps would, you know, go back to what we talked about yesterday in capitalizing on International Geneva and to have something to the effect of, you know, bringing the Internet you want to the governments of the world in Geneva type thing, uh, you know, that would allow for a variety of topics that we've heard here about peace and prosperity and it would include development and human rights, but it would also target the multi-stakeholder community, which sometimes complains that, you know, they're not being heard by some governments. Well, here is an opportunity perhaps to, to, to bring your story, to tell your story in this particular forum. So that's just me brainstorming and thought tossing ideas here. But thank you again for allowing me to speak. Thank you. No, thank you. I mean, I really appreciate kind of fresh views, too. <laughs> I mean, a lot of us have been thinking about internet governance for so long that sometimes it's hard to get out of your own box. Um, Arnold, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Lynn, uh, for my second intervention. In addition to my first intervention, I have to say that digitalization also includes our valuable work in the uh, WISIS process. And... Um, a second, more important uh, remark is a statement, in my view, should end with a question mark. It has been said by Thomas. It has been used again because you want to trigger potential participants. Hey, what's in, the, what's in it for me? How can I contribute to the debate? So uh, a title like um, uh, Digitalization for Peace and Prosperity could be followed by How can you contribute? Question mark because you want to reach out to potential uh, uh, participants who has a lot of knowledge. That's my proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold. Uh, next is Thomas, unless you want to reach towards. Thomas will go to a, li a little bit later in the queue. So next we have Rasha, and then you're in the queue. Rasha. Thank you. I would just I like the hyperconnected um, society suggestion, uh, but I would suggest that maybe we make it enabling the hyperconnected society rather than shaping the hyperconnected society. Make the emphasis on people's ability to to shape it themselves rather than us shaping it for them. Um, so my suggestion would be ena uh, enabling the hyperconnected society. Thank you. Thank you, Rasha. Okay, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Sisi Khan from the African Civil Society Organization. It's a platform from all African Civil Society NGOs on ICT and development. I congratulate you for this session, and uh, I'm very happy to be here as an observer. My feeling um, is that uh, uh, the, the problem with the IGF 
if problem is, is that it's uh, a concept that is not very digest for the common people. So uh, in order to make it uh, accessible, I would suggest that you, um, you use a title that is not uh, technically complicated. Uh, it's a matter of uh, uh, pedagogy so that people will uh, have uh, uh, the RMV or the, to, to come and to, to see what is happening. Um, as uh, Christian said, uh, uh, for governments sometimes, even if they are very well educated, it's uh, complicated for them to understand what is internet governance. And uh, it's not only for government, but also for many people on the ICT ecosystem and community. Uh, therefore, I would suggest something that is uh, really, uh, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know how to say it in, in English, but it's uh, consumable, uh, a, plural, a plural shell, and uh, that people, uh, uh, that more people can understand. Like, for example, uh, digital transformation, digital transformation of our societies. But if you use technical, uh, IGF already is, is technical and it's uh, difficult to understand for many people. So pr maybe try to make it uh, more uh, accessible to the majority. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, CC. Next we have Elizabeth, then Juan, and Laura. I'm assuming, Thomas, you really want to be at the kind of the back end of this discussion, or I can. Yeah, but take, take a few more. Too. Elizabeth, you have the floor. Thank you. So I think really enjoying the idea of the question mark and trying to um, not necessarily close the gap or the window on um, on what, what what are the ways in which um, we're benefiting from the internet or we're, um, the internet is impacting our lives. A couple of thoughts around the question that we, we thought of was um, how can the internet make a difference or what is the what 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 does the internet, um, why does the internet matter to you? Or how does the internet impact you? And then perhaps through that there could be sub-themes around, you know, um, development and other benefits that we could um, elaborate on. Thank you, Elizabeth. Juan? Thank you, Chair, for taking the floor again. Um, I agree that with those who said that we should not have the word internet governance in the theme because it's already in the chapeau, the internet governance forum. But I do agree that we should explain in a sense very succinctly what internet governance is. I mean, if you remember the definition, shaping is one of the things that internet governance do, shaping the internet. So I, I agree with those who are for the word shaping. So I w will make this suggestion. I would like, you know, the Internet Governance 2017, shaping the Internet, or I don't know if the, the word the should be there, shaping the Internet for peace and prosperity. And if here we don't agree, the peace of prosperity, maybe only to IGF 2007, 17, shaping the internet, point, just like that. Because this gives the, the message that the IGF and internet governance is where the internet is shaped for the future, you know. So that is my two proposals, either shaping the internet for peace and prosperity, or if we don't agree, what are we shaping the internet for? I, I strongly support peace and prosperity because, well, it's, it's, prosperity is another way of saying development and all that. It's more general. But if we don't agree that, just shaping the Internet, period. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Laura? Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to pick up and support a um, suggestion from an African colleague over the other side. I'm afraid I didn't catch his name um, around the, the simplicity of the title. It needs to translate into multiple languages. It needs to be easily understood. And it also needs to be something that can capture 
the vast range of topics that are going to be on discussion. We have a lot of sub-themes on the agenda and we have a lot of different discussions going on, so it needs to be something that's simple enough to capture that. Um, Juan actually almost pretty much said word for word what I was going to say, um, which was um, shaping the internet of the future. I think it's important to have the word shaping in there. And I think something that's fairly general is just shaping the internet of the future can capture a lot of different sub-themes underneath. Thank you. Uh, thank you. If, if Thomas wants to try and close this, I'd like to throw something out. And if you just want to throw something out, I'll... <laughs> Go afterwards. What would you like? You've been in the queue for some time, so. Yeah, we will not close it uh, for today anyway, so I don't think that <laughs> that, that, is, that is so important. Um, uh, I think we have a, a, a great uh, number of, of, of interesting elements, that, and they're all legitimate uh, in, 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 uh, in different ways, or in, in every way, actually. And the problem is that if we would try to to uh, capture what we said, we would have something like uh, mainstreaming internet, internet governance, shaping internet governance for, for peace, prosperity, health, education, uh, environmental, sustainable development, and, and as we can basically have like the whole WISIS uh, uh, declaration in, in the title. Or, or um, So the question is how can we break it down? And actually the, the, the latest proposals went into, into abstracting it, but in a, in a attractive way and, and actually the first one that went in that direction was, was Rachel's thing like that was like uh, what is the internet you want that was uh, the, the, the first that was it's already used to, to I don't know whether you have the copyright uh, the Brazilians on, on this one or not and then there were some that went into, into a similar direction some of them with the word shaping in it others with the word digital uh, in it and, 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 and or prosperity and peace um, one that I also liked uh, is, is because it goes in both in two directions, what the ex whatever the exact words are, but how does the Internet impact you? How can you impact the Internet? That, this logic is something that I think would be, and you can then say, how, can, how does the Internet shape you or your life, and how can you shape the Internet if you want to have the shape instead of impact in? But this thing, like, if, if you don't do anything, it will have an effect on you anyway, but you can actually do something, and then it will maybe have the effect on you that you want. Uh, this logic, I think, is something that, and you can apply this to all aspects of, of your life or of our lives or of our functions. This, this is, is actually something that, that I liked. And, and then, of course, um, if you want to turn it in, in, in another question that, that, that has come up, something like how can we shape the future of our digital societies and economies, this is a little bit, uh, this is another way, uh, or, or uh, things like how can we shape a peaceful and prosper, uh, prosperous digital future, the question is do you want to have the future in or is shaping enough future that you don't need to mention the future. Uh, my personal feeling is that, that actually something like how can you influence shape impact the internet, how does it influence, shape, impact you? I'd like to have these both directions with a question mark is, is my, for the time being, my personal preference. And I just want to stress what, what Cengetai and, and Lina said. Um, we may be, may be primus in the Paris here as the host country, but it's not our decision. This is still a, a bottom-up process and, and uh, everybody needs to be more or less fine with everything, including the title. Thank you. Well, thank you, Thomas. Um, I also like the idea of sort of a question mark as well, because I think what we want to do is to convince people why they should come to the IGF, why Internet governance matters to them without. We're going to take a few more um, comments, um, and then I think just probably let this percolate and come back to it a little bit later today or, or tomorrow. So I have Raphael and then Sandra, and I am allowing non-MAG members to speak, because again, I think this is a brainstorming, and it's fresh ideas, and somebody has not been quite so in order that I think could contribute more. And then Juan. So Rafael, you have the floor. Thank you, Ling. Picking up on Juan and others, I would, I would go for something along the lines, shaping together a peaceful and prosperous digital future. I mean, the, the, the word together there uh, really um, relates to multi-stakeholder. And I think that's something that we should uh, really add into the, into the title. And the other peaceful and prosperous have been already discussed. And digital future re relates to, to the digital transformations that other people have been uh, mentioning. Thank you. 
Thank you, Rafael. Sandra? Thank you. Um, just a very small comment. I would propose to avoid the word Internet because it's much more about the Internet. It's digital. And the Internet is just one part of our digital life. I also had to learn that recently when we were discussing the overarching theme for Eurodic. And also you have the Internet already in Internet Governance Forum. So don't think I, I would not include that word Internet into the title. Thank you, Sandra. Juan? I'm not going into substance because I already made my uh, suggestion, but just for the form. I think that the, tight, the main theme should be short. I'm not against the question, but the question may be the sub-theme. So I, I, I suggest a short, message-oriented, broad uh, main theme. For instance, if we don't agree in what Internet for, just shaping the Internet. And then the, in the, in, in the sub-theme, you could put what uh, the host country, what Thomas won, the question in back and forth. But that question is not very elegant to put it in the main theme. At least it is my opinion, you know, I, I, of my years of experience in this kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Uh, Mark, and then we'll actually wrap this up just for the moment, set it aside and move on to a couple of the topics and, and come back later. Mark, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, uh, Lynn. Um, just to say I, I support uh, a media-friendly um, title for the IGF. That's going to help with um, mainstreaming the IGF, the content of its IGF, and, and bring in uh, people from a wide variety of backgrounds into, into, into the discussions that will uh, attract uh, media coverage and raise the profile of the IGF and, and reinforce its relevance to daily lives. The other aspect uh, I, I support is um, that this short um, uh, media-friendly uh, title should be in the form of a question and, and a question that hits on uh, how the, the digital transformation that's going to happen impacts on lives. Sorry, I don't have it as an actual text, but uh, along the lines of how can we ensure digital transformation uh, uh, impacts every, everybody's life. It's not very good, I'm sorry, but uh, along those lines. <laughs> I, I can see <laughs> needs what needs working on further development. Thank you. Well, in a brainstorming session, there are no good suggestions or bad suggestions, and they're all all food. Um, historically, what we've done is kind of done something similar to this, and just let it percolate for a little bit, and then and then come back. Um, before we close this, I can't actually tell if there's a, a question from Ginger online or. Comment from Ginger and then uh, an intervention from Julian, if uh, time permits. Uh, so from Ginger, what are the main session topics and session emphasis that should follow each of these proposed themes? Uh, that's a good question. I'd like to come to that in a moment because I think that's the next, um, the next section, session we'll move to. Um, so thank you, Ginger. And I guess Julian um, wants the floor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, I just uh, want to mention uh, an APC, Association for Progressive Communications, input on the themes. Uh, we had proposed in a written submission that there is a reflection of the High Level Political Forum on the Sustainable Development Goals. We would like to suggest that the sub-themes reflect this. The teams that will be covered in New York this year are, are the Gold 17, strengthen the means of implementation and revitalize the global partnership for sustainable development that will be considered each year and related to uh, end of poverty, Gold 1, Gold 2, and hunger, Gold 3, ensure healthy lives and promote well being for all, uh, Gold 5 achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. Goal nine, build resilient infrastructure. 
goal 14, conserve and sustainable use the ocean, seas, and marine. We also feel that having human rights as one of the maintenance is a valuable tradition at the IGF that should not be lost. And for the main team, uh, we would like uh, the idea of uh, why the internet matters. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Uh, Thomas? Thank you. Just just a quick reaction. And, uh, and on, on, for instance, on, on Rafa from Spain's proposal about shaping this together. I think we've, I, I've, I fully agree that we need to do this together, but we have this together idea in, in titles and, and this like, like a hippie festival uh, in 1968, if I may be a little bit uh, provoking. Uh, <clears throat> and actually, to be honest, one of, for instance, one of the most compelling it's a picture, but it's, it's a, there's also a slogan behind the picture that, that I've known since I was a, as a child. It's, I think it's the Uncle Sam thing with this guy with the American flag pointing at, at you, type of uh, don't ask what your country can do for you or what you can do for country and blah, blah, blah. So something like pointing, uh, pointing at you, something that points at you. And, and um, we can actually turn this together thing around. I'm just thinking a lot. And, and basically formulate the opposite instead of, of, of signaling these two things, go for something like, how can you shape your digital future? And if everybody thinks that I can shape my digital future, this is the economic theory, if everybody's thinking about himself, then the whole public interest will somehow emerge. Um, the, um, the, um, if everybody thinks like, okay, I need to go there because I want to shape my own digital future, and then people realize that they actually have to talk to each other, um, that may be something that is very personal, pointing at everybody. I stop here. This is just something that struck me while listening to, to your comments. And what I forgot to say to a, to a Chinese colleague, actually, I think we should have some exchanges because my younger son uh, seems to have the same. And I'm, I'm quite uh, delighted that this is a very intercultural thing, apparently. Uh, seems to have the same attraction to screens of whatever size um, than uh, like yours. So, um, yeah, happy to have a conversation about what you do, how you deal with it. Thank you. <clears throat> I was actually going to say, if you're willing to give up on your question mark, you could say, come here to shape the Internet you want. <laughs> um, I, I'd actually like to stop this um, for the moment, and I think there's a couple of other th um, topics we could move to, which might actually help inform this from a slightly different perspective, and I, and I had actually closed the queue a little while ago. So if everybody's okay with that, there are a few flags up. This is not the end. And, of course, people can put comments in on the, on the mag list. Um, we're, we're starting... I don't know, I feel like a little bit of a disadvantage here for the global shaping the program of IGF because, frankly, we've got um, 11 or 12 new MAG members that came on the list two days ago. <laughs> um, so normally, you know, we would have been on the same list for, you know, I don't know, six, seven weeks, and we would have been sharing some things, kicking some things around. We would have had some kind of broader sense of where, as a new MAG, um, we were going. Um, there's a couple of things I think we maybe need to just um, test here, and Ginger's question is, is one of them, of course, which is what is shaping the um, main sessions or the sub-themes? Last year, we chose not to talk about the sub-themes and set those. In previous years in the MAG, there was a main theme, and then there were anywhere, I don't know, five, six, seven, I guess, um, sub-themes. Last year, we chose to have that done through tagging. So we put out sort of a, a general call um, with some supporting information, let the workshop proposals came, come in, and then the program and the sub-themes of the tracks were built on the basis of the proposals that were accepted by the MAG. One of the things we need to check is whether or not we're still on that tagging model, um, which would allow for a, a more bottom-up community build of the program. And as a kind of... Corollary to that question, again, we said earlier that um, they're, they're, I think we're leaning more and more into the intersessional work, whether it's the NRIs or the best practice forms. And I think we need to figure out how we intersect um, the needs of those activities in with the overall program. So the NRIs in their um, stock taking um, basically had two requests. Um, one was for 
main session and, and I think a slightly different format. And the other one was what I would call almost um, sort of a, a track or something, which would allow them to showcase and feature um, the NRIs um, in a different um, fashion from what was done last year. But I think it, it's more of a meta question. I mean, the, the, some of the MAG members have traditionally thought this was about the program, and we chose the program was set on the basis of the workshops we received and what we chose from them. Um, as we work more and more towards asking the dynamic coalitions or the best practice forums or the NRIs, what would be helpful to them on the occasion of an IGF to help them advance their work locally, um, then we're starting to um, move away slightly from a completely bottom-up program. And I, and I don't want to do that without discussion. I don't want to do that through, you know, just kind of slippery sloping. Um, Maybe what we could do um, right now is ask um, somebody, I don't know if it's on you to just read out from the um, NRI request or from some of the um, NRI coordinators are here to talk about what would be helpful to them in the um, IGF and maybe um, sort of clarify what you're actually looking for in a possible main session. This is the program where we talk about, again, we're just trying to get the overall shape of the program, what we're trying to do, sort of what big elements of work are in or not. We have the same question for the BPFs. We've had um, four BPFs last year, best practice forms. Um, I believe two of them um, have said that for the moment their work is complete, it's more about outreach and how do they get their work to the places where it can be helpful as opposed to advancing them. That would be IXPs and IPv6, I think, for the moment. They're done. Gender and cybersecurity have both come in with requests to continue. But does the MAG think that um, additional best practice forums are called for? And are we hearing from the community that additional best practice forums would be helpful? And this is where if we could find the time and the cycles in our process to really get a strategic work program in multiple years, this wouldn't be such a scramble over the course of two days with people having sort of first met each other. It would be... Um, just, I think, um, much more thoughtful and would really allow us to work outreach and bringing in other um, partners um, much more easily. Um, so I think I'd like to kick this sort of session off. Marilyn has asked for the floor, and I'll come to you in a minute, Marilyn. Um, last year we made the decision in this first meeting that said the NRIs had requested a main session. And we all said, yes, we think this is absolutely the right thing to do. Dynamic Coalition, um, BPFs also wanted some significant visibility, and we said, yes, we should dedicate one of the main session slots to that as well. And then we had a, um, a longer discussion on connecting and enabling the next billion and whether or not the MAG supported a phase two, and then, of course, how that fit into a main session. And the reason we focus on main sessions is main sessions are meant to have a lot of visibility. They're transcribed in the... Uh, interpreted in the six languages. Um, those are the, the ones that tend to become kind of focal points for um, the IGF program in its entirety. I think so, the, the other main sessions um, can either be developed a little bit later in the program or um, are developed in response to something that's happening um, at a very significant level in um, the Internet governance space. So two years ago we had a WISIS plus 10 um, review at one of the main sessions. That was obviously ahead of the um, uh, decision in, in December. And then last year we actually had one on the sustainable development goals. I think it's probably obvious why we had those two things as main sessions, but um, uh, you know, it's, it's um, again, it's a little bit hard because I feel like we're having a little bit too much of a tactical discussion without actually having had the vision discussion. But honestly, I don't know how to make a lot of that work in the timetable we have. So we're going to have to move in and out of vision and tactic, vision and tactic, and um, continue along the kind of paths we've laid out the last few years, but hopefully carve out some time in the um, MAG, probably through virtual calls, to really start getting a longer-term view of some of this work. Mm -hmm. Thomas, please. Thank you, Lynn, for laying this out. I just have a question, and I may not be the only one. Um, how many main sessions will there be? So it's basically, there's that main session mean there's now two main sessions in parallel, so it's one per morning or afternoon like it has been. So that means eight maximum, and if you take opening and blah, blah, blah away, then we end up with something like six. So my calculation is right. So this is just that we know, everybody knows, we're talking about six main sessions. Thank you. 
That was a useful clarification. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Marilyn, you wanted the floor, and then maybe um, I'll go to Marcus, and then um, unless either one of those two individuals send us in a completely different direction, I will um, ask Anya to just inform the room of um, two of the um, inputs from the NRIs and their um, stock-taking document to us. Marilyn, you have the floor. Being recognized as an observer. I have three comments that I would like to share um, with um, both um, old, uh, the um, um, more experienced MAG members and the new ones. Some of you may not have attended, and I believe it was Bali, I could be corrected, but I believe in Bali we had the availability of some very large rooms so that not only main session, uh, but we had rooms of this size and perhaps similar to some of the other uh, rooms here available in the Palais, which are very large and can um, accommodate, I believe I heard earlier, 300, 400, 500 people. The, if I recall, uh, the, we experimented somewhat differently with uh, the use of some of those rooms um, and that gave a, a whole different um, opportunity so that you didn't have a main session which only had 300 people sitting in it. You, we were using different rooms for, uh, for those sessions. So I just wanted to mention that because there is a lot of there are a lot of different room formats here at the Palais, but again, I will reinforce the fact that the last time I tried to move a desk and a chair at the Palais, I was practically arrested by the security guards. That's a joke, but <laughs> practically. <laughs> um, I learned my lesson and got the Austrian government uh, uh, ambassador to move the chair. Um, so. Keep that in mind, if we could know more about the uh, room schematics very, very early, um, I think that would be very helpful to the MAG, also in terms of the allocation of um, meeting opportunities, and now I will put my former, uh, uh, the hat on about uh, focusing on the NRIs. I am the uh, chief catalyst of the IGF USA, so I've been involved in the um, participation of the NRIs now since, um, I believe it was back in Ghana, when uh, Marcus and Chang and Tai uh, and I co-organized one of the first very large sessions of the NRIs. I, I hope there will be some accommodation to some of the ideas that they put forward already but may still be evolving as they are learning about more about the venue and then checking with their communities of interest about their availability to travel here to Geneva. It will be very challenging for many of the NRIs from um, some of the developing countries to bring a significant number of attendees here to Geneva and I might be looking at uh, Percy to um, uh, think that he or Michael might also want to comment on that. So it may be premature for them to be able to um, give you a, a more unified decision other than the work they've already done by consensus on some of the suggestions. Thank you, Marilyn. Marcus? A quick word to the mathematics. Uh, the DCs last year had a half a slot, that is a 90-minute slot. Two years ago, they had a full three-hour slot, but they proved actually too long. So last year, they divided it in a 90-minute slot as a main session, and then another 90-minute in a separate room for a more internal taking stock exercise. And this is exactly what the DCs would like to have also this year. Uh, thank you, Marcus. That was very, very clear. Thank you. Uh, Constance? Uh, Chair, so I uh, was uh, coordinating the CNB last year, and the year before I was asked to uh, try to rejuvenate the BPFs and also kickstart the, the, the CNB. Uh, I'm saying this because I've interacted with many of the, the leaders, co-leaders, uh, expert leaders, uh, 
And um, as much as I uh, appreciate uh, the, the, the desire, that, which is legitimate, to be recognized in the agenda um, and the request from many to have uh, a main session, half main session, a three-hour main session, 90-minute main session, for me, um, the important uh, thing really is not to talk about the structure but to, talk, to start talking about the substance. Um, if you take the examples of the BPFs, many of them uh, would benefit from being, in my view, attached simply to a main session that is related in terms of uh, thematic focus. And they would have just as much visibility, uh, and overall I think the agenda and the thematic organization of the IGF would be much, much more consistent and, and stronger and easier for newcomers to understand. Um, so, you know, the same thing for, for, for the CNB. Uh, last year, the Connecting the Next Billion, Connecting and Enabling the Next Billion was all about sustainable development goals. Uh, it could have logically been associated to the main session on, on sustainable development. Um, I, I think there, there, there should be an intelligent way to tie these things together so that overall perhaps we have less main sessions. We've heard there... Um, they, they, they could be more interesting. Uh, many of our CEOs and leaders have said they were a little surprised that there were so many main sessions. It was difficult to understand what is really main since everything is main. Uh, so, um, at, again, as much as I appreciate the, the request from all the leaders, co-leaders, uh, to have visibility, I'm, I'm convinced overall the agenda would be much stronger if we, if we tied things together in something that is uh, more consistent. And, and as the coordinator of the, the CNB, personally, I would be absolutely fine having that piece attached to, if it is on sustainable development, a, a main session on sustainable development. I hope that's useful. And I think that's very interesting as a suggestion. And while some of this feels like it's a mathematical calculation, I want to point out that it's not. It's nice to know the rough shape of what we have and, and what we're talking about. But if you recall last year, we thought we had far too many main sessions to fit in, and we found places for them. We thought we had many, too many of these sessions, and we found. So this is more to get kind of a rough sizing and, and a scope and really um, sort of get a sense of, of um, where the mag is. So I have Elizabeth, then Juan, and then I really would like to hear um, from the uh, NRIs and their two suggestions as well. So, Elizabeth. Um, so, I did want to raise the point we were talking before about the number of main sessions, and, and some of them were three hours and some were one and a half. So, I think um, that is an option for flexibility and, and nuance. Um, I also wanted to, I, I, it, it, it's actually very timely that Constance spoke before me because she, she hit a number of um, topics and, and points that I, I would like to support. Um, one of the things I've heard from a number of people um, coming at the IGF new and, and some who've been around for, for quite a long time is that it's getting confusing what makes the distinction between a topic or a, a, an, uh, an approach that um, is main session suitable versus other proposals and workshop topics and, and, and issues. And so... Um, in light of the fact that we're with nine years ahead of us and we want a strategic plan, and I, I really have a lot of understanding and appreciation that we're within time constraints, my sense is that on the main sessions, we, we have fewer constraints and that we could actually do some strategic thinking before about what we actually want those main sessions to contribute to a longer term agenda and how those can interact. And then in future, perhaps integrate our approach to the workshops, you know, in a subsequent session. I, 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 I see the distinction between those. Um, so I, I put that out there to, to ask perhaps we could explore buying more time um, to know really that we're doing something more than just this year it concludes and then where do we start here again next time. Um, and I would also uh, reiterate um, and support the point that Consos made that the topics and approaches we want people to come into need to be um, something somebody outside the picture of the IGF usually could understand. And so um, I'd much rather see us 
integrate the activities and intercessional work into dialogues around those topics and make them focused on the, the showcasing the work that they're doing within a dialogue that is perhaps even broader than their work but integrates them as a piece of that puzzle as opposed to grouping them all together and saying here is our um, set of, of things that perhaps don't all have a commonality and a, and a, and a, a, um, a sim they're, they're very diverse topics among those groups. And so to interest an audience member, I think sometimes we look at it more from our facility of organization than we do the appeal to the audience. And I think that's to our detriment. And finally, I would say that um, I am really excited to hear the NRI's proposal because similarly, I think there's, there was so much substance in that session, but the appeal of the session to people who don't know what they're about or why they would want to go there was, was I think, a, um, a disservice to the session by calling it an NRA session and then having it structured in the, in the fashion that it was. So I, I would really welcome a longer um, discussion on, on, on how we could support showcasing their work in, in, a, in a more um, adapted fashion to the, the setting. Thank you. No, I think those are very good comments. And so let me clarify, I wasn't intending to have the main session discussion now. I think we slippery sloped a little bit when people started doing the math about how many there were. What I was really trying to understand, and I, I don't think I said this particularly clearly, is the MAG's role as it looks towards both the program of the annual event and all of the intersessional activities. The NRIs made a couple of comments in their submission that said these are some opportunities we'd like to take advantage of at the annual event from an NRI perspective. That's the conversation I was trying to get on the table while also saying that I think the MAG needs to reconsider um, its roles to embrace more broadly things like the NRIs and what we can do to support them and BPFs and what we should be able to do to, to some of the comments, in fact, Avi was making in, in the chat room there. So I was trying to have a larger shaping discussion, but um, and I guess I, I wasn't that clear. Or So we'll come to the um, NRIs in, in just a moment so that we can hear from the NRIs two thoughts they had about what they would find helpful to their work in support of um, our, our mission here. Juan, do you want to go ahead of the NRIs? I, I want to some thoughts about this main session. As you said, the main sessions should reflect the, the real trends, the real, and as you also said, some are obvious. Two years ago, it was the WISIS plus 10 process going, so it was obvious to have that. Maybe, I don't want to go ahead of the discussion, but maybe this year, cybersecurity, because as it was mentioned, it, it could be one. But another, th the, the main thing that I want to uh, uh, propose is that one way to find out what are the, these trends is in the past IGF, the one in Guadalajara, which workshops had such an attendance that really reflect the interest. I can, this, that is analysis that we should do, but I can put an example. I went to a workshop that was, remember workshop one, the theater type, very steep one, that was about digital content in which there were film directors and um, mainly film director and even serious director from uh, Africa, Latin America, even this Indian film director from Bollywood. And it really was very interesting. And I kept thinking that internet, it's very important nowadays for entertainment, you know, this digital, and that how to elaborate the, the, that content in, in all the countries is, is not easy. And also even the linkage with the gaming industry in all, in all that content. And that could be a very nice main session. We can invite, you know, film directors of, of category, and it, it could really be very interesting. But I, I'm just putting it as an example. This is an example of a workshop that could be graduated to main session. I think this concept of workshops that was successful, we should analyze from last year program, which workshop was so successful that we can propose to be elevated to a men's session. I think that that could be, uh, and, and also ha have the obvious one that, that this year, and also from international, uh, maybe an, a new event that has not happened yet should happen, and that could be a uh, way for doing it. I think those are very good comments, Juan. We usually do use 
we usually do have a call um, for suggestions for main sessions a little bit later, and we start these discussions around substantive <clears throat> and content discussions. So I think we'll get to that soon, not in these two days here, but in terms of the full call. Um, is it Anya who's actually going to read out the two, or uh, Anya? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. So, uh, as you said, the NRIs worked on a joint submission to the taking stock of the IGF 2016. The contribution is quite long, long and it's uploaded on the IGF website. And what I just would like to note is that uh, that submission goes beyond the annual uh, IGF program, and it does reflect some of the MAG members and collaboration that could be established. So I would like to draw the MAG's attention to, uh, to that uh, contribution to read it. And I have just pulled out the very important three kind of requests that came as a consensus from that submission. So the first one would be that uh, the NRIs would like to organize a main session for the IGF 2017 meeting with the understanding that the session should be of a substantive nature and uh, interactive as possible. The main reason is because the IGF 2016 session resulted in establishing close linkages between the NRIs that created a sense of community. Many expressed that the stakeholders within their respective communities gave stronger support to their initiatives, as it was shown that the global IGF recognizes the NRIs. On the other hand, it showed to the global IGF community that the national and regional perspectives are important as the issues, challenges, and perspectives are different and therefore deserve different approaches. My second point would be that in addition to the main session, uh, I would like to draw this mag's attention to the difficulties that the NRIs are facing when it comes about showing their work, ideas, and knowledge through other session formats. This is mainly due to the formal requirements for the workshops and open forum proposals and applications. For this reason, but also for the reasons of having the wider IGF community been aware of the internet governance development in countries and regions, I would kindly ask if the, this respective MAG could explore the option of giving a separate track of substantive sessions to the NRIs. These sessions will be focused on the substance, not on the process. They are not of a mandatory nature, but they should be offered as an option. On this way, the community will have the possibility to hear what is happening in various countries and regions. I am leaving to this MAG, respectively, to explore logistics. And finally, the third point would be that the coordination session that took the form of a meeting between the NRIs and the UN IGF should be continued since there was a huge value of mutual understanding raised there. Thank you. Yeah, I, mean, I, <clears throat> I think any of the um, <clears throat> operating or management um, sessions that are needed, like the one that was there, um, with, with um, that one happened to take place um, with DESA, as DESA officials were there. Um, I'm sure there are other analogies here as well. I, I think those can just be slotted in appropriately. They're not, they're not obviously part of the formal work program. The same thing for Marcus when he actually commented on the, on the Dynamic Coalition's kind of management session. Um, those obviously don't need to go through a formal workshop process. They simply need to be slotted into um, to a room availability. But I'd like to ask the, um, the MAG and the NRI coordinators that are here as well to engage a little bit on the request for the NRIs, which is, again has been in their, um, their submission to the stock taking, their request that there be um, sort of a separate track or a theme which would allow them to um, focus substantively on um, work that they're doing. So. I don't know if there's anybody from the NRIs who wants to sort of um, expand on that a little bit, give the MAG a little bit of time to, to think about it. This would be, again, my comments earlier that said, I think we're changing the way we construct the program of the IGF. It's not about what workshop proposals were submitted and what are the top scorers. We're really trying to, through all the intercessional work, find the right way for them to intersect with the annual event. And I think at the same time trying to figure out, you know, our roles in, in supporting them and, and really streaming them, if you will, into the IGF. Let me let Sandra talk, and then if there's, there's a few faces and Magma was looking confused, we'll come back and see if that needs more clarity for the moment. Sandra, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, actually, it was good that Thomas uh, counted that we are talking about six main sessions we have to somehow distribute, and it's absolutely clear that if one group is asking, the other group wants to have a main session as well. 
So, point taken, and, and very good that you reminded us on, on this. Then I think Marilyn made a very good point. She said um, this, the, the setting of the rooms we have here actually can make any session a main session because they are just so big, you can attract a lot of people, you are not dealing with very small workshop rooms. So actually the setting uh, which we will find here at the UN is, is quite perfect for any kind of, of bigger sessions which are not main sessions. And um, going back to um, our, our main session in uh, Guadalajara, I mean the room was not packed. Let's be realistic on this. So I have no strong feelings, feelings if we should either have a main session or, or not. I think and I'd like to reiterate that here, and I would like to uh, extend a little bit what we just have been discussed in this European corner in, in, in this break. Um, we believe that it's important to make the IGF debate a little bit more of a process, a global process. And we were just thinking how we could uh, do this in Europe this year. And um, so far we were m m mostly looking at it from a beginning, from the start of the year until the end of the year, and then it's somehow finished. But actually that's, that's not true because the IGF taking place at the end of the year produces outcomes. And actually those outcomes can be taken up by the national uh, IGFs and by the regionals to, to look at, okay, what's relevant, for our, what's relevant for our discussion and how can we transform this, what might be our next message to the global IGF. And for this, we need a room. And if we can organize such a process in Europe, there can be such a process in Africa, Latin America as well, to take up the proposals from the IGF as they came out and incorporate them into the next via the regional and the nationals and then back to the global. So again, um, we were all in the same opinion that any kind of regional space, let's call it forum, or uh, regional hour, or, or regional space, or whatsoever. But if this could become a, a part of the agenda, even if it's on day zero, but as it is uh, a status quo that we have those spaces for the region when they actually can take up their discussion. Um, this, we believe, from, from the European uh, stakeholder would be really helpful. Additionally, this workshop with uh, UNDESA was really helpful. I think we should just keep it as kind of a, um, a getting together, seeing how, what is next, how we are going to collaborate in the future. And um, I think NRIs might be also benefit very much from a sort of an exchange on best practices, but this is something which can be applied via the call for workshops, for instance, if the NRI a group wants to do so if they decide to apply for such a workshop. Um, again, although I was very much in favor of having this main session last year and uh, also proposed, yeah, we should have it again, I see the point that we have only six and we have to be fair when distributing them. So f no strong feelings from my personal point, but very strong feelings for these uh, regional spaces to discuss among each other in a region, but also to reach out and inform people from other regions what's going on in, in a region. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sandra. I have Liesel and then Jorge in the queue, and then Rasha. Liesel, you have the floor. Thanks, Lynn. I guess um, mine was one of the confused faces that you might have seen out here, because I really have no idea what we're talking about. I'm sorry, I don't. And I, you know, I'm very involved in the main session discussions, very involved in sort of how we got to where we did on the main sessions and the DCs and the, um, and the NRIs. And, you know, I, I, I'm very familiar how we got to where we were last year. I, ha I really am completely lost in this conversation, what we're trying to achieve. I'm a little bit concerned that there's a proposal. First of all, let me say that I, I completely, um, uh, I really liked Constance's uh, description of weaving in the intersessional work of um, the MAG and the community that participated into workshop proposals that might be on the same uh, on that might be on the same topics. Now, I imagine that probably has some impact on speakers that would show up in those sessions and how you manage that, I'm not sure, because the workshop proposals come from workshop proposals proposers in the community. So thinking about how that would be 
that mecha mechanics would happen is maybe something we need to think about. Um, um, I, I also um, thought that last year when we dealt with the main sessions, we really tried to deal with the bottom-up approach of thing, the workshop proposals that were coming in and how, how did that um, reflect in what we call domain sessions and with, along with the intersessional work. And I think we can evolve from that kind of navel gazing and looking at the, our own work in a main session. So I, I like, I ha, I'm having positive reaction to some of those conversations. I'm a little bit more concerned that we're now talking about um, having slotting workshops for various, taking up space in the workshops agenda opportunities for any number of NRIs or DCs. Am I misunderstanding? And perhaps if this is a real proposal of how we're going to deal with the program agenda, we need to see something on paper. I'm a little bit concerned about this. So um, a, a couple of points, I think. This was session is not about main sessions, right? So just to start, it's, 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 it, it's about we, we've so we fell into the main sessions because I think of the... I, I'm, I'm guilty because I asked. The, no, 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 no. Take the blame. No. Be, <laughs> let, me, let me just try from it. We, we fell into the main, main sessions, I think, because we started about talking about the NRI. One of our agenda items today is to look at our intersessional um, activities and determine where they're going over the course of the year and where they fit or intersect with the annual IGF, the actual event itself. Um, in documents we all should have read, there were some, some comments which said the NRIs would find it very useful to have, and I can't remember if it was a track or a stream or maybe it was even forums or something, but basically a space for them to have um, substantive discussions on content that was important to them. Now, the NRIs are not a piece of work that's directed by the MAG. They're independent, they're organic, they bottom up, they have their own processes and their own requirements. They are, um, through some fashion, I think we're all trying to figure this out, so I think we should feel good that we're having the discussion and trying to, to figure it out as opposed to not having the discussion. So the NRIs are saying we would find it helpful to have some um, space within the annual event to help us feature and advance some of our work. And we can figure out how we take that discussion forward. But if we say we're going to allow them that, and it wasn't just, as I understand it, one 90-minute session, um, we need to figure out, um, I think at some level, um, a little bit about roles, I think, at some point. But first, does, does the MAG believe that if the, if the NRIs are asking for, let's say, a track or a stream or, you know, two two sessions a day or something so they can feature specific activities that they're doing. Um, you know, how does, the, how does the MAG actually want to respond to that request? Now, and I think maybe the NRIs could maybe be a little more clear on the actual proposal and, and the request as well. But, I mean, again, we're all coming together for the first time here in this discussion. We've been in it now for five hours. Um, I'm kind of not surprised that we're having some of the, you know, the um, mismatch. Who... Who read the 200 odd pages of staking talk, st <laughs> stock taking um, that came in, right? So, but, but look, we, we have said that we really support and we want to advance intercessional work. We've said that as a community in MAG for a long time. We've been supporting NRIs. The NRIs are asking for some additional intersect with the annual event. Um, how do we actually want to um, respond to that, evaluate it, and, and respond to it? And I started my comment saying, I think this is impacting the way the MAG thinks about the program. Not just the annual event, but also what is the work of the MAG over the course of the year? Do we feel the same responsibility to um, engage with BPFs now? So I'm stepping away from the NRI discussion. With BPFs, as we do with um, a request to, for, well, for the program itself. I'm trying not to say main sessions. Um, I think these are some of the things that we all need to, to figure out because I think over time our role is kind of, um, the, the MAG's role has actually evolved beyond just the annual event, but we haven't really acknowledged it. And, and I'm not sure the BPFs felt that they were, you know, particularly all that well supported by the MAG. I think they relied heavily on consultants to help them. Um, and is that okay? It, it, may, it may be okay, but um, I think some of this should actually be conscious Again, because everybody is really focused for the last few years on outputs and really making an impact. 
This is our third year of BPFs, Constance. Our, our third year. So we've got two years of sort of some kind of running code, and now we're now we're trying to figure out what's the next step. At the same time, in in um, my mind, we hear a lot about wanting to be um, uh, longer term focused in our activities, more strategic, a strategic work plan, a little more visionary about what we're doing. And so again, that's part of that that component as well. So I don't know if that clarified. I'll stay, let's go back to you for a moment before I go to Hori to see if that actually clarified. If, if not, someone feel free to step in and, and uh, try it differently. No, I, thank you, Lynn. I do think that that um, helps uh, frame what I suppose is being put to the mag in some informal way based on the taking stock and looking ahead and the request. I do think, though, that it has an impact on the program, right? And I'm, by the way, I say anything I say has nothing to do with whether or not I think that the intersectional work is important, and, and of course I do, and whether or not I think it's important to the annual event, of course I do, whether it's NRIs, DCs, BPFs, CN, CENB, and I thought the USG had a lot of acronyms. Um, <laughs> Um, so I, I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not questioning the value of any of it all of any of it at all. But I am I am curious what the I guess you asked yourself for what the specific proposal would be. I think we as the MAG would need to figure out what the impact or suggested impacts would be on the program um, and the workshop slotting and what might be the best way to accommodate a request that may be coming in through any of these um, intersessional work through the MAG. Um, so if there can be put a more sort of process point that we can uh, evaluate, I think that's useful. But let me just say, I want to put my finger on the point that I think if we're thinking of a whole track or stream, that's really going to cut down on the number of workshops we're going to be able to accept. Uh, thank you, Liesl. Thomas, and then we'll go to Jorge. <laughs> and, oh, Jorge, do you want to go first? <laughs> you go first, then I follow you. Hello, and good afternoon, and thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, this is a personal observation, so uh, Thomas can always correct me with uh, <laughs> uh, official Swiss position. But uh, I, it's uh, more or less also in, in the input we, we made to the stock taking. And the thought is that um, the intersection with the intersessional work should be topic-based, in my view. It, not so much process-based, because uh, I, I had, for instance, the experience in Guadalajara of listening to the main session of BPFs, of best practice forums. And they have done an, an incredible uh, job, uh, very much work, very valuable. But in a way, it didn't make sense to me to have, I don't know, two hours or three hours with uh, uh, one presentation about gender, then one about cybersecurity, then one about IXPs. That wasn't linked thematically, topically. It's uh, for, especially for an audience uh, that is not uh, 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 composed by insiders, that kind of arrangement makes little sense. Uh, unless you are talking about purely process, uh, or how do we work better as BPFs or as dynamic coalitions or as NRIs, but that might be uh, a different kind of, of setting, perhaps a, a large workshop or something different. So uh, I would see really the intersection based on the topics, um, trying to ensure uh, in the evaluation of the workshops and of the main sessions that are relevant to, to the work of the respective dynamic coalitions, uh, BPFs, NRIs, that and they are taken on board, that they can participate uh, in, in the relevant uh, sessions instead of having a, a session, for instance, on 
fake news uh, based on a workshop proposal and another session on fake news based on a BPF and another one based on an NRI, that wouldn't make sense. It's better to, to have them all in the, in the same place and uh, uh, on our, well, our side or the, the MAC side to, to make sure that in, in the evaluation of the, of the main sessions and the workshops, we, we establish some kind of criteria to, to, to make that happen, to, to give them some room to, to participate uh, where their uh, interests uh, really lie on a topic-based uh, uh, basis. Thank you. Actually, you said a part of, of, of uh, what, I, what I was going to say, so uh, thank you for being so efficient, <laughs> Jorge. Um, I think this goes in line with what Constance uh, and some others have said before, and it's actually also another contradiction to what Marcus has said before, he, because he was alluding to, I think there's, it's, it's crystallizing that we may have some substantive input from these structures, and then you have a process part. And the process part is extremely important for those who do it. It's important for DESA and the Secretariat and the others who facilitate space for those to do it. So, but that's, let's say, internal cuisine for the IGF, for the actors that should have spaces, um, and it's not necessarily for the audience. Um, so I think point one is our learning thing is to separate these two things um, because it's, it's, it's a different function. And then when it comes to the, to the substantive part, I think with, with the substantive structures like the BPFs and so on, what, what you have said makes perfect sense. It may be slightly different with, with regard to the, to the NRIs. And, and as someone who has uh, been with, with Eurodic from the beginning, and we have the same discussion in European level, how to link the Europeans, national ones with Eurodic and so on and so forth. Um, and we've tried different things, and, and it, it's there There needs to be a little bit of a mixture of substance and process, but maybe we can try other formats. For instance, just talking out loud, one thing that could be interesting is to see for instance, what are the top three issues worldwide on, on all uh, uh, NRIs? And, and if we would, for instance, in, instead of trying to have all NRIs working on an issue that may be more relevant or less relevant depending on the region and the country, if you just, just do a very simple uh, thing that they know in advance, basically ask your participants what are your top three issues and uh, with every three issues you have one or two bullet points to get a little bit of not just cyber security or big data but something a little bit and then you could process this into a document where you could then maybe, you don't even need a session for that, you can do this on a paper or electronically, you see okay in Europe there's a convergence on these two things, and one is varying from country to country. This is similar to Latin America, but it's completely different to Africa, whatever. So that you have a little bit of diversity of issues visualized in, 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 in one way, and you would not even necessarily need time at the IGF, but you would somehow have a process that would link all these, all these NRIs into a common structure with different substances. Just, just an idea, but then you don't have to talk about the process and you don't have to spend hours telling each other what you discussed. You get something at, at one glance and then you can still uh, decide how or whether you want to discuss interregionally, internationally on particular things that pop up in a way that you think, okay, this is somehow, and this information can also be used for the, for the workshops and main sessions, see, okay, this seems to be a problem from this angle in that region, but it seems to be absolutely no issue in another one, and then you can ask yourselves why. It may also help you to program main sessions and things where you want to have something that is obviously relevant for everybody, but you may be just thinking that it's relevant, but you don't really know, and the other way around. So just, we may try and find new ways of of uh, uh, aggregating information uh, from the NRIs because you can't just go via substance because that, that may, be uh, may be different. I'll stop here for the time being. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. We actually have quite a queue here that um, Chengatai has been keeping. So, Rasha, you have the floor. 
Thank you. Just very briefly, uh, I want us to revisit the three-hour thing. I, th I got a bit of feedback that three hours is just too long for any type of session. People evidently just go in and out. There's disturbance in the hall. There's non-continuity for what's being discussed. And it just I think it's just a, a lot of time to dedicate to one session. I think we need to revisit that and in the process give more opportunity for other sessions to be featured as main sessions. Thank you, Rasha. Miguel? Thank you, Lynn. Um, I had a chance to run a kind of a, a workshop that's been proposed by, uh, by the NRI right now, last year, and uh, they say, I think those kind of uh, workshops or spaces are especially for day zeros in order to gather regions not only on our eyes uh, and on other regional organizations in order to coordinate and uh, know what the, the, the regional agenda is during the IGF. Uh, I think it's a day zero event. I, I don't think it should have a space during the, the, the IGF itself. And maybe if we could separate a, a specific room in order for the NRIs to discuss over the different topics, for example, we discussed last year on the main session, uh, because there are, there are topics concerning just the NRIs, how to raise money, how to, and what is important for the IGF is what arises from the NRIs, it's not how the NRIs uh, happen, it's about uh, what the NRIs can provide the IGF. So I think we're talking about different things. Uh, what, the, what arises from the NRIs would be a worker, workshop proposals. How the NRIs could organize themselves in order, in order to happen would be another thing. And I would like to su also support um, Constance and, uh, and Elizabeth uh, points on the main sessions. If we have too many sessions, they, are, they won't be main. Uh, so we, we should define uh, which, uh, very carefully which sessions would become main. And on another topic, uh, I don't know if the, uh, now is the time, but uh, in, in many chats we had before, we were discussing about uh, if we are talking about relevant issues. Now, we are defining a, a workshop, workshop agenda in, on March, and maybe the proposal would be, proposal would be about, for example, uh, fake news or algorithm or something like that, but maybe they're not relevant at, at the end of the year. So we were thinking about some way to include the, the relevant uh, 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 issues, issues or topics at the end of the year. Something like maybe in a main session, maybe not, but something open to the public. For example, the MAC should define the 10 hot topics by October. We could open those topics to the general public in, in, for an open voting and they could define the top three hot topics for the end of the year. And the MAG or maybe a working group would have to organize a specific workshop for each topic. In that way, we could bring media and we could get more interested in the event in itself. I know it's hard, I know we have a lot of work and little time, but maybe it could get, uh, bring more relevance to the IGF. Thank you. No, I mean, thank you, Miguel. Those are good points. I think it's hard because we reset every year and we start late every year. And we only have a one-year planning cycle. Um, if we can find a way um, to really, and I think we have a path to do that, um, to really get ahead, multi-year, do a plan, clean up some of the, the um, timing of MAG appointments would be very helpful. The MAG appointment, we all said last year, and the retreat said, should be done before the current MAG terms ends not three or four months after it ends because there's hiatus where you know, nothing can officially happen and in practice very little happens because there isn't a, a sort of structure around. We need to fix some of those things that are fundamental, basic, and should be really easy to fix. Um, but that, those are the things that hamper us every year. They hampered us last year and they're hampering us this year. You know, the MAG was announced two days ago. New MAG members were put on the list two days ago. We don't even have the ability to actually set agendas and priorities before we get into this face-to-face -face meeting. Um, so I, I like a lot of those comments and suggestions a lot, and I think we need to find a way to get ahead of them and actually start 
start doing that for some of the future um, year planning. Um, Renata, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Renata, I agree <coughs> with Miguel um, that we need to think about a longer term. And I would like to come back to Julian's point as well on the SDGs and, um, and the thinking about this integrated, the overarch overarching theme, the intersectional activities. There needs to be a coherence that somehow uh, is missing. And another point that I think it's important we, we remember, there were many contributions from intersessionals, uh, intersessional group participants uh, from uh, the NRIs, which needs to be taken into account as we move forward. So we, we did go through uh, our taking stock process, but we need to do a deeper dive and uh, consider this as moving forward and do that integrated work. It's not, agree, it's not about uh, one part of the work, the NRIs or the BPFs or the DCs, it's everything together and a multi-year process. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Renata. Hu Jin, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, um, to be honest, I don't know, uh, don't really understand what you guys are talking about. Um, but uh, on the regarding the, 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 the organization of the main sessions and the choosing of topics or sub themes, I think uh, we yeah, to 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 have a poll online is one way. But uh, whether such post is dependable or not depends on. Where do you put such kind of poll? Which website you put it? What kind of language you put it? If uh, you 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 uh, do such a kind of polling only in the Anglo-Saxon world, and the the result was totally different from what you get from China, so it's a very complicated job. I think we the first step is that we among MAG members we first have to reach a certain kind of consensus to prioritize different issues. And then we can have an internal poll and that will be more objective than the, the, the pure populist uh, approach on, on internet because the, the internet is such a chaotic place. And uh, um, the, the, that's this, this, uh, the first thing about the main session. I think we need to choose some you know, seasonal hot topic issues and uh, give them enough time that we can have deep and thorough discussions. And the second thing about the workshops, uh, side events, and etc. I understand that uh, we, we need to take into consideration of different sectors and different people. We have to be inclusive, um, etc. Um, but in the meantime, we have to, to be effective to make sure that all the participants from all the world can participate in, in the session in an effective manner, rather than running place from place to place. Do you know, five minutes in this room and another five minutes in another room, you know, it's, it's not, that's not effective participation. It's kind of uh, like a bazaar, you know, it's chaotic bazaar. Sure that, you know, uh, whenever we organize such big events, it, it always looks like, like a big bazaar. But we have to, to manage it to make sure that uh, such a bazaar is not too noisy, not too chaotic. And the, the, side, the, the number of side events, workshops, I think we have to, to have a num they can chew on the numbers. Thank you. Thank you. I have Marcus in the queue, and then we're going to go to Makan, who's online, Lee, and Zena is the current um, speaking order. So Marcus, you have the floor. I tend to agree with much what has been said, in particular the uh, best practice main session uh, clearly did not work. The DC main session was a bit uh, different and it actually worked well despite there was such a variety of issues under discussion. But I leave that, maybe Avery wants to jump in on the DC. It's just a quick reminder why we chose a main session for the BPFs, that was mainly to allow them to benefit from interpretation because the main sessions are the only rooms where they have interpretation. 
However, I don't think that really delivered the desired impact, having interpretation of that kind of main session. And I just wonder, as multilingualism is something of concern to many in this room whose mother tongue is not English, and our Chinese colleague mentioned it very eloquently how important it was, and I think we had also remarks to that effect from a French colleague. I wonder whether we could not uh, maybe just make at least an executive summary of the the substantive reports of the best practice forums make available in the UN languages, and that might then have the desired effect of making it more accessible to people with other languages. And again, on the main sessions, the duration of three hours is determined by the working schedule of the interpreters, but we can obviously split them into half. I tend to agree as well that Three hours is rather long, and nowadays people have limited attention span. So two times 90 minutes is certainly better than once uh, in three hours. Thanks. Thank you, Marcus. Makan, you have the floor. Good afternoon. Do you hear me? We, we can hear you, yes. Yes, uh, I'll be brief. Uh, my name is Makan Fai from the African IGF Secretariat, uh, hosted by the African Union and the Economic Commission for Africa. I am also the chairperson of the planning committee of the West African IGF. Uh, I just want to let you know that uh, the NRIs are a real bottom-up approach and also their work is uh, totally uh, intersessional. Uh, as was uh, stated by the Eurodig delegate, we take into account what is done at the IGF, at the global level, and also we take an, into account what is coming from our countries, the national level, the sub-regional level, the regional level, and then we move to the global level. So um, we also take into account the BPFs, uh, the dynamic coalitions. In each of our uh, activities at the national and regional level, we take care of those issues. So uh, I do not think that, um, uh, that we can compare really the status of the NRIs with the status of uh, other activities which are in the IGF. Because I, uh, the, the NRIs are really uh, putting together everybody at all levels. And uh, this is also one of the most uh, uh, opportune uh, fora where we put on our decision makers, enlighten them on what is happening uh, at the uh, national, regional level, and also at the global level. And it is true, the NRIs that we can sensitize our uh, stakeholders and our uh, decision makers really to come at the global IGF to be presenters or speakers or to come and attend. So we de definitely need uh, a separate session for the NRI a main session. Thank you. Thank you, Makan. Lee, you have the floor. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a very simple point. Um, um, tapping into, I mean, the idea of uh, what has been said before about multi-annual strategic thinking. Um, I mean, of course, this is... A, we're talking about, at the same time, peace as human rights, as automation, artificial intelligence. It's huge. I mean, it's multifaceted. It's complicated. It, it's, it's a long process. I mean, it's obvious. It's, it's, it's quite clear. And certainly there's no silver bullet uh, regarding how to resolve these things. So it's good that we go look into the longer-term future for these to discuss these issues. But I think it's a very simple point. But in terms of being more visible, being more communicative with the public or with the, with the target groups that we are trying to, to, to reach out to, uh, I think we need to tell a story more. We need to make a story more of what we're trying to achieve. A story. We, we, we talk more about storytelling now, and it's not new. I mean, books have been around for, for a long time. Um, and a story which starts from the top down in terms of the title and, and the elements, the components therein. So, I mean, just like you see with regard to how we consume media, uh, we're you know, moving to Netflix and other long forms of storytelling away from films. You know, which are an hour and a half, two hours. So clearly there's, there's an appetite for more storytelling. And if we, you know, it's in, is it incumbent on this group to tell a story over a number of years about what, what, what it is and where are we going? If we think of it like that, then we may be better at communicating and be more visible. Um, 
That being said, there is a responsibility in the words of telling that story, as you've been doing with the title and maybe with the chapters, raising awareness, pinpointing issues, empowering people, giving people legitimacy to speak where they may not be spoken, may be able to speak otherwise, and, of course, freedom of expression in that context and coming together. So it's obviously it's about what are the key issues in terms of guiding uh, why, uh, where is the future of society going, of course. This is very general. I mean, it's about process and about people. Um, how, through a multi-stakeholder approach, and who, including the NRIs, uh, as, as catalysts for us. So, and, and when, it's, of course, it's a continuous dialogue over the next years through the IGF multi-annual process. So I want to just you to retain the, uh, the, the, the point, which is, uh, you know, we're, I think we're telling a story, which is unfolding uh, year after year. And if we think of it like that, Maybe we, it gives us more coherence, more, more traction, more visibility. And most importantly, we can com communicate the added value m much more than perhaps we think. So I feel that we're scattered. It's like a, scatter, a scattered approach to many issues, and we're trying to encapsulate things. But if we try to come down on a story uh, which unfolds, then maybe we have a better chance. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Sina, you have the floor. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, I would like just uh, to point out that uh, based on my observation of last year's session on the NRIs and uh, especially that we are uh, in the status of uh, information uh, initiative in Lebanon, I found it very important to listen to all what was said during the main session on NR NRIs and to learn from their experience. Uh, to, to know how they dealt with all the issues uh, they faced. That's why I, I really recommend to have a, a main session uh, for the NRI also this, uh, this year. Uh, and maybe uh, we let them uh, speak about the hot topics that they dealt with during uh, their, the, the year, uh, either on national or on regional uh, levels. Thank you. Thank you, Zina. Um, for whatever it's worth, I actually found last year's NRI session extremely interesting. Um, not because I was co-moderating or whatever, but the people that I spoke to afterwards said, and it was a long session, but if somebody really wanted to understand what the NRIs were about and what they were doing, sitting in that session gave them a great, great profile in, you know, in the space of a couple of hours, they saw a full range of activities and countries and priorities and processes, and they walked out of their understanding why the NRIs were important and what they were. That is not, not an argument for a main session for the NRIs. I think what we need to do with, there may be a different argument, but I mean, I wasn't, I'm not trying to push an NRI main session. I think with all these things, we need to figure out what are we trying to achieve and how do we actually um, take advantage of the physical presence of one of these IGF events? I, thought, I think that's what the NRIs did last year, and I think they were effective at it. Um, I think this year there are some new things that I think could be done. But I think really with any of these sessions, whether it's 90 minute or it's a main session or it's a flash session, we need to drive ourselves all the time to say, who are we trying to reach and what are we trying to achieve with the session? And if we can do that, I think we'll... we'll um, get a lot more impact from our work. What, uh, maybe what I'll do is um, this evening is try and frame this up a little bit because we've been talking, I think, about responsibilities, overall profile of the program. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to say next is actually going to help, but let me see. If we thought we had 100 slots to choose a number and the NRIs came and said, you know, there are 80 NRIs, maybe there'll be 90 NRIs by next year, and, and they'd like um, 10 workshop slots or 10 session slots um, for um, proposals or activities or, um, you know, maybe whatever. Um, how do we actually, so let's, let's say that they were interesting programs, legitimate requests, substantive, and we thought that was an appropriate thing to do because it would allow the NRIs to get some visibility for their work. I think one of the questions is, how do we actually figure out what the MAG's role is in saying yes or no and the NRI's role in answering? Um, you know, do we see the NRI work as an integral part of the program, and therefore it's the MAG's responsibility to review those requests and allow them in? And I'm, I'm focusing on this a little bit because, again, the NRIs are independent, they're organic, you know. Um, 
we need to allow them some room to be able to do their, to get visibility for their activities and advance their activities in a way that's going to help them back home. That may be a slightly different objective than what we're trying to set when we actually set an overall IGF program. But um, I'm looking at one or two faces and I don't think that's helping to, to clarify it either. So I'll go away quietly myself tonight, I think, and, and, um, and um, come back. Um, we need to do two things for sure before we um, wrap up today, and that's um, talk about the date for the next uh, MAG meeting. And um, Chengatai has a proposal on the basis of a request that came in on the, um, on the list. Um, we should talk about that, recognize that that um, request in that particular timetable is what drove the timetable for the MAG work, um, or we'll drive it over the next, the next couple of months. So do you want to talk to it? I don't, I've forgotten the exact dates. Oh, gosh. Um, actually, um, Lewis, if you can put up the um, timetable from the back of the workshop evaluation process, that sort of lays it out there. Uh, the request was to potentially consider having a, the next MAG meeting either alongside or in parallel with the WISIS meeting here in Geneva. Chengatai has gone away to see if those dates were um, available. The dates that he's come back with them are the 14th through the 16th, again, assuming we just have a three-day MAG meeting. Um, I might actually argue for an extra day if we want to advance some of the more strategic work, but for now it's the 14th to the 16th, which um, overlaps the WISIS forum. And while people just think about that, we're not looking for a call or a close on that now. We'll come back on that tomorrow. No, if, tomorrow before we leave, we should know when we need meeting next. If Lewis could put the, the, the time, the proposed schedule up. So we're proposing the next MAG meeting is in the middle of June. Every time we've tried to schedule them out later, we run into um, a lot of objection from the MAG, frankly, because it starts to interfere with people's holidays and vacations in, in uh, July and August. Um, I don't think we can wait until September for the MAG meeting and to do the workshop selection proposal because I think that's not leaving enough time for preparations. So, you know, we're in mid-June, end of June time frame. Unless somebody wants to put forward a, a hard proposal for a meeting at a different time of the year, but, you know, in 11 years it's never, never flown in um, August and for most of July is normally out as well. That is what's driving the proposed schedule here and some of the other tightness around things like the workshop evaluation process and trying to get a sense of what formats we might allow in and, and um, some, some sense of the overall shape of the program. This would actually say we need to leave here tomorrow with those things known, which is just a huge, huge lift from where we started. Um, so there are a couple of, of hands up. Um, I saw um, Constance has been up for a little while, so I saw Constance, Renata, uh, Marilyn. <laughs> Zena, Russia, and sorry, and actually Arnold, yes, you were in there in the middle, yes. Constance? Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, with regards to how to make progress while not getting lost in how many main sessions and who gets a main session and even, you know, even some sort of competition in the discussion, I want my main session. Um, I was wondering if, uh, as there seemed to be interest in having more than an organic approach, rather uh, a thematic approach, if the MAG uh, agreed on a few of the high-level uh, themes or hot topics, as the, the, the delegate from, from China was uh, suggesting, then perhaps approach to have a, a, a bottom-up approach where when you launch your call for proposals, um, uh, there is... Um, a question on uh, what do you think would be uh, most useful uh, to deliver or to organize a discussion. So 
a BPF could be, you know, you could tick the box BPF or special NRI involvement or X, Y, Z, but systematically more a thematic approach um, than uh, rushing to, uh, you know, uh, dividing, uh, dividing the cake of the main session between the DCs, the NRIs, and, and all the rest. Thank you. Thank you, Constance. We have Renata in the queue. Um, yeah, I was just going to do a simple point on the issue of timing and conflicts, because we have, um, some of us uh, may have ICANN meeting in the end of June, but I would also address this um, in a broader way. I think the dialogue with WISIS and with other events, this was brought up uh, before as um, a way to guide uh, MAG's work and building the IGF program as well. So that would be an interesting thing to consider on our next steps as well. So I would support um, a date around WISIS, but I would be careful about the end of June. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Renata. Rasha? Uh, thank you. I wanted to voice support for the same um, time frame uh, around the mid-June and just alert you that the last week of June is the Muslim feast, the end of Ramadan, so that might affect some people. Uh, so just to voice that. Um, and while I'm at it, I would also like to support what Constance just said because I think we need to be very careful if we're going to sort of assign quotas of workshops or sessions to particular groups because then that's I mean, it's not just the NRIs, next thing is we're going to have like 30 or 40 groups uh, being called out by legitimately since we've assigned some to, uh, to a particular type of, of groups, then, you know, other groups are going to come back and ask us to do the same. So we need to be very careful. I think everybody should have the same opportunity to propose sessions, and I think the choice should be made by merit rather than by who they are. Thank you, Rasha. Um, Arnold, and then we have Lee. Thank you, Lynn. <clears throat> On the date, um, I recognized earlier that indeed uh, it coincides with the WISIS. It could be beneficial for those who are attending the, the WISIS, but uh, it could be also a, uh, a gender problem. Um, uh, I think it's, it's worthwhile to look into uh, a date back-to-back -back with uh, the, the, the WISIS forum, uh, or otherwise uh, choose a date uh, in May, the second half of May probably. Um, that's on the date. Uh, the second point, I would like to uh, focus your attention on a very interesting work which is uh, now undertaken by the Internet Society. It started all in March uh, 2016 and with the aim to look uh, into the future of the Internet, uh, what can we expect in about 10 years from now? Uh, they engaged uh, a lot of people, members, chapters, experts, partners, and they came up with 1,500 responses from 156 countries and economies. And um, finally, they, 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 they uh, identified in what they call uh, nine game-changing shifts, challenges, and drivers for the future that emerges as key issues if we are talking about the future of the Internet. Nine boxes they have identified. I name a few of them. Uh, new and evolving digital divides, artificial intelligence and machine learning, convergence of the Internet in the physical world, um, the evolution of networks and standards, future of personal freedoms and rights. If I look at these nine boxes, then I think it could perhaps fit into uh, the more pro programmatic planning of our work, hopefully if, that, if we get an agreement on that. Uh, my, my main message is see, uh, have a look at this, this very interesting project 
and see whether we can link as, as a MAG, as an IGF, to this, uh, to this work, valuable work, because if we're talking about the future of the Internet uh, and we are asking the NRIs to come up with hot topics, probably they have been already involved and asked by the Internet Society, what are your views about the, the future of the Internet? So uh, my plea would be to, to, to at least inform the national IGFs and regional IGFs that this work is, is, uh, uh, under, is underway. It's, it's already going on and there's a lots of information you can read in, in uh, what came out of this uh, so-called consultation. This is what I would like to share with you. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold. Next, we have Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a very quick point uh, to echo what was said by Constance and, and passed by the Chinese delegation, which is that the clustering or the thematic approach is very is something which is, I think, developing as a best practice in Eurodig. We, there's, a, there's a very early on stage uh, clustering of of groups of themes uh, which we shall then become the threads um, for, for the actual discussions and the shaping of sessions and the actual de delivery of the, of, the, of the event itself. So this works very well. I think it tells a bit of a story. Um, and so, I mean, it's a best practice which could be, could be thought about uh, in terms of uh, the, the, this uh, planning. So I really would stress that. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Marilyn, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Marilyn Kate speaking. The reason I took the microphone is that I think that there are um, many in this room who are very familiar with the WISIS Forum, but perhaps many who are not. And I just want to make a quick observation for some who may not be familiar with the fact that the WISIS Forum purpose is to focus on the implementation of the WISIS action lines, which is very different from the purpose, but very, I think, augmented to the purpose of the IGF. I do not see in any way that these are competing fora, and I think um, that they both play important roles. I will say, having attended all of the WISIS forums, including before it was an official WISIS forum, that... Um, I see a significant difference in the workshops. They are about implementation. And this year, of course, the focus is on the, um, the linkage between the WISIS action lines and SDGs. But of interest, perhaps, to some of you, um, there's a high-level track on day um, two and three where there are official policy statements made. And I realize that that may be, um, you know, we may feel like that's just a bunch of high-level speechifying. But in fact, those high-level policy statements have been developing into um, statements that high-level ministers, CEOs, heads of NGOs, and others, are they use those opportunities to describe the implementation toward the action lines in their country. Last year... Through the participate, I was a high-level track facilitator. Through the participation with three of the high-level participants, there are now NRIs that are being supported in those countries because they came to the WISIS forum. I either encouraged them or forced them to attend the um, briefing that the Secretariat organized, made sure that they had a chance to talk to some other friendlies who were participating. So. I will say for some of you, if you're not familiar with it, I think that there's some benefit. The workshops are focused on implementation, so I'll say again, they're very different. I will say that um, if you plan to meet at the same time, um, perhaps you could think about meeting on Friday, which is largely a working day, and work over the weekend so that if people wanted to attend part of the WISIS forum uh, and take advantage of part of that, but also then do your work, perhaps that would work. But I think, Arnold, you were saying it would be better not to completely overlap, and I really agree with you about, in particular, the first four days. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, next on the queue, I have Hu Jun, then I have Shigun. No? Okay. okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just be very quickly. Um, first, um, I would like to say that uh, the topics mentioned by Arnold is very good, and I like that very much. 
And the second is about uh, the uh, act, um, plan of action um, uh, of we with this. Um, I would like to say that uh, you know um, we are having the mandate from IGF, and IGF is having the mandate from WISIS. So it's our job to carry out what they say. But uh, we, we have also have to be aware that uh, the WISIS documents is uh, you know negotiated through a long time you know process, and uh, many of those guys uh, working on WISIS are, are you know devoted for many years on social and economic uh, affairs. They don't know too much things about technology, and uh, <coughs> the technology and the international situation is changing so fast. And we, I think we need to be, go a little bit ahead of WISIS. We, we, we should not follow you know, behind, because WISIS doesn't go fast enough, and we have to catch up with the times. Thank you. Um, I don't see anybody else looking for the floor, and is there anybody in the queue on you? No? Um, you know, unfortunately, this is always a very, very, very difficult thing to do. Um, I'll leave the date up there, and if we could put the, the um, sheet back up there for a minute, Lewis. Um, and people should go away, think about it overnight. Um, I... I I'm sure we could move the meeting to one side or the other of WISIS. Um, I, I would guess that um, August is pretty much out of the box um, for most of the people in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, back part of July is. I'm very happy to be contradicted on that, but every time we've had this discussion in the past one, there's been, like, just no way. we Can we hold a meeting and get enough um, um, participation in that time frame? I think September is just far too late for us to do the programmatic work, and, and um, that drives us back to a meeting sometime between mid to end of June, working around various holidays, possibly the first week of July. That obviously doesn't work well for um, Americans, the 4th of July. So What's that? if we, if we, just so we understand the sort of timetable overall we're looking for, if we meet second, third week of June, that actually says that we put out the open call inviting workshop proposals mid-March, two weeks from now, basically. And then um, that would give um, seven weeks for the s submitters um, to submit their proposals. It gives the secretariat a week, oops, to organize um, and send the proposals to MAG for evaluation, having done the first stage um, evaluation. The MAG gets three weeks to review them. The secretariat, and I think that should probably say secretary analysis, maybe even working group analysis and evaluation of the workshop results. And the MAG gets to review that analysis, um, paying particular attention to any imbalances they like to correct or any um, kind of longer term, more strategic elements we want to put in. And again, the MAG selecting the final workshops. We've heard from many people that the MAG should select the final workshops in a face-to-face -face meeting. This is partly why I've been pushing some things so hard and why it's frustrating to have so little time <laughs> again and to be having a very tactical, operational, date-driven conversation in the absence of not really having had enough kind of substance and content. I am open, as I know the Secretariat is, for any other suggestions in terms of how we manage that second face-to-face -face meeting and the um, ultimate program schedule. If anything occurs to anybody right now, we can put that on the table for, um, for thought. People can go away otherwise, think about it. If you do have um, ideas, it would be helpful to put it on the list so we also have some time to think about it. it, it is. We know that we do not close on dates um, outside of a MAG meeting. If we have to take this to the MAG list, we will not close for, for some time. So I see Elizabeth in the queue, and Hujun. Elizabeth, you have the floor. The question was asked right next to me by someone who's not allowed to speak. 
<laughs> I'm kidding. Um, the question, the question that was sort of asked is why not September, early September? And I think maybe it's worth exploring what are the pros and cons of that if we really are stuck for a date. I know we did have a mag in September before, but I think it was an extra one um, and related to the, inter the progression of the intercessional work. Um, in term, I mean, if I recall this past year where the main sessions were actually decided, I don't recall us getting conclusion before about that time. No, the main sessions are late. The main sessions aren't tied or directed by the schedule. Somehow we got overly focused on main sessions here today, but that's not. We do do those separate from. This is about the bulk of the workshop proposal scheduling. And last, last year we did the main session um, final proposals at virtual calls after the main meeting. Is it a logistical question? Is it, is it that for you and the host country to figure out, you know, rooms and structure and all of those kind of things, is that the reason that September to December would be complicated if you didn't know the workshop activities before then? So... I, what I've heard um, from some of the people is that that means we would be asking the workshop submitters basically mm -hmm. to do their work over July and the MAG and the Secretariat to do their work over August. And again, we just hit that heavy vacation period. If you just, if you just back out from, you know, to go to the far right, if we're going to have a meeting in second week of September or something, you back up, that says the MAG's reviewing it in week one, the Secretariat is of September, the Secretariat's doing their work in August, the last week, the MAG's doing the reviews over August, and, and it backs up, backs up that way. I'm just saying that that's what... To not change our deadline that much, and maybe widen it a little bit until early summer, imagine, and then that analysis could be done and we could use perhaps that platform blog op matching opportunity for pe leave people um, just the analysis of not, not the evaluation conclusion work, but just the analysis that we have 15 workshops on gender and we have the subject areas. And so we could leave a platform for people who have workshops that might want to link them or liaise them. I'm just thinking about how to use that time uh, without losing it entirely, but at the same time not over compressing ourselves into a schedule that may or may not work. Not that September is a better time, but just raising the question. No, and I, and I think it's good to, to think out of the box and to question some things that have always been no-go areas, because I think we'd all love more time on the, on the front end here. Rasha, you have the floor. Thank you. I think it's, I think it's uh, very difficult for us to inform participants of whether or not they are accepted by September. In some countries, it's going to take three months just to get a visa. Uh, a Schengen visa is very difficult. People need to apply for funding, and it just it really takes a lot more time than that. Thomas, and then we'll... Just a hopefully not nasty question. If you said the beginning of July, 4th of July does not work for the, U for the U.S., that's your national holiday day or whatever it is. If you would then apply equal treatment, that means we have like 185 days uh, that may not work. Just, uh, I, I think, um, with all respect, but maybe that's a little bit far-fetched. Uh, sorry, uh, Liesl. <laughs> I'm sure you must have Austrian ro uh, roots or German roots with your name. Please celebrate for once another, another uh, national day. But no, uh, jokes aside, um, the first two weeks in July may be an alternative, so why not think it through a little bit more serious? And if we can find a way around the 4th of July, but there's a few days left in, 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 in early July, that may not be a problem for too many people. Thank you. A problem for the Secretariat will be more than happy to work any time in August or whatever. But... Uh, <laughs> 
Yes, but it's just a matter of either, you know, should uh, people come in for the WISIS forum, go back for two weeks, then come back? That's a cost thing as well. Um, yes, the visas, the asking for funding, because people um, base their funding requests. I do have a workshop that has been accepted, and so all those factors um, do come into play. But, you know, it's fine for us, the Secretariat. Um, we have... Um Ojun in the queue and then Liesl and but let me just say I mean I, I do believe September is just too late um, It's too late for the reasons we just said for the proposers and funding and so I think we're back to this kind of general time frame But really appreciate you pushing the envelope there Elizabeth Ujun, you have the floor um, You know, I also hate to work during vacations and uh, I hope that our future meeting will not be in July when I was uh, being out of the Geneva. But anyway, uh, I will try to get online uh, if I'm not able to uh, participate in the meeting physically. Um, the second thing is that I want to ask a very ignorant, ignorant uh, question. Um, do the organizers of the workshops or any other side events, do they have to pay for the, 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 the UN conference service or occupying a room and some organization may put up a tent here in, inside the compound? Do they have to pay? No, there is no charge. The, the only charge there is is if you have a um, booth and you want like an extra TV screen or something like that. But for the workshop rooms or anything, there's no charge. Mm. Yeah. For those, you know, big enterprises and multinational companies, they, they don't like money. They have enough money and we've got to ask them, ask them pay. And we use that money to subsidize, subsidize the, the least developing countries, to subsidize their travel expense, their accommodation. I think we need to come up with a, a, a plan that uh, let deep pockets pay. Thank you. Yes, but that's a little bit of a slippery slope, I would think. Uh, where do you draw the line? And in general, in UN conferences, you don't pay for the rooms. Um, for, example, uh, for example, like uh, uh, Jack Ma, if he come, you charge him $10,000. <laughs> 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 Ali, Ali, Ali Baba should already be a donor to this effort. <laughs> Um, uh, we had Liesl in the queue. We should be wrapping this up quickly as well. <laughs> Can't hear you, Lynn. I said um, it's, uh, we're at the hour at 6 o'clock, and we have interpretation. Um, and if we're going to continue on for another 10 minutes, we need to ask for um, some leniency and support for the interpreters to continue. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, how do you find out? Oh, no, we can forget about We can ask, tell them to go if they need to. Changatai is saying that we can release the interpreters if you need to go. We would obviously be pleased if you stayed, but if the MAG is willing to continue without interpretation, we will continue for, for a few more minutes. So I'm assuming, um, I actually have a cue, Juan. Is it really to this point, or we'll put you in the, in the back? Liesl, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. And all kidding aside about um, the U.S. Independence Day, um, um, I would just say that there are any number of things that we try to avoid, including two months for, you know, my heritage's vacation time. So I'll trade July 4th for you for July, any time in July and August. <laughs> um, but I realize that we are juggling a number of things. I, you know, I'm conflicted about the, uh, the or I, let me rephrase, I'm ambivalent about the, the concomitants, yes, the overlap with the WISIS forum. I, I'm concerned about whether, you know, if MAG members feel the pull to go to WISIS forum. I'm just concerned about that. I think it's an, an interesting synergy, but not exclusive or, you know, so I just am not sure how that helps. But um, if it could be on either side, that 
and that might help people that are traveling to both. I uh, also take the point that people that are traveling to WSIS Forum might not come back two or three weeks, you know, and, you know, we also have to dodge ICANN, as a matter of fact. So, you know, we are dodging a lot of things, all joking aside about my Independence Day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Liesl. We have Shagoon and Hisham and then Juan, and then we'll um, wrap this up. Yeah. I would like to lend my support for uh, for us to have the meeting in June, because uh, for people like us, we would like to save costs, and we would also like to use the one stone to keep two best at the same time. And then most importantly, we would also like to reduce risk, because after coming for uh, the WISIS program, we will probably come back after two to three weeks or one week, uh, month. So I'm struggling in support that we should have um, the meeting in June. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, in this hybrid model, I've just been informed that I actually have to say the words, I release the interpreters. And at the same time, I would like to very much thank the interpreters for, for your services. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. And I sincerely hope they're having as much fun as we all are. <laughs> um, thank you, Shagoon. Uh, Hisham, you have the floor. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Len. I, uh, I, I think I, uh, uh, Shagun maybe just uh, spoke my mind. I think if we just maybe sleep on it uh, till tomorrow, I think we can still work something out within June. Uh, to, in, in, in addition, actually, to the considerations uh, Shagun mentioned, uh, with regard to the logistics of travel for some delegates. Uh, I think it's, it's also important to, uh, to note the, the signal we are sending to the communities uh, uh, following the, the IGF uh, with regard to the progress of the program itself. Uh, if we miss the opportunity within June, I think we will have to wait until September to start uh, at that time, which would be a little bit late to mobilize even the communities within our regions and our countries. So. Uh, I, I, we, I, I think if we can have some offline discussion with regard to the dates, we can still find something uh, just maybe before the WISIS forum or just immediately after. With the possibility maybe to work during weekends, uh, if we are, of course we expect the uh, vacation time during July and August, we don't want to touch that, at least we can still work on a Saturday or, or Sunday. So I, th I think we actually have um, there's what, a few more people jumped to the queue, but I think we're actually settling on, um, and we probably need a, a doodle poll to at least try and do this with some data, not just whoever happens to be in the room at that point in time. Um, three days, either over the WISIS as originally scheduled, 14, 15, 16, three days before or three days after. Um, so I'll, I'll just put that out. People could react to that quickly so we can figure out how we actually get a note out to the MAG so that we can inform the discussion with some data and then move forward. So, Juan, you were next. I think it's not working. Mr. Benera, this book of God. Okay, the 4th, the 5th, and the 6th of September is Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. It's uh, the beginning of the school in many parts of the world. We could do that, and if it's the 6th, we already have the list of final workshop. It will have more than three months to, to prepare. And I can tell you, I was very much involved, as you know, with a lot of workshops for the Guadalajara, you know, in, and I realized that actually in practice they didn't start it to prepare after the vacations in summer. So uh, I don't think it makes a really, a, only what it was said about the visas, but for, for the preparation, I don't think that it makes a much difference to announce to them in late June than in early September at least in the northern hemisphere where we have uh, vacations in July and August, um, normally they won't start doing the actual work till September. So I ask to reconsider 
And also, early September has some advantages for us because it's already more near the, so we, besides doing the workshop that that will be, we could do also some other uh, things. And then we don't need an extra, uh, an extra meeting. We only will do that and that's it. And then till the IGF. Sorry, I've just been told that Jeune Genevois is on the 7th of September. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not from Geneva, I don't care. <laughs> I'm from Zurich. <laughs> Um, let me go to, uh, there's a Swiss holiday on the 7th of September. It, it's no, it's a William, Geneva holiday. Yes, a Geneva holiday, sorry. Let me go to Aida, and then I had Israel and Miguel, and we'll come back. And Juan, we'll figure out what we do with that comment, but. Israel. Uh, so, thank you. Just really quickly, I would like to support 14th to 16th. As I understand that the ITU, the room is already booked, and some people couldn't attend this meeting, So, and we did not consider switching the dates for people who were just announced as new MAG members. Therefore, let's just cut it and do things a bit easier here because we're discussing this way too much. Thank you. Thank you, Aida. Um, Israel? Thanks. Uh, I just want to support uh, June uh, dates because uh, uh, in that way we could use the, the, um, the um, next months for uh, some uh, meetings, virtual meetings, about, I don't know, working groups or something more specific. Thank you, Israel. Miguel? I just wanted to support what Israel just said. And also I wanted to ask, uh, maybe I missed something for sure. Uh, are we always speaking about meeting here in Geneva or is there a chance to meet elsewhere? This meeting is planned for here in Geneva, um, which is where they've traditionally been held. Um, but I also think given um, the desire to do so much more with international Geneva that it makes sense to actually be here. Um, <laughs> Thomas, yes. Thank you. I'll, I'll be brief. I think we should still find a way to include the 4th of July uh, into the MAG meeting. <laughs> no, uh, jokes aside. Uh, maybe... I think the June uh, parallel to WISIS forum is really something that has probably more advantages than disadvantages. And maybe it would be good to know who actually had planned to attend the WISIS forum 100% all five days and so on, so that we know how many are affected. And if, if there's not that many people that may be delegate colleagues and so on, it's actually a plus because if you come one day earlier, you have actually the chance for once to participate at the VCs forum. So it's rather an opportunity than apart from uh, you. But <clears throat> just that we know how many people would ever actually have a conflict of, of timing. That may help also for the decision. Thank you. Um, I think my proposal is going to be to put a doodle poll out. Mm. In a quick count, I think there's 20 MAG members here, some online, but some who aren't participating now, and I don't think it's fair to take that um, kind of decision or call here in that way. So we'll put something out to the MAG list. Um, I think we could maybe um, talk about it being either... week before, during, week after the week September. It, yeah, I'm, I just... I'm, I'm happy to put September in. Everybody can figure out the doodle poll. We can close this conversation. But I, I think we're squeezing the people that are disadvantaged all too often, the people that need to get support and funding. And I, I just think it's very late. We may make our decision on the 6th of September, and by their notified, it's already the middle of September. And I actually think that actually squeezes a secretariat then who, who needs to do an awful lot of work supporting them with visa and travel. Um, I, I just think it's, it's awfully squeezed. Um, I will put that specifically to the folks that are room here. If people feel strongly that we should consider September, that it's a reasonable alternative, we'll put it in the doodle poll, and if not, we'll go with those other three choices. So anybody feel strongly it should be in the doodle poll? No. Okay. okay. So we'll send that out, um, put a little rationale for why we're sending it out, and make sure they understand that that period in the middle overlaps with the WISIS and, and move forward. Um, so I, I think just the final words, that does leave us plus or minus with this schedule in front of us here, um, which would actually say we need to move forward with um, um, 
deciding on uh, the workshop proposal process and evaluation process, the work that Rasha and the working group have been doing, and um, uh, any, any other advice we need in terms of guidelines. We probably need some further discussion on formats. Um, some of those discussions could actually be taken over the next week. Some cannot because they have a lead time with the Secretariat in terms of implementation. But I will work with Changatai this evening to try and put some frame around that so that we can have that discussion tomorrow. Um, we back to the theme, but I think I need to take a look um, with um, Changatai and Thomas anybody else who's willing to join, how we actually schedule the work of the next few weeks and the next few months, because there's a lot of work building up in front of us here, and I think all of us would rather not be here <laughs> again. Um, so we'll do a little bit of uh, preparatory work to figure out what are the key. Changatai and I had a list of things we actually needed um, agreement with the MAG on today. We've hit some of them, some of them we haven't, some we might not be able to get, but we'll look at how we can actually process our way through that over the next few weeks. Sure. Uh, another thing, and this question is more for the uh, diplomat that reside here in Geneva, because I was making the suggestion to the chair, chairman, uh, to Lynn, that in order to do uh, uh, this promotion of the IGF, two years ago, I remember that when Janis was the chairman, that we had a meeting, Schengeta, you remember, in UNESCO, the day before, it was a briefing for all the head of delegations in UNESCO about what the IGF uh, was. Remember, it was a panel. I, I was in that panel. Some member of MAC were there. And it was very interesting. A lot of ambassadors, when, when it was in that uh, place, they, they asked some questions. Some, many of them didn't know what IGF was and how it was going on. So I think that here in Geneva, the first day before the MAG meeting could be this kind of uh, event in which you can invite the ambassadors of the missions here in Geneva and do the sa same panel. And so I think it's better also to factor in the selection of the date, which date it will be the best for having the most uh, quantity of ambassadors here in that event. Uh, I only wanted you to factor that in uh, in the considerations for the date, which date will be uh, best for that? Yes, Thank uh, you. we've also um, applied for a uh, workshop slot, so which is not the MAG meeting, which is can be you know directed, focused on informing the participants of WISIS about um, the WISIS forum about the IGF and what's happening. But we can also have every have it the week before. We can try and. Uh, I mean, yeah, allow me to cut back. But, but you mm. remember that event in UNESCO, uh, and because maybe if it's a workshop, it's not. It does not have the 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 level enough for ambassadors to to go there. Uh, I, you know, there's some protocol uh, uh, regarding this. If if it's a, an event like like that. That happened in UNESCO, just like that. You know, it was for the ambassadors that was in Paris, the head of the missions there, and something to do here, of course, planned well in advance, so ambassador can put it in the schedule, and then it will be a, a, a panel for that. I think that's a useful thing to do. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for the idea of for reminding uh, us of this. Um, we can then discuss whether it's a day or two hours or whatever. Um, but I actually think that um, knowing that uh, the ITU is uh, also in the middle of this small uh, city like, like, like here, it's actually even more central. Uh, and if the research forum is taking place at the ITU, um, we could also combine these ideas physically at the I2, maybe something different if it's at the ILO or somewhere a little further apart, um, but also that is not like hours away. But I think we should take this, take this on board. But um, I'm not sure, uh, Lynn, whether I got you right, because my, my feeling was that we should get the date before we leave here. So if you make a doodle poll, will that be a doodle until tomorrow or until the week after? Tomorrow. Ah, okay, great. And that's so that the, those not here have a few hours to... Yeah, okay, great, thank you.
will we'll definitely be tomorrow and we'll do everything we can to call the attention um, to the MAG on the MAG list um, for that. Um, so I said, Arnold, you have a, no, no, go ahead. That's fine. I was going to close. Um, okay. We, we discussed um, um, one important task of the, the MAG uh, preparing for the, uh, the IGF of this year. But we have another important task to fulfill, and that is uh, how to improve our work, the functioning of the IGF. Um, I've noticed that a working group on communication put forward their report. Um, so my question to you is, how are you going to, uh, to discuss this? Uh, are we going to have a conference call on this issue? I don't think it's, it is the right way to do that, because uh, if you really want to discuss the improvements, it should be a face-to-face -face meeting. And perhaps we could use the time frame between September and December uh, to come together here in Geneva to uh, uh, discuss this, this uh, important uh, second task. Uh, trying to find some, some uh, strategic uh, programming, planning, uh, see what we can do regarding communication. Perhaps there's some more news about the, the, uh, the donors uh, uh, who are going to, uh, to support the, um, the, the financial stability of the IGF Secretariat. And there are more, many more questions we could, uh, could tackle then, because the uh, resolution is quite clear. We have uh, a, an important task to fulfill come up with a further improvement. That's what I see as the second part, apart from preparing the IGF. Thank you. I think we have two main significant components of work. One of them is looking at um, any remaining items from the CSGD Working Group on Improvements for the IGF and the items coming out of the retreat, as we spoke about briefly yesterday. I think that's one stream of work, if you will. Um, I, I think possibly a lot of what comes out of Anything we do to follow up from the retreat will address some of the longer term and allow us to get to a, a process that facilitates a multi-year view. But then we need another stream that actually looks at the substance and the content. Um, so we start these discussions with, you know, um, around, around substance and, con and content um, and some idea of the sorts of themes that we think would be important or the approach. And that's another uh, significant piece of work that we need to find time for over the coming year. I think that's why we're always at somewhat of a disadvantage in this process this year. Um, normally what happens is somebody would suggest a working group um, and there might be some support for that working group and then a charter is written up. This is, this is what the task is of the working group um, this is what um, the output of that working group is. This is a sort of time frame. And we look to both um, get some leaders for that working group and then some participants. I think that's what we need to do um, with, because we're never going to get 55 people together long enough in a room or long enough on mailing lists or long enough on virtual calls to advance them that way. I think we need a subset of the MAG to advance some of these and then bring forward to the MAG. So I, I and actually on the agenda tomorrow, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure we're going to get there, um, was um, a discussion of some possible working groups. I think we've touched them at a high level, but, um, you know, this is um, future work. That's what I said when I said earlier, I'll go away with Changatai and figure out what's the core stuff we absolutely need to get done and agree before we leave here tomorrow to meet our fundamental and first objective, which is preparing for the IGF. And with that, I'd say slash support to all the intercessional work appropriate support to the intercessional work as well. And then um, what we're looking for in terms of activities or um, approaches in some of these other areas. Try and stretch that a little bit more. And again, you know, any thoughts people have, you know, email. The Swiss government is kindly um, hosting a reception upstairs. It starts in 10 minutes. We can continue the discussion informally over there, which can only be aided by alcohol. <laughs> At, at this point, um, yeah. there will be no alcohol. We have no money for alcohol. It's just <laughs> water with or without gas. <laughs> um, I'm going to, um, for the record, I guess, thank the interpreters, um, thank the scribes. Um, the scribes have actually um, stayed on proceeding. And without their um, scribing here, I think we'd all be at a, at a significant disadvantage. So really appreciate the excellent work they do and um, the work of everybody here in the room today and in particular all the people that are working on the um, working sh workshop evaluation process. I know we've been trying to do an awful lot of that work in, in the background rapidly as well. 
Um, I think that's it. Um, thank you, everybody, and the Swiss reception is on the eighth floor upstairs. And before I forget it, of course, that, that was a joke. There is one bottle of wine, um, <clears throat> or two maybe. I don't know what uh, the uh, special offer from the supermarket was uh, limited. But uh, it's, it's, uh, the, uh, it's sponsored by the foreign ministry. I think I should not forget to say this. Thank you. Um, for, for those who, not, who don't know where it is, it's uh, take the elevator just in front of the main big hall, which is right here, and then go to the eighth floor, because there's thousands of elevators, but not all of them go to the eighth floor. So the elevator right in front, right before the main hall. Thank you.